Chapter One of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Malchem. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hanneker. Part One, The Man. Chapter One, Poland. Useful Ideas. Gustave Flaubert pessimist and master of cadence lyric prose urged young writers to lead ascetic lives that in their art they might be violent chopin's violence was psychic a travailing and groaning of the spirit the bright roughness of adventure was missing from his quotidian existence the tragedy was within one recalls maurice materling whereas most of our lives is passed far from blood cries and swords and the tears of men have become silent, invisible, and almost spiritual. Chopin went from Poland to France, from Warsaw to Paris, where finally he was born to his grave in Père Lachaise. He lived, loved, and died, and not for him were the perils, prizes, and fascinations of a hero's career. He fought his battles within the walls of his soul. We may note and enjoy them in his music. His outward state was not niggardly of incident, though his inner life was richer, nourished as it was in the silence and the profound unrest of a being that irritably resented every intrusion. There were events that left ineradicable impressions upon his nature, upon his work, his early love, his sorrow at parting from parents and home, the shock of the Warsaw revolt, his passion for Georges Sand, the death of his father, and of his friend Matuszynski, and the rupture with Madame Sand, these were crises of his history. All else was but an indeterminate factor in the scheme of his earthly sojourn. Chopin, though not an anchorite, resembled Flaubert, being both proud and timid. He led a detached life, hence his art was bold and violent. A nihilist, he seldom sought the glamour of the theatre and was never in such public view as his maternal admirer saw. He was Frédéric François Chopin, composer, teacher of piano, and a lyric genius of the highest range. Recently, the date of his birth has been again discussed by Natalie Janocha, the Polish pianist. Chopin was born in Zelazowa Wola, six miles from Warsaw, March 1, 1809. This place is sometimes spelt Shelazova Volia. The medallion made for the tomb by Clisonger, the son in law of Chaugesson, and the watch given by the singer Catalani in 1820, with the inscription Donné par Madame Catalani à Frédéric Chopin, âge de dix ans, have incited a conflict of authorities. Karasovsky was informed by Chopin's sister that the correct year of his birth was 1809 and Schultz, Savinsky, and Niecks agree with him. Schultz asserts that a memorial in the Holy Cross Church, Warsaw, where Chopin's heart is preserved, bears the date March 2, 1809. Chopin, so Henry T. Fink declares, was twenty-two years of age when he wrote his teacher Elsner in 1831. Liszt told Niecks in 1878 that Karasowski had published the correct date in his biography. Now, let us consider Janocha's arguments. According to her evidence, the composer's natal day was February 22, 1810, and his christening occurred April 28th of the same year. The following baptismal certificate, originally in Latin and translated by Fink, is it used. It is said to be from the church in which Chopin was christened. I, the above, have performed the ceremony of baptizing in water a boy with the double name Frédéric François on the twenty-second day of February, son of the musicians Nicolas Chopin, a Frenchman, and Justina de Krzyzanowska, his legal spouse. Godparents, the musician Francisco Grembetsky and Donna Anna Skarbikova, Countess of Zelazowa Wola. The wrong date was chiselled upon the monument unveiled October 14, 1894, at Chopin's birthplace. 
erected practically through the efforts of Milya Balakirev, the Russian composer. Jan Nocha, whose father founded the Warsaw Conservatory, informed Fink that a later date has also been put on other monuments in Poland. Now, Chopin's father was not a musician, neither was his mother. I cannot trace Grambeski, but we know that the Countess Garbeck, mother of Chopin's namesake, was not a musician. However, the title musician and the baptismal certificate may have signified something eulogistic at that time. Besides, the Polish clergy was not a particularly accurate class. But Janoha has more testimony. In his controversy with me in 1896, she quoted Father Bielavsky, the present curé of Brocho Parish Church of Zelazowa Wola. This reverend person consulted records, and gave us his opinion that 1810 is authentic. Nevertheless, the biography of Wojinski and the statement of the Chopin family contradict him. And so the case stands. Janoha continues firm in her belief, although authorities do not justify her position. All this petty pother arose since Nick's comprehensive biography appeared. So sure was he of his facts, that he disposed of the pseudo-date in one footnote. Perhaps the composer was to blame. Artists, male as well as female, have been known to make themselves younger in years by conveniently forgetting their birth date, or by attributing the error to carelessness in the registry of dates. Surely the Chopin family could not have been mistaken in such an important matter. Regarding Chopin's ancestry, there is still a moiety of doubt. His father was born August 17, 1770, the same year as Beethoven at Nancy, Lorraine. Some claim that he had Polish blood in his veins. Schultz claims that he was a natural son of a Polish nobleman, who followed King Salislaw Floschensky to Lorraine, dropping the Chopin, or shop for the more Gallic Chopin. When Friedrich went to Paris, he in turn changed the name from Chopin to Chopin, which is common in France. Chopin's father emigrated to Warsaw in 1787, enticed by the offer of a compatriot there in the tobacco business, and was a traditional Frenchman of his time, well-bred, agreeable, and more than usually cultivated. He joined the National Guard during the Kojutsko Revolution in 1794. When business stagnated, he was forced to teach in the family of the Lezinskis, Mary of that name, one of his pupils, being beloved by Napoleon I became the mother of Count Walewski, a minister of the Second French Empire. Drifting to Zelazowa Wola, Nicolas Chopin lived in the house of the Countess Scarbeck, acting as tutor to her son Frederick. There he made the acquaintance of Justina Krzyzanowska, born of poor but noble parents. He married her in 1806, and she bore him four children, three girls and the boy Frédéric François. With a refined, scholarly French father, Polish in political sentiments, and an admirable Polish mother, patriotic to the extreme, Friedrich grew to be an intelligent, vivacious, home-loving lad. Never a hearty boy, but never very delicate, he seemed to escape most of the disagreeable ills of childhood. The moonstruck, pale, sentimental calf of many biographers, he never was. Strong evidence exists that he was merry, pleasure-loving, and fond of practical jokes. While his father was never rich, the family, after the removal to Warsaw, lived at ease. The country was prosperous, and Chopin the Elder became a professor in the Warsaw Lyceum. His children were brought up in an atmosphere of charming simplicity, love, and refinement. The mother was an ideal mother, and, as Georges Sand declared, Chopin's only love. But, as we shall discover later, Lilia was ever jealous, jealous even of Chopin's past. His sisters were gifted, gentle, and disposed to pet him. Nix has killed all the pretty fairy tales of his poverty and suffering. Strong common sense ruled the actions of Chopin's parents, and when his love for music revealed itself at an early age, they engaged a teacher named Adalbert Jeuvene, 
a bohemian who played the violin and taught piano. Julius Fontana, one of the first friends of the boy, he committed suicide in Paris, December 31st, 1869, says that at the age of twelve Chopin knew so much that he was left to himself with the usual good and ill results. He first played on February 24th, 1818, a concerto by Girovetsch, and was so pleased with his new colour that he naively told his mother, "'Everybody was looking at my colour. His musical precocity, not as marked as Mozart's, but phenomenal withal, brought him into intimacy with the Polish aristocracy, and there his taste for fashionable society developed. The Tartaruskis, Radzivils, Skarbeks, Potoskis, Dubekskis, and the Grand Duke Constantine with his princess Lovica made life pleasant for the talented boy. And then came his lessons with Joseph Elsner in composition, lessons of great value. Elsner saw the material he had to mould, and so deftly did he teach, that his pupil's individuality was never checked, never warped. For Elsner, Chopin entertained love and reverence. To him he wrote from Paris, asking his advice in the matter of studying with Kalkbrenner, and this advice he took seriously. From Jovener and Elsner, even the greatest ass must learn something, he is quoted as having said. Then there are the usual anecdotes. One is tempted to call them the stock stories of the boyhood of any great composer. In infancy Chopin could not hear music without crying. Mozart was morbidly sensitive to the tones of a trumpet. Later, the Polish lad sported familiarly with his talents, for he is related to have sent to sleep and awakened a party of unruly boys at his father's school. Another story is his fooling of a Jew merchant. He had high spirits, perhaps too high, for his slender physique. He was a facile mimic, and Liszt, Balzac, Bocage, Saint, and others believed that he would have made an actor of ability. With his sister Emilia he wrote a little comedy. Altogether, he was a clever, if not a brilliant lad. His letter shows that he was not the letter, for while they are lively, they do not reveal much literary ability. Their writer saw with open eyes, eyes that were disposed to caricature the peculiarities of others. This trait, much clarified and spiritualized in later life, became a distinct, ironic note in his character. Possibly it attracted him, although his irony was on a more intellectual plane. His piano playing at this time was neat and finished, and he had already begun those experimentings in technique and tone that afterward revolutionized the world of music and the keyboard. He being sickly and his sister's health poor, the pair was sent in 1826 to Reinerts, a watering place in Prussian Silesia. This was a visit to his godmother, a titled lady named Vizolovska, and the sister of Count Frederick Skarbek. The name does not tally with the one given heretofore, as noted by Janocha, consumed this year. In 1827 he left his regular studies at the Lyceum, and devoted his time to music. He was much in the country, listening to the fiddling and singing of the peasants, thus laying the cornerstone of his art as a national composer. In the fall of 1828 he went to Berlin, and this trip gave him a foretaste of the outer world. Stephen Heller, who saw Chopin in 1830, described him as pale, of delicate health, and not destined, so they said in Warsaw, for a long life. This must have been during one of his depressed periods, for his stay in Berlin gives a record of unclouded spirits. However, his sister Emilia died young of pulmonary trouble, and doubtless Friedrich was predisposed to lung complaint. He was constantly admonished by his relatives to keep his coat closed. Perhaps, as in Wagner's case, the uncontrollable gaiety and hectic humours were but so many signs of a fatal disintegrating process. Wagner outlived them until the scriptural age, 
but Chopin succumbed when grief, disappointment, and intense feeling had undermined him. For the dissipations of the average, sensual man, he had an abiding contempt. He never smoked, in fact disliked it. His friend Saint differed greatly in this respect, and one of the saddest anecdotes related by de Lentz accuses her of calling for a match to light a cigar. Frédéric, un fidibus, she commanded, and Frédéric obeyed. Mr. Philip Hale mentions a letter from Balzac to his Countess Hanska, dated March 15, 1841, which concludes, Georges Sand did not leave Paris last year. She lives as Rue Pigalle, number 16. Chopin is always there. Elle ne fume que de cigarettes et pas autre chose. Mr. Hale states that the italics are in the latter. So much for de Lentz and his fidibus. I am impelled here to quote from Mr. Ernest Newman's study of Wagner, because Chopin's exaltation of spirits, alternating with irritability and intense depression, were duplicated in Wagner. Mr. Newman writes of Wagner, There have been few men in whom the torch of life has burned so fiercely. In his early days, he seems to have had that gauge of temperament, and that apparently boundless energy which men in his case, as in that of N, Nietzsche, Amiel, and others, have wrongly assumed to be the outcome of harmonious physical and mental health. There is a pathetic exception in the outward lives of so many men and genius, the bloom being, to the instructed eye, only the indication of some subtle nervous derangement, only the forerunner of decay. The overmastering cerebral agitation that obsessed Wagner's life was as with Chopin a symptom, not a sickness, but in the latter it had not yet assumed a sinister turn. Chopin's fourteen days in Berlin, he went there under the protection of his father's friend, Professor Jaroski, to attend the great scientific congress, were full of joy unrestrained. The pair left Warsaw September ninth, eighteen twenty eight, and after five days' travel in a diligence, arrived at Berlin. This was a period of leisure travelling and living. Friedrich saw Spontini, Mendelssohn and Zelter at a distance, and heard Freischutz. He attended the Congress and made sport of the scientists, Alexander von Humboldt included. On the way home they stopped at a place called Zulikau, and Chopin improvised some Polish air so charmingly that the stage was delayed, all hands turning in to listen. This is another of the anecdotes of honourable antiquity. Count Tarnowski relates that Chopin left Warsaw with a light heart, with a mind full of ideas, perhaps full of dreams of fame and happiness. I have only twenty kreutzers in my pockets, he writes in his notebook, and it seems to me that I am richer than Arthur Potosky, whom I met only a moment ago. Besides this, witty conceptions, fun, showing a quiet and cheerful spirit, for example, May it be permitted to me to sign myself as belonging to the circle of your friends, F. Chopin, or a welcome moment in which I can express to you my friendship, F. Chopin, office clerk, or again, ah, my most lordly sir, I do not myself yet understand the joy which I feel on entering the circle of your real friends, F. Chopin, penniless. These letters have a macabre ring, they indicate Chopin's love of jest. Sikorsky tells the story of the lads improvising in church, so that the priest, choir, and congregation were forgotten by him. The travellers arrived at Warsaw, October 6th, after staying a few days in Posen, where the Prince Radziwill lived. Here Chopin played in private. This Prince composer, despite what Liszt wrote, did not contribute a penny to the youth's musical education, though he always treated him in a sympathetic manner. Hummel and Paganini visited Warsaw in 1829. The former he met and admired, the latter he worshipped. This year may have seen the composition, if not the publication, of the Souvenir de Paganini, set to be in the key of A major 
and first published in the supplement of the Warsaw Echo Musicienne. Nix writes that he never saw a copy of this rare composition. Paderewski tells me he has a piece, and that it is weak, having historic interest only. I cannot find much about the Polish poet Julius Slowaski, who died the same year, 1849, as Edgar Allan Poe. Tarnowski declares him to have been Chopin's warmest friend, and in his poetry a starting point of inspiration for the composer. In July 1829, accompanied by two friends, Chopin started for Vienna. Travelling in a delightful old-fashioned manner, the party saw much of the country, Galicia, Upper Silesia and Moravia, the Polish Switzerland. On July 31st, they arrived in the Austrian capital. Then Chopin first began to enjoy an artistic atmosphere, to live less parochially. His home life, sweet and tranquil as it was, could not fail to hurt him as artist. He was flattered and cuddled, and doubtless the touch of effeminacy in his person was fostered. In Vienna the life was gayer, freer, and infinitely more artistic than in Warsaw. He met everyone worth knowing in the artistic world, and his letters at that period are positively brimming over with gossip and pen pictures of the people he knew. The little drop of malice he injects into his descriptions of the personages he encounters is harmless enough and proves that the young man had considerable wit. Count Gallenberg, the lessee of the famous Kärtnertuch Theatre, was kind to him, and the publisher Hesslinger treated him politely. He had brought with him his variations on La ci darem la mano. Altogether, the time seemed propitious, and much more so, when he was urged to give a concert. Persuaded to overcome a natural timidity, he made his Vienna debut at this theatre, August 11th, 1829, playing on a Stein piano his variations, Opus 2. His Krakowiak rondo had been announced, but the parts were not legible, so instead he improvised. He had success, being recalled, and his improvisation on the Polish tune called Schmiel and a scene from La Dame Blanche stirred up much enthusiasm, in which a grumbling orchestra joined. The press was favourable, though Chopin's playing was considered rather light in weight. His style was admired and voted original. Here the critics could see through the millstone, while a lady remarked, It's a pity his appearance is so insignificant. This reached the composer's ear, and caused him an evil quarter of an hour, for he was morbidly sensitive, but being, like most Pauls, secretive, managed to hide it. August 18th, encouraged by his triumph, Chopin gave a second concert on the same stage. This time he played the Krakowiak, and his talent for composition was discussed by the newspapers. He plays very quietly, without the daring élan which distinguishes the artist from the amateur, said one. His defect is the non-observance of the indication of accent at the beginning of musical phrases. What was then admired in Vienna was explosive accentuations and piano drumming. The article continues, as in his playing he was like a beautiful young tree that stands free and full of fragrant blossoms and tribing fruits, so he manifested as much estimable individuality in his compositions, when new figures and passages, new forms, unfolded themselves. This rather acute critique, translated by Dr. Nies, is from the Wiener Theaterzeitung of August 20th, 1829. The writer of it cannot be accused of misonism, that hardening of the faculties of curiousness and prophecy, that semi-paralysis of the organs of hearing, which afflicts critics of music so early in life, and evokes rancor and dislike the novelties. Chopin derived no money from either of his concerts. By this time he was accustomed to being reminded of the lightness and exquisite delicacy of his touch and the originality of his style. It elated him to be no longer mistaken for a pupil, 
and he writes home that my manner of playing pleases the lady so very much. This manner never lost its hold over female hearts, and the airs, caprices, and little struttings of Friedrich are to blame for the widely circulated legend of his effeminate ways. The legend soon absorbed his music, and so it has come to pass that this fiction, begotten of half fact and half mental indolence, has taken root like the noxious wheat it is. When Rubinstein, Tausig, and Liszt played Chopin in passional phrases, the public and critics were aghast. This was a transformed Chopin indeed, a Chopin transposed to the key of manliness. Yet it is true Chopin. The young man's manners were a trifle feminine, but his brain was masculine, electric, and his soul courageous. His polonaise, ballades, cherzi, and etudes need a mighty grip, a grip mental and physical. Chopin met Czerny. He is a good man, but nothing more, he said of him. Czerny admired the young pianist with the elastic hand, and on his second visit to Vienna, characteristically inquired, Are you still industrious? Czerny's brain was a tireless incubator of piano exercises, while Chopin so fused the technical problem with the poetic idea that such a nature as the old pedagogues must have been unattractive to him. He knew Franz, Lachner, and other celebrities, and seems to have enjoyed a mild flirtation with Leopoldine Blaetka, a popular young pianist, for he wrote of his sorrow at parting from her. On August 19th he left with friends for Bohemia, arriving at Prague two days later. There he saw everything and met Klengel of canon fame, a still greater cannoneer than the redoubtable Jadasohn of Leipzig. Chopin and Klengel liked each other. Three days later the party proceeded to Teplitz, and Chopin played an aristocratic company. He reached Dresden August 26th, had Spohr's Faust, and met Kapellmeister Morlacki, that same Morlacki, whom Wagner succeeded as a conductor January 10th, 1843, vide Fink's Wagner. By September 12th, after a brief sojourn in Breslau, Chopin was again safe at home in Warsaw. About this time he fell in love with Constantia Gwadowska, a singer and pupil of the Warsaw Conservatory. Niecks dwells gingerly upon his fervour in love and friendship, a passion with him, and thinks that it gives the key to his life. Of his romantic friendship for Titus Wojciechowski and Jan Matuszynski, his Johnny, there are abundant evidences in the letters. They are like the letters of a lovesick maiden. But Chopin's purity of character was marked. He shrank from coarseness of all sorts, and the fate only know what he must have suffered at times from Georges Sand and her gallant band of retainers. To this impressionable man, Parisian badinage, not to call it anything stronger, was positively antipathetical. Of him we might indeed say, in Lafcadio Hearn's words, every mortal man has been many million times a woman. And was it the Joncourts who dared to assert that, there are no women of genius. Women of genius are men. Chopin needed an outlet for his sentimentalism. His piano was but a sea for some, and we are rather amused than otherwise on reading the romantic nonsense of his boyish letters. After the Vienna trip, his spirits and his health flagged. He was overawed, and Warsaw became hateful to him, for he loved but had not the courage to tell it to the beloved one. He put it on paper, he played it, but speak it he could not. Here is a point that reveals Chopin's native indecision, his inability to make up his mind. He recalls to me the Frédéric Moreau of Flaubert's L'Education Sentimentale. There is an atrophy of the will, for Chopin can neither propose nor fly from Warsaw. He writes letters, that are full of self-reproaches, letters that must have both bored and irritated his friends. Like many other men of genius, he suffered all his life from folie de doute, 
indeed it was what specialists call a beautiful case. This halting and irresolution was a stumbling-block in his career, and is faithfully mirrored in his art. Chopin went to Posen in October 1829, and at the Reggie Views was attracted by the beauty and talent of the Princess Elisa, who died young. Georges Saint has noted Chopin's emotional versatility in the matter of falling in and out of love. He could accomplish both of an evening, and a crumpled rose-leaf was sufficient cause to induce frowns and capricious flights. Decidedly, a young man, très difficile. He played at the Resource in November 1829, the Variations, Opus 2. On March 17, 1830, he gave his first concert in Warsaw, and selected the Adagio and Rondo of his first concerto, the one in F minor, and the potpourri on polo jazz. His playing was criticized for being too delicate, an old complaint, but the musicians, Elsner, Kupinski, and the rest were pleased. Edward Wolf said they had no idea in Warsaw of the real greatness of Chopin. He was Polish, this the public appreciated. But of Chopin, the individual, they missed entirely the flavor. A week later, spurred by adverse and favorable criticisms, he gave a second concert, playing the same excerpts from this concerto. The slow movement is consantic Vardowska, musically idolized. The Krakowiak, and an improvisation. The affair was a success. From these concerts he cleared six hundred dollars, not a small sum in those days for an unknown virtuoso. A sonnet was printed in his honor. Champagne was offered him by an enthusiastic Paris bred, but not born, pianist, named Dunst, who for this act will live in all chronicles of piano playing. Worse still, Orlovsky served up the themes of his concerto into mozaikas and had the impudence to publish them. Then came the last blow. He was asked by a music seller for his portrait, which he refused, having no desire, he said with a shiver, to see his face on cheese and butter wrappers. Some of the criticisms were glowing, others absurd as criticisms occasionally are. Chopin wrote to Titus the same rhapsodical protestations, and finally declared in meticulous peevishness, I will no longer read what people write about me. This has a familiar ring of the true artist, who cares nothing for the newspapers, but treats them religiously after his own and his rival's concerts. Chopin heard Henrietta Sontag with great joy. He was ever a lover and a connoisseur of singing. He advised young pianists to listen carefully and often to great singers. Mademoiselle de Belleville, the pianist, and Lipinski, the violinist, were admired, and he could try to sound criticism when he chose. But the Gradoska is worrying him. Unbearable longing is driving him to exile. He attends her debut as Agnès Zimper's opera, with that title, and writes a complete description of the important function to Titus, who is at his country seat where Chopin visits him betimes. Agitated, he thinks of going to Berlin or Vienna, but after much philandering, remains in Warsaw. On October eleventh, eighteen thirty, following many preparations and much emotional shilly-shallying. Chopin gave his third and last Warsaw concert. He played the E minor concerto for the first time in public, but not in sequence. The first and last two movements were separated by an aria, such being the custom of those days. Later he gave the Fantasia on Polish airs. Best of all for him, Miss Gwadowska sang a Rossini air, wore a white dress and roses in her hair, and was charmingly beautiful thus Chopin, and the details have all the relevancy of a male besieged by Don Cupid. Chopin must have played well, he said to himself, and he was always a cautious self-critic, despite his pride. His vanity and girlishness peep out in his recital, but a response to a quarter of recalls. I believe I did it yesterday with a certain grace, for Brandt had taught me how to do it properly. He is not speaking of his poetic performance, but of his bow to the public. 
as he formerly spoke to his mother of his pretty collar, so, as young man, he makes much of his deportment. But it is all quite in the rôle. Scratch an artist, and you surprise his child. Of course, Constantia sang wonderfully. Her low B came out so magnificently that Zielinski declared it alone was worse as sours and ducats. Ah, these enamoured ones! Chopin left Warsaw November 1st, 1830, for Vienna, and without declaring his love. Or was he a rejected suitor? History is dumb. He never saw his Gwadowska again, for he did not return to Warsaw. The lady was married in 1832, preferring a solid certainty to nebulous genius, to Joseph Grabowski, a merchant at Warsaw. Her husband, so says a romantic biographer, Count Wojinski, became blind. Perhaps even a blind country gentleman was preferable to a lachrymose pianist. Chopin must have heard of the attachment in 1831. Her name almost disappears from his correspondence. Time as well as other nails drove from his memory her image. If she was fickle, he was inconstant. And so, let us waste no pity on this episode, over which lakes of tears have been shed, and rivers of ink have been spilled. Chopin was accompanied by Elsner, and a party of friends as far as Vola, a short distance from Warsaw. There the pupils of the conservatory sang a cantate by Elsner, and after a banquet he was given a silver goblet filled with Polish earth, being adjured, so Karasowski relates, never to forget his country or his friends wherever he might wander. Chopin, his heart full of sorrow, left home, parents, friends, and ideal, severed with his youth, and went forth into the world with a keyboard and a brain full of beautiful music as his only weapons. At Kalitz, he was joined by the faithful Titus, and the two went to Breslau, where they spent four days going to the theatre and listening to music. Chopin played, quite impromptu, two movements of his E minor concerto, supplanting a tremulous amateur. In Dresden, where they arrived November 10th, they enjoyed themselves with music. Chopin went to a soiree at Dr. Kreisig's, and was overwhelmed at the sight of a circle of dames, armed with knitting needles, which they used during the intervals of music-making, in the most formidable manner. He heard Aubert and Rossini operas, and Rolla, the Italian violinist, and listened with delight to Dotsauer and Kummer, the violin cellists, the cello being an instrument for which he had a consuming affection. Rubini, the brother of the great Tina, he met, and was promised important letters of introduction if he desired to visit Italy. He saw Klengel again, who told the young Paul, thereby pleasing him very much, that his playing was like John Fields. Prague was also visited, and he arrived at Vienna in November. There he confidently expected a repetition of his former successes, but was disappointed. Haslinger received him coldly, and refused to print his variations or concerto, unless he got them for nothing. Chopin's first brush with the hated tribe of publishers begins here, and he adopts as his motto the pleasing device, Pay, thou animal, a motto he strictly adhered to. In money matters Chopin was very particular. The bulk of his extant correspondence is devoted to the exposure of the ways and wiles of music publishers. Animal is the mildest term he applies to them. Jew, the most frequent objurgation. After all, Chopin was very Polish. He missed his friends, the Blahetkas, who had gone to Stuttgart, and altogether did not find things so promising as formerly. No profitable engagement could be secured, and to cap his misery, Titus, his other self, left him to join the revolutionists in Poland, November 30th. His letters reflect his mental agitation and terror over his parents' safety. A thousand times he thought of renouncing his artistic ambitions and rushing to Poland to fight for his country. 
he never did and his indecision it was not cowardice is our gain chopin put his patriotism his wrath and his heroism into his polonaises that is why we have them now instead of chopin having been the target of some black-browed russian chopin was psychically brave let us not cavil at the almost miraculous delicacy of his organization he wrote letters to his parents and to Matuszynski, but they are not despairing, at least not to the former. He pretended gaiety, and had great hopes for the future, for he was living entirely on means supplied him by his father. News of Constantia gladdened him, and he decided to go to Italy, but the revolution early in 1831 decided him for France. Dr. Malfetti was good to him, and cheered him, and he managed to accomplish much social visiting. The letters of this period are most interesting. He heard Sarah Heinefetter sing, and listened to Thalenberg's playing of a movement of his own concerto. Thalberg was three years younger than Chopin, and already famous. Chopin did not admire him. Thalberg plays famously, but he is not my man. He plays forte and piano with the pedals, but not with a hand, takes tenths as easily as I do octaves, and wears studs with diamonds. Thalberg was not only too much of a technician for Chopin, but he was also a Jew and a successful one. In consequence, both Poet and Pole revolted. Hummel called on Friedrich, but we hear nothing of his opinion of the elder man and his music. This is all the more strange, considering how much Chopin built on Hummel's style. Perhaps that is the cause of the silence. Just as Wagner's dislike for Meyerbeer was the result of his obligation to the composer of Les Huguenots. He heard Alois Schmidt play, and uttered the very heinous criticism that he is already over forty years old, and composes eighty years old music. This in a letter to Elsner. Our Chopin could be amazingly sarcastic on occasion. He knew Suavik, the violin virtuoso, Merck, the cellist, and all the music publishers. At a concert given by Madame Gajavestris in April 1831, he appeared, and in June gave a concert of his own, at which he must have played the E minor concerto, because of a passing mention in a musical paper. He studied much, and it was July twentieth, 1831, before he left Vienna after a second, last, and thoroughly discouraging visit. Chopin got a passeport visite for London, passant par Paris à Londres, and had permission from the Russian ambassador to go as far as Munich. Then the cholera gave him some bother, as he had to secure a clean bill of health, but he finally got away. The romantic story of I am only passing through Paris, which he is reported to have said in after years, has been ruthlessly shorn of its sentiment. At Munich he played a second concerto, and pleased greatly, but he did not remain in the Bavarian capital, hastening to Stuttgart, where he heard of the capture of Warsaw by the Russians, September 8, 1831. This news, it is said, was a genesis of the great C minor etude in Opus Ten, sometimes called the Revolutionary. Chopin exclaimed in a letter dated December sixteenth, eighteen thirty one, All this caused me much pain. Who could have foreseen it? And in another letter he wrote, How glad my mamma will be that I did not go back. Count Tarnowski, in his recollections, print some extracts from a diary said to have been kept by Chopin. According to this, his agitation must have been terrible. Here are several examples. My poor father! My dearest ones! Perhaps they hunger! Maybe he has not anything to buy bread for mother! Perhaps my sisters have fallen victims to the fury of Muscovite soldiers! Oh, father! Is this the consolation of your old age? Mother, poor, suffering mother, is it for this you outlived your daughter? And I here, unoccupied, and I am here with empty hands. Sometimes I groan, suffer, and despair at the piano. 
O oh God, move the earth, that it may swallow the humanity of the century. May the most cruel fortune fall upon the French, that they did not come to our aid. All this sounded rather melodramatic, and quite unlike Chopin. He did not go to Warsaw, but started for France at the end of September, arriving early in October, 1831. Poland's downfall had aroused him from his apathy, even if it sent him further from her. This journey, as Liszt declares, settled his fate. Chopin was twenty-two years old when he reached Paris. End of chapter 1「2 of Chopin, the Man and his Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chopin, the Man and his Music by James Honecker. Chapter 2 Paris in the Maelstrom. Here, according to Nix, is the itinerary of Chopin's life for the next eighteen years. In Paris, 27 Boulevard Poissonnier to 5 and 38 Chaussée d'Anton to Aix-la-Chapelle, Karlsbad, Leipzig, Heidelberg, Marienbad, and London to Majorca to 5 Rue Tranche, 16 Rue Pigalle, and 9 Square d'Orléans to England and Scotland to nine square d'Orléans once more, Rue Cheo, and twelve place Vendôme, and then Père Lachaise, the last resting place. It may be seen that Chopin was a restless, though not roving, nature. In later years his inability to remain settled in one place bore a pathological impress. Consumptives are often so. The Paris of 1831, the Paris of Arts and Letters, was one of the most delightful cities in the world for the culture-loving. The molten tide of passion and decorative extravagance that swept over intellectual Europe threescore years and ten ago bore on its foaming crest Victor Hugo, prince of romanticists. Nearby was Henry Heine. He left Heinrich across the Rhine. Heine, who dipped his pen in honey and gall, who sneered and wept in the same couplet. The star of classicism had seemingly set. In the rich conflict of genius were Gautier, Schumann, and the rest. All as romance, fantasy, and passion, and the young men heard the moon sing silvery, you remember Du Musset, and the leaves rustle rhythms to the heartbeats of lovers. Away with the grey beards, cried he of the scarlet waistcoat, and all France applauded Ernani. Pity it was that the romantic infant had to die of intellectual anemia, leaving as a legacy the memories and work of one of the most marvellous groupings of genius since the Athens of Pericles. The revolution of 1848 called from the mud the sewermen. Flaubert, his face to the past, gazed sorrowfully at Carthage and wrote an epic of the French bourgeois. Zola and his crowd delved into a moral morass, and the world grew weary of them. And then the faint, fading flowers of romanticism were put into albums where their purple harmonies and subtle sayings are pressed into sweet twilight forgetfulness. Berlio, mad hector of the flaming locks whose orchestral ozone vivified the scores of wagner and liszt began to sound garishly empty brilliantly superficial the colossal nightingale is difficult to classify even today a romantic by temperament he unquestionably was but then his music all colour nuance and brilliancy was not genuinely romantic in its themes Compare him with Schumann, and the genuine romanticist tops the virtuoso. Berlioz, I suspect, was a magnified virtuoso. 
his orchestral technique is supreme but his music fails to force its way into my soul it pricks the nerves it pleases the sense of the gigantic the strange the formless but there is something uncanny about it all like some huge prehistoric bird an awful pterodactyl with goggle eyes horrid snout and scream berlioz like baudelaire has the power of evoking the shudder but as john addington simons wrote the shams of the classicists the spasms of the romanticists have alike to be abandoned neither on a mock parnassus or on a pasteboard blocksberg can the poet of the age now worship the artist walks the world at large beneath the light of natural day all this was before the polish charmer distilled his sugared wormwood his sweet exasperated poison for thirsty souls in morbid paris think of the men and women with whom the newcomer associated for his genius was quickly divined hugo lamartine pere lamne ah what balm for those troubled days was in his parole d'un crayon chateaubriand saint simon merimy gautier liszt victor cousin baudelaire adi scheffer berlioz heine who was the pole news of his muse the laughing nymph if she still continued to drape her silvery veil around the flowing locks of her green hair with a coquetry so enticing if the old sea-god with the long white beard still pursued his mischievous maid with this ridiculous love du musset du mini rossini meyerbeer aubert saint beuve adolphe nuri ferdinand hiller balzac dumas heller delacroix the hugo of painters michelet guizot thiers niemcevich and mikiewicz the polish bards and george sand the quintessence of the paris art and literature the most eloquent page in liszt chopin is the narrative of an evening in the chaussee d'antin for it demonstrates the hungarian's literary gifts and feeling for the right phrase this description of chopin's apartment invaded by surprise has a hypnotizing effect on me the very furnishings of the chamber seem vocal under liszt's fanciful pen in more doubtful taste is a statement that the glaze which covers the grace of the elite as it does the fruit of their deserts could not have been satisfactory to chopin liszt despite his tendency to idealize chopin after his death is our most trustworthy witness at this period chopin was an ideal to liszt though he has not left us a record of his defects the pole was ombrageau and easily offended he disliked democracies in fact mankind in the bulk stunned him this is one reason combined with a frail physique of his inability to conquer the larger public thalberg could do it his aristocratic turner imperturbability beautiful touch and polished mechanism won the suffrage of his audiences liszt never stooped to cajol he came he played he overwhelmed chopin knew all this knew his weaknesses and fought to overcome them but failed another crumpled rose leaf for this man of excessive sensibility since told of liszt and first related by him is the anecdote of chopin refusing to play on being incautiously pressed after dinner giving as a reason ah sir i have eaten so little even though his host was gauche it cannot be denied that the retort was rude chopin met osborne mendelssohn who rather patronized him with the chopinette bayot the violinist and franchom the cellist with the latter he contracted a lasting friendship often playing duos with him and dedicating to him his g minor cello sonata he called on kalkbrenner then the first pianist of his day who was puzzled by the prodigious novelty of the young pole's playing 
having heard Hetz and Hiller, Chopin did not fear to perform his E minor concerto for him. He tells all about the interview in a letter to Titus. Are you a pupil of Fields? was asked by Kalkbrenner, who remarked that Chopin had the style of Kramer and the touch of Field. Not having a standard by which to gauge the new phenomenon, Kalkbrenner was forced to fall back on the playing of men he knew. He then begged Chopin to study three years with him, only three, but Elsner, in an earnest letter, dissuaded his pupil from making any experiments that might hurt his originality of style. Chopin actually attended the class of Kalkbrenner, but soon quit, for he had nothing to learn of the pompous, penurious pianist. The Hiller story of how Mendelssohn, Chopin, Liszt, and Heller teased this grouty old gentleman on the Boulevard des Italiens is capital reading, if not absolutely true. Yet Chopin admired Kalkbrenner's finished technique, despite his platitudinous manner. Heine said, or rather quoted, Koreff, that Kalkbrenner looked like a bonbon that had been in the mud. Niecks thinks Chopin might have learned of Kalkbrenner on the mechanical side. Chopin, in public, was modest about his attainments, looking upon himself as self-taught. I cannot create a new school, because I do not even know the old, he said. It is this very absence of scholasticism that is both the power and weakness of his music. In reality, his true technical ancestor was Hummel. He played the E minor concerto first in Paris, February 26, 1832, and some smaller pieces. Although Kalkbrenner, Bayeux, and others participated, Chopin was the hero of the evening. The affair was a financial failure, the audience consisting mostly of distinguished and aristocratic Poles. Mendelssohn, who disliked Kalkbrenner and was angered at his arrogance in asking Chopin to study with him, applauded furiously. After this, Hiller writes, nothing more was heard of Chopin's lack of technique. The criticisms were favorable. On May 20, 1832, Chopin appeared at a charity concert organized by Prince de la Moscova. He was lionized in society, and he wrote to Titus that his heart beat in syncopation, so exciting was all this adulation, social excitement, and rapid gait of living. But he still sentimentalizes to Titus and wishes him in Paris. A flirtation of no moment with Francilla Pixis, the adopted daughter of Pixis, the hunchback pianist, cruelly mimicked by Chopin, aroused the jealousy of the elder artist. Chopin was delighted, for he was malicious in a dainty way. What do you think of this? he writes. I, a dangerous seducteur. The Paris letters to his parents were unluckily destroyed, as Karasowski relates, by Russian soldiers in Warsaw, September 19, 1863, and with them were burned his portrait by Ari Scheffer and his first piano. The loss of the letters is irremediable. Karazowski, who saw some of them, says they were tinged with melancholy. Despite his artistic success, Chopin needed money and began to consider again his projected trip to America. Luckily, he met Prince Valentin Ratchivel on the street, so it is said, and was persuaded to play at a Rothschild soiree. From that moment his prospects brightened, for he secured paying pupils. Nix, the iconoclast, has run the story to earth and finds it built on airy, romantic foundations. Liszt, Hiller, Franchomme, and Sowinsky never heard of it, although it was a stock anecdote of Chopin. Chopin must have broadened mentally as well as musically in this congenial artistic environment. He went about, hobnobbed with princesses, and of the effect of this upon his compositions there can be no doubt. 
if he became more cosmopolitan he also became more artificial and for a time the salon with its perfumed elegant atmosphere threatened to drug his talent into forgetfulness of loftier aims luckily the master sculptor life intervened and real troubles chiselled this character on tragic broader and more passionate lines he played frequently in public during eighteen thirty two to eighteen thirty three with hiller liszt Hetz, and osborne and much in private there was some rivalry in this parterre of pianists liszt chopin and hiller indulged in friendly contests and chopin always came off winner when polish music was essayed he delighted in imitating his colleagues thalberg especially adolphe brisson tells of a meeting of sand chopin and thalberg where as matthias says the lady chattered like a magpie and thalberg after being congratulated by chopin on his magnificent virtuosity wheeled off polite phrases in return doubtless he valued the pole's compliments for what they were worth the moment his back was presented chopin at the keyboard was mocking him it was then chopin told sand of his pupil georges mathias c'est un bon caboche thalberg took his revenge whenever he could after a concert by chopin he astonished hiller by shouting on the way home in reply to questions he slyly answered that he needed a forte as he had heard nothing but pianissimo the entire evening chopin was never a hearty partisan of the roman movement its extravagance misplaced enthusiasm turbulence attacks on church state and tradition disturbed the finical pole while noise reclaim and boisterousness chilled and repulsed him he wished to be the uland of poland but he objected to smashing idols and refused to wade in gutters to reach his ideal he was not a fighter yet as one reviews the past half-century it is his still small voice that has emerged from the din the golden voice of a poet and not the roar of the artistic demagogues of his day liszt's influence was stimulating but what did not chopin do for liszt read schumann he managed in eighteen thirty four to go to aix la chapelle to attend the lower rhenish music festival there he met hiller and mendelssohn at the painter's shadows and improvised marvellously so hiller writes he visited coblenz with hiller before returning home professor nix has a deep spring of personal humour which he taps at rare intervals he remarks that the coming to paris and settlement there of his friend matuchinsky must have been very gratifying to chopin who felt so much the want of one with whom to sigh this slanting allusion is matched by his treatment of george sand after literally ratting her in a separate chapter he winds up his work with the solemn assurance that he abstains from pronouncing judgment because the complete evidence did not seem to me to warrant my doing so this is positively delicious when i met his biographer at Beirut in eighteen ninety six i told him how much i had enjoyed his work adding that i found it indispensable in the reconstruction of chopin professor nix gazed at me blandly he is most amiable and scholarly looking and remarked you are not the only one he was probably thinking of the many who have had recourse to his human documents of chopin but nix in eighteen eighty eight built on karasowski liszt schumann sand and others so the process is bound to continue since eighteen eighty eight much has been written of chopin much surmised with matuchinsky the composer was happier he devoutly loved his country and despite his sarcasm was fond of his countrymen never an extravagant man he invariably assisted the poles after eighteen thirty four to five chopin's activity as a public pianist began to wane he was not always understood and was not so warmly welcomed as he deserved to be 
on one occasion when he played the largetto of his f minor concerto in a conservatoire concert its frigid reception annoyed him very much nevertheless he appeared at a benefit concert at habenix april twenty sixth eighteen thirty five the papers praised but his irritability increased with every public performance about this time he became acquainted with bellini for whose sensuous melodies he had a peculiar predilection in july eighteen thirty five chopin met his father at karlsbad then he went to dresden and later to leipzig playing privately for schumann clara wieck wenzel and mendelssohn schumann gushes over chopin but his friendliness was never reciprocated on his return to paris chopin visited heidelberg where he saw the father of his pupil adolphe gutmann and reached the capital of the civilized world the middle of october meanwhile a love affair had occupied his attention in dresden in september eighteen thirty five chopin met his old school friends the Wojcinskis, former pupils at his father's school he fell in love with their sister mary and they became engaged he spoke to his father about the matter and for the time paris and his ambitions were forgotten he enjoyed a brief dream of marrying and of settling near warsaw teaching and composing the occasional dream that tempts most active artists soothing them with the notion that there is really a haven of rest from the world's buffets again the gods intervened in the interest of music the father of the girl objected on the score of chopin's means and a social position artists were not paderewskis in those days although the mother favored the romance the wachinskis were noble and wealthy in the summer of eighteen thirty six at marienbad chopin met marie again in eighteen thirty seven the engagement was broken and the following year the inconstant beauty married the son of chopin's godfather kron frederick skarbek as the marriage did not prove a success perhaps the lady played too much chopin a divorce ensued and later she married a gentleman by the name of orpichevsky count wachinsky wrote les trois romans de friedrich chopin in which he asserts that his sister rejected chopin at marienbad in eighteen thirty six but chopin survived the shock he went back to paris and in july eighteen thirty seven accompanied by camille pleyel and stanislas kosmian visited england for the first time his stay was short only eleven days and his church trouble dates from this time he played at the house of james broadwood the piano manufacturer being introduced by pleyel as monsieur fritz but his performance betrayed his identity his music was already admired by amateurs but the critics with a few exceptions were unfavorable to him now sounds for the first time the sinister motive of the george sand affair in deference to mr hadder i shall not call it a liaison it was not in the vulgar sense chopin might have been petty a common failing of artistic men but he was never vulgar in word or deed he disliked the woman with the somber eye before he had met her her reputation was not good no matter if george eliot matthew arnold elizabeth barrett browning and others believed her an injured saint mr haddow indignantly repudiates anything that savors of irregularity in the relations of chopin and aurore dudevant if he honestly believes that their contemporaries flagrantly lied and that the woman's words are to be credited why by all means let us leave the critic in his utopia mary queen of scots has her meline why should not sand boast of at least one apologist for her life besides herself i do not say this with cynical intent nor do i propose to discuss the details of the affair which has been dwelt upon ad nauseum by every twanger of the romantic string the idealists will always see a union of souls the realists and there were plenty of them in paris taking notes from eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty seven view the alliance as a matter of gossip the truth lies midway 
chopin a neurotic being met the polyandrous sand a trampler on all the social and ethical conventions albeit a woman of great gifts repelled at first he gave way before the ardent passion she manifested toward him she was his elder so could veil the situation with the maternal mask and she was the stronger intellect more celebrated chopin was but a pianist in the eyes of the many and so won by her magnetism the man she desired paris artistic paris was full of such situations least protected the countess de gaulle who bore him children cosima von buller wagner among the rest balzac that magnificent combination of bonaparte and byron pirate and poet was apparently leading the life of a saint but his most careful student viscount spelborg de lovinger whose name is veritably balzacian tells us some different stories even gustav flaubert the ascetic giant of rouen had a romance with madame louise colette a mediocre writer and imitator of sand as was countess de gaulle the frankfurt jewess better known as daniel stern that lasted from eighteen forty six to eighteen fifty four according to emile faget here then was a medium which was the other side of good and evil a new transvaluation of morals as nietzsche would say frederick deplored the union for he was theoretically a catholic did he not once resent the visit of liszt and a companion to his apartments when he was absent indeed he may be fairly called a moralist carefully reared in the roman catholic religion he died confessing that faith with the exception of the sand episode his life was not an irregular one he abhorred the vulgar and tried to conceal his infatuation from his parents this intimacy however did the pair no harm artistically notwithstanding the inevitable sorrow and heart-burnings at the close chopin had some one to look after him he needed it and in the society of this brilliant frenchwoman he throve amazingly his best work may be traced to nohant and majorca she on her side profited also after the bitterness of a separation from alfred de musset about eighteen thirty three she had been lonely for the pagello intermezzo was of short duration the de musset sand story was not known in its entirety until eighteen ninety six again monsieur spelborg de lovinger must be consulted as he possessed a bundle of letters that were written by george sand and monsieur boulot the editor of la revue des deux mondes in eighteen fifty eight de musset went to venice with sand in the fall of eighteen thirty three they had the maternal sanction and means supplied by madame de musset the story gives forth the true gallic resonance on being critically tapped de musset returned alone sick in body and soul and thenceforth absent was his constant solace there had been references vague and disquieting of a dr pagello for whom sand had suddenly manifested one of her extraordinary fancies this she denied but de musset's brother plainly intimated that the aggravating cause of his brother's illness had been the unexpected vision of sand coquetting with the young medical man called in to prescribe for alfred dr pagello in eighteen ninety six was interviewed by dr cabana of the paris figaro and here is a story of what had happened in eighteen thirty three this story will explain the later behavior of la mere la blanche toward chopin one night george sand after writing three pages of prose full of poetry and inspiration took an unaddressed envelope placed therein the poetic declaration and handed it to dr pagello he seeing no address did not or feigned not to understand for whom the letter was intended and asked george sand what he should do with it snatching the letter from his hands she wrote upon the envelope to the stupid pagello some days afterward george sand frankly told de musset that henceforth she could be to him only a friend de musset died in eighteen fifty seven and after his death sand startled paris with elle louis 
an obvious answer to confessions of a child of the age de musset's version an uncomplimentary one to himself of their separation the poet's brother paul rallied to his memory with louis et elle and even louisa colette ventured into the fracas with a trashy novel called louis during all this mud throwing the cause of the trouble calmly lived in the little italian town of belluno it was dr giuseppe pagello who will go down in literary history as the one man that played joseph to george sand now do you ask why i believe that sand left chopin when she was bored with him the words some days afterwards are significant i print the pagello story not only because it is new but as a reminder that george sand in her love affairs was always the man she treated chopin as a child a toy used him for literary copy face mr haddow and threw him over after she had wrung out all the emotional possibilities of the problem she was true to herself even when she attempted to palliate her want of heart beware of the woman who punctuates the pages of her life with heart and maternal feelings if i do not believe any more in tears it is because i saw thee crying exclaimed chopin sand was the product of abnormal forces she herself was abnormal and her mental activity while it created no permanent types in literary fiction was also abnormal she dominated chopin as she had dominated jules sandow calmata the mezzo tinter du musset franz liszt delacroix michel de bourges i have not the exact chronological order and later flaubert the most lovable event in the life of this much-loved woman was her old-age affair purely platonic with gustave flaubert the correspondence shows her to have been maternal to the last in the recently published lettre l'étranger of honore du balzac this about sand is very apropos a visit paid to george sand at nohand in march eighteen thirty eight brought the following to madame hanska it was rather well that i saw her for we exchanged confidences regarding sando i who blamed her to the last for deserting him now feel only a deep compassion for her as you will have for me when you learn with whom we have had relations she of love i of friendship but she has been even more unhappy with Musset. So here she is, in retreat, denouncing both marriage and love, because in both she has found nothing but delusion. I will tell you of her immense and secret devotion to these two men, and you will agree that there is nothing in common between angels and devils. All the follies she has committed are claims to glory in the eyes of great and beautiful souls she has been the dupe of la dorval bocage lamne etc through the same sentiment she is the dupe of liszt and madame de gaulle so let us accept without too much questioning as did balzac a reader of souls the sand chopin partnership and follow its sinuous course until eighteen forty seven chopin met sand at a musical matinee in eighteen thirty seven Nix throttles every romantic yarn about the pair that has been spoken or printed. He got his facts viva voce from Franchomme. Sand was antipathetic to Chopin, but her technique for overcoming masculine coyness was as remarkable in its particular fashion as Chopin's proficiency at the keyboard. They were soon seen together and everywhere. She was not musical, not a trained musician but her appreciation for all art forms was highly sympathetic not a beautiful woman being swarthy and rather heavy-set in figure this is what she was as seen by edward grenier she was short and stout but her face attracted all my attention the eyes especially there were wonderful eyes a little too close together it may be large with full eyelids and black very black but by no means lustrous they reminded me of unpolished marble or rather of velvet and this gave a strange dull even cold expression to her countenance her fine eyebrows and these great placid eyes 
gave her an air of strength and dignity which was not borne out by the lower part of her face her nose was rather thick and not over shapely her mouth was also rather coarse and her chin small she spoke with great simplicity and her manners were very quiet but she attracted with imperious power all that she met Liszt felt this attraction at one time and it is whispered that chopin was jealous of him poof the woman who could conquer france least in his youth must have been a sorceress he too was versatile in eighteen thirty eight sand's boy morris being ill she proposed a visit to majorca chopin went with the party in november and full accounts of the mediterranean trip chopin's illness the bad weather discomforts and all the rest may be found in the histoire du mavi by sand it was a time of torment chopin is a detestable invalid said sand and so they returned to noha in july eighteen thirty nine they saw geno for a few days in may but that is as far as chopin ever penetrated into the promised land italy at one time a passion for him sand enjoyed the subtle and truly feminine pleasure of again entering the city which six years before she had visited in company with another man the former lover of rachel chopin's health in eighteen thirty nine was a source of alarm to himself and his friends he had been dangerously ill at majorca and marseilles fever and severe coughing proved to be the dread forerunners of the disease that killed him ten years later he was forced to be very careful in his habits resting more giving fewer lessons playing but little in private or public and becoming frugal of his emotions now sand began to cool though her lively imagination never ceased making graceful touching pictures of herself in the roles of sister of mercy mother and discreet friend all merged into one sentimental composite her invalid was her one thought and for an active mind and body like hers it must have been irksome to submit to the caprices of the moody ailing man he composed at nohan and she has told us all about it how he groaned wrote and rewrote and tore to pieces draft after draft of his work this brings to memory another martyr to style gustave flaubert who for forty years in a room at croiset near rouen wrestled with the devils of syntax and epithet chopin was of an impatient nervous disposition all the more remarkable then his capacity for taking infinite pains like balzac he was never pleased with the final revise of his work he must need aim at finishing touches his letters at this period are interesting for the chopinist but for the most part they consist of requests made to his pupils fontana gutmann and others to jog the publishers to get him new apartments to buy him many things wagner was not more importunate or minatory than this paul who depended on others for the material comforts and necessities of his existence nor is his abuse of friends and patrons the leos and others indicative of an altogether frank sincere nature he did not hesitate to lump them all as pigs or jews if anything happened to jar his nerves money money is the leading theme of the paris and malorian letters sand was a spendthrift and chopin had often to put his hands in his pocket for her he charged twenty francs a lesson but was not a machine and for at least four months of the year he earned nothing hence his anxiety to get all he could for his compositions heaven-born geniuses are sometimes very keen in financial transactions and indeed why should they not be in eighteen thirty nine chopin met moscheles they appeared together at st cloud playing for the royal family chopin received a gold cup moscheles a travelling case the king gave him this said the amiable frederick to get the sooner rid of him there were two public concerts in eighteen forty one and eighteen forty two the first on april twenty six at pleyel's rooms the second on february twenty at the same hall 
niecks devotes an engrossing chapter to the public accounts and the general style of chopin's playing of this more hereafter from eighteen forty three to eighteen forty seven chopin taught and spent the vacations at noha to which charming retreat least matthew arnold delacroix charles rollinat and others came his life was apparently happy he composed and amused himself with morris and solange the terrible children of this bohemian household there according to reports chopin and liszt were in friendly rivalry are two pianists ever friendly liszt imitating chopin's style and once in the dark they exchanged places and fooled their listeners liszt denied this another story is of one or the other working the pedal rods the pedals being broken this too has been laughed to scorn by liszt nor could he recall having played while Piedot garcia sang out on the terrace of the chateau garcia's memory is also short about this event rollinat delacroix and sand have written abundant souvenirs of noha and its distinguished gatherings so let us not attempt to impugn the details of the chopin legend that legend which coughs deprecatingly as it points to its aureoled alabaster brow dulens should be consulted for an account of this period he will add the finishing touches of unreality that may be missing chopin knew every one of note in paris the best salons were open to him some of his confreres have not hesitated to describe him as a bit snobbish for during the last ten years of his life he was generally inaccessible but consider his retiring nature his suspicious slavic temperament above all his delicate health where one accuses him of indifference and selfishness there are ten who praise his unfaltering kindness generosity and forbearance he was as a rule a kind and patient teacher and where talent was displayed his interest trebled can you fancy this aerial of the piano giving lessons to humdrum pupils playing in a charmed and bewitching circle of countesses surrounded by the luxury and the praise that kills chopin is a much more natural figure yet he gave lessons regularly and appeared to relish them he had not much taste for literature he liked voltaire though he read but little that was not polish did he really enjoy sand's novels and when asked why he did not compose symphonies or operas answered that his metier was the piano and to it he would stick he spoke french though with a polish accent and also german but did not care much for german music except bach and mozart beethoven save in the c-sharp minor and several other sonatas was not sympathetic schubert he found rough weber in his piano music too operatic and schumann he dismissed without a word he told heller that the carnival was really not music at all this remark is one of the curiosities of musical anecdotage but he had his gay moments when he would gossip chatter imitate everyone cut up all manner of tricks and like wagner stand on his head perhaps it was feverish agitated gaiety yet somehow it seemed more human than that eternal thaddeus of warsaw melancholy and regret for the vanished greatness and happiness of poland a greatness and happiness that never had existed chopin disliked letter writing and would go miles to answer one in person he did not hate any one in particular being rather indifferent to every one and to political events except where poland was concerned theoretically he hated jews and russians yet associated with both he was like his music a bundle of unreconciled affirmations and evasions and never could have been contented anywhere or with any one of himself he said that he was in this world like the e-string of a violin on a contrabass this divine dissatisfaction led him to extremes to the flouting of friends for fancied affronts to the snubbing of artists who sometimes visited him he grew suspicious of liszt and for ten years was not on terms of intimacy with him although they never openly quarrelled 
the breach which had been very perceptibly widening became hopeless in eighteen forty seven when sand and chopin parted for ever a literature has grown up on the subject chopin never had much to say but sand did so did chopin's pupils who were quite virulent in their assertions that she killed their master the break had to come it was the inevitable end of such a friendship the dynamics of free love have yet to be formulated this much we know two such natures could never entirely cohere when the novelty wore off the stronger of the two the one least in love took the initial step it was george sand who took it with chopin he would never have had the courage nor the will the final causes are not very interesting Niecks has sifted all the evidence before the court and jury of scandal-mongers. The main quarrel was about the marriage of Solange Sand with Klesinger the sculptor. Her mother did not oppose the match, but later she resented Klesinger's actions. He was coarse and violent, she said, with the true mother-in-law spirit, and when Chopin received the young woman and her husband after a terrible scene at Noha, she broke with him. It was a good excuse. He had ennuied her for several years, and as he had completed his artistic work on this planet, and there was nothing more to be studied, the psychological portrait was supposedly painted. Madame Georges got rid of him. The dark stories of maternal jealousy, of Chopin's preference for Solange, the visit to Chopin of the concierge's wife, to complain of her mistress's behavior with her husband, all these rakings I leave to others. It was a triste affair, and I do not doubt in the least that it undermined Chopin's feeble health. Why not? Animals die of broken hearts, and this emotional product of Poland, deprived of affection, home, and careful attention, may well, as Dulin swears, have died of heartbreak. Recent gossip declares that Sand was jealous of Chopin's friendships. This is silly. Mr. A. B. Walkley the english dramatic critic after declaring that he would rather have lived during the balzac epoch in paris continues in this entertaining vein and then one might have had a chance of seeing george sand in the thick of her amorisms for my part i would certainly rather have met her than pontius pilate the people who saw her in her old age flaubert gautier and concords have left us copious records of her odd appearance her perpetual cigarette smoking and her whimsical life at nohant but then she was only an extinct volcano she must have been much more interesting in full eruption of her earlier career the period of musset and pegello she herself told us something in l et louis and correspondence published a year or so ago in the revue de paris told us more but to my mind the most fascinating chapter in this part of her history is the chopin chapter covering the next decade or roughly speaking the forties she has revealed something of this time naturally from her own point of view in lucrezia floriana eighteen forty seven for it is of course one of the most notorious characteristics of george sand that she invariably turned her loves into copy the mixture of passion and printer's ink in this lady's composition is surely one of the most curious blends ever offered to the palate of the epicure but it was a blend which gave the lady an unfair advantage for posterity we hear too much of her side of the matter this one feels especially as regards her affair with chopin with Nusse she had to reckon a writer like herself and against her l a louis we can set his confession de l'enfant du cycle but poor chopin being a musician was not good at copy the emotions she gave him he had to pour out in music which delightful as sound is unfortunately vague as a literary document how one longs to have his full true and particular account of the six months he spent with george sand in majorca monsieur pierre mille who has just published in the revue bleue some letters of chopin first printed it seems in a warsaw newspaper would have us believe that the lady was really the masculine partner 
we are to understand that it was chopin who did the weeping and pouting and scene-making while george sand did the consoling the pooh-poohing and the protecting liszt had already given us a characteristic anecdote of this majorca period we see george sand in sheer exuberance of health and animal spirits wandering out into the storm while chopin stays at home to have an attack of nerves to give vent to his anxiety oh artistic temperament by composing a prelude and to fall fainting at the lady's feet when she returns safe and sound there is no doubt that the lady had enough of the masculine temper in her to be the first to get tired and as poor chopin was coughing and swooning most of the time this is scarcely surprising but she did not leave him forthwith she kept up the pretence of loving him in a maternal protecting sort of way out of pity as it were for a sick child so much the published letters clearly show many of them are dated from noha but in themselves the letters are dull enough chopin composed with the keyboard of a piano with ink and paper he could do little probably his love letters were wooden productions and george sand we know was a fastidious critic in that matter she had received and written so many but any rate chopin did not write whining recriminations like musset his real view of her we shall never know and if you like you may say it is no business of ours she once uttered a truth about that though not a propos of chopin there are so many things between two lovers of which they alone can be the judges chopin gave his last concert in paris february sixteen eighteen forty eight at pleyels he was ill but played beautifully oscar cometon said he fainted in the artist's room sand and chopin met but once again she took his hand which was trembling and cold but he escaped without saying a word he permitted himself in a letter to jimala from london dated november seventeen to eighteen eighteen forty eight to speak of sand i have never cursed any one but now i am so weary of life that i am near cursing lucrezia but she suffers too and suffers more because she grows older in wickedness what a pity about Solly! alas everything goes wrong with the world i wonder what mr haddo thinks of this reference to sand Solly is solange sand who was forced to leave her husband because of ill-treatment as her mother once boxed Klesinger's ears at noha she followed the example in trying to settle the affair sand quarrelled hopelessly with her daughter that energetic descendant of emancipated woman formed a partnership literary of course with the marquis alfieri the nephew of the italian poet her salon was as much in vogue as her mother's but her tastes were inclined to politics revolutionary politics preferred she had for associates gambetta jules ferry floquet taine herr weiss the critic of the debat henry fouquier and many others she had the curved hebraic nose of her mother and hair coal black she died in her chateau at montgivre and was buried march twenty eighteen ninety nine at nohant where as my informant says her mother died of overmuch cigarette smoking she was a clever woman and wrote a book masks and buffoons morris sand died in eighteen eighty three he was the son of his mother who was gathered to her heterogeneous ancestors june eighth eighteen seventy six in literature george sand is a feminine pennant to jean jacques roseau full of ill-digested troubled fermenting social political philosophical and religious speculations and theories she wrote picturesque french smooth flowing and full of colour the sketches of nature of country life have positive value but where has vanished her gallery of byronic passion pursued women where are the lilias the indianas 
the Rodolstadts. She had not, as Mr. Henry James points out, a faculty of characterization. As Flaubert wrote her, In spite of your great sphinx eyes, you have always seen the world as through a golden mist. She dealt in vague, vast figures, and so her Prince Carol in Lucrezia Floriana, unquestionably intended for Chopin, is a burlesque. Little wonder he was angered when the precious children asked him, Cher Monsieur Chopin, have you read Lucrezia? Mamma has put you in it. Of all persons, Sand was pre-elected to give to the world a true, a sympathetic picture of her friend. She understood him, but she had not the power of putting him between the covers of a book. If Flaubert, or better still, Pierre Lotti, could have known Chopin so intimately, we should possess a memoir in which every vibration of emotion would be recorded, every shade noted, and all pinned with the precise adjective, the phrase exquisite. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Chopin, the Man and His Music」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Malchem Chopin, the Man and His Music by James Hanneker Chapter Three England, Scotland and Père Lachaise The remaining years of Chopin's life were lonely. His father died in 1844 of chest and heart complaint. His sister Amelia died of consumption, ill omen seas, and shortly after, Jan Motuczynski died. Titus Wojciechowski was in far off Poland on his estates, and Chopin had but Grigmana and Fontana to confide in. They being Polish, he preferred them, although he was diplomatic enough not to let others seize his. Both Franchom and Gutmann whispered to Nix at different times that each was a particular soul, the alter ego of Chopin. He appeared to give himself to his friends, but it was usually surface affection. He had coaxing, coquettish ways, playful ways that cost him nothing when in good spirits. So he was more loved than loving. This is another trait of the man, which, allied with his fastidiousness and spiritual brusquerie, made him difficult to decipher. The loss of Saar completed his misery, and we find him in poor health when he arrived in London, for the second and last time, April 21st, 1848. Mr. A. J. Hipkins is the chief authority on the details of Chopin's visit to England. To this amiable gentleman and learned writer on pianos, Franz Hofer, Joseph Bennett, and Niecks are indebted for the most of their facts. From them the curious may learn all there is to learn. The story is not especially noteworthy, being in the main a record of ill health, complainings, lamentations, and not one signal artistic success. War was declared upon Chopin by a part of the musical world. The criticism was compounded of pure malice and stupidity. Chopin was angered but little, for he was too sick to care now. He went to an evening party, but missed it the McCready dinner, where he was to have met Thackeray, Berlioz, Mrs. Proctor, and Sir Julius Benedict. With Benedict he played the Mozart duet at the Duchess of Sutherland's. Whether he played at court, the Queen can tell, Niecks cannot. He met Jenny Lind Goldschmidt, and liked her exceedingly, as did all who had the honour of knowing her. She sided with him, woman-like, in the Saw affair, echoes of which had floated across the Channel, and visited him in Paris in 1849. Chopin gave two matinees at the houses of Adelaide Campbell and Lord Falmouth, June 23rd and July 7th. They were very... Recherché, so it appears. Viardot Garcia sang. The composer's face and frame were wasted by illness, and Mr. Solomon spoke with his long, attenuated fingers. He 
He made money, and that was useful to him, for doctors' bill and living had taken up his savings. There was talk of his settling in London, but the climate, not to speak of the unmusical atmosphere, would have been fatal to him. Wagner succumbed to both, sturdy fighter that he was. Chopin left for Scotland in August, and stopped at the house of his pupil, Miss Sterling. Her name is familiar to Chopin students, for the two nocturnes, Opus 55, are dedicated to her. He was nearly killed with kindness, but continually bemoaned his existence. At the house of Dr. Lichinsky, a Pole, he lodged in Edinburgh, and was so weak that he had to be carried up and down the stairs. To the doctor's good wife, he replied in answer to his question, George Sand is your particular friend? Not even George Sand. And is he to be blamed for evading tiresome reminders of the past? He confessed that his excessive thinness had caused Sand to address him as My dear corpse. Charming, is it not? Miss Sterling was doubtless in love with him, and Princess Xatoriska followed him to Scotland to see if his health was better. So he was not altogether deserted by the women. Indeed, he could not live without their little flatteries and agreeable attentions. It is safe to say that a woman was always within call of Chopin. He played at Manchester on the 28th of August, but his friend Mr. Osborne, who was present, says, his playing was too delicate to great enthusiasm, and I felt truly sorry for him. On his return to Scotland, he stayed with Mr. and Mrs. Sally Schwab. Mr. J. Cuthert Haddon wrote several years ago in the Glasgow Herald of Chopin's visit to Scotland in 1848. The tone poet was in the poorest health, but with characteristic tenacity played at concerts and paid visits to his admirers. Mr. Haddon found the following notice in the back files of the Glasgow Courier. Monsieur Chopin has the honour to announce that his matinee musicale will take place on Wednesday, the 27th of September, in the Merchant Hall, Glasgow. To commence at half-past two o'clock. Tickets, limited in number, half a guinea each, and full particulars to be had from Mr. Muir Wood, 42 Buchanan Street. He continues, The net profits of this concert are said to have been exactly sixty pounds, a ridiculously low sum when we compare it with the earnings of later day virtuosity, nay, still more ridiculously low when we recall the circumstance that for two concerts in Glasgow six years before this, Paganini had one thousand four hundred pounds. Muir Wood, who has since died, said, I was then a comparative stranger in Glasgow, but I was told that so many private carriages had never been seen at any concert in the town. In fact, it was a county people who turned out, with a few of the elite of Glasgow society. Being a morning concert, the citizens were busy otherwise, and half a guinea was considered too high a sum for their wives and daughters. The late Dr. James Hedrick of Glasgow, tells in his reminiscences that on entering the hall he found it about one-third full. It was obvious that a number of the audience were personal friends of Chopin. Dr. Hedwig recognized the composer at once as a little, fragile-looking man, in pale grey suit, including frock coat of very identical tint and texture, moving about among the company, conversing with different groups and occasionally consulting his watch, which it seemed to be no bigger than a naked stone on the forefinger of an alderman. Whiskerless, beardless, fair of hair and pale and thin of face, his appearance was interesting and conspicuous, and when, after a final glance at his miniature or lodge, he ascended the platform and placed himself at the instrument, he at once commanded attention. Dr. Hedwig says it was a drawing-room entertainment, more piano than forte though not without occasional episodes of both strength and grandeur. It was perfectly clear to him that Chopin was marked for an early grave. So far as can be ascertained, there are now living only two members of that Glasgow audience of 1848. One of the two is Julius Seligman, the veteran president of the Glasgow Society of Musicians, 
who, in response to some inquiries on the subject, writes as follows. Several weeks before the concert, Chopin lived with different friends or pupils on their invitations in the surrounding counties. I think his pupil Miss Jane Sterling had something to do with all the general arrangements. Muir Wood managed the special arrangement of the concert, and I distinctly remember him telling me that he never had so much difficulty in arranging a concert as on this occasion. Chopin constantly changed his mind. Wood had to visit him several times at the house of Admiral Napier, at Millicom Park, near Johnstone, but scarcely had to return to Glasgow, when he was summoned back to alter something. The concert was given in the Merchant Hall, Hutchinson Street, now the county buildings. The hall was about three quarters filled. Between Chopin's playing, Madame Adelazio de Marguerite, daughter of a well-known London physician, sang, and Mr. Muir accompanied her. Chopin was evidently very ill. His touch was very feeble, and while the finish, grace, elegance, and delicacy of his performances were greatly admired by the audience, the want of power made his playing somewhat monotonous. I do not remember the whole programme, but he was in court for his well-known mazurka in B-flat, Op. 7, No. 1, which he repeated with quite different nuances from those of the first time. The audience was very aristocratic, consisting mostly of ladies, among whom was the then Duchess of Argyll, and her sister, Lady Blantyre. The other survivor is George Russell Alexander, son of the proprietor of the Theatre Royal, Dunlop Street, who, in a letter to the writer, remarks especially upon Chopin's pale, cadaverous appearance. My emotion, he says, was so great that two or three times I was compelled to retire from the room to recover myself. I have heard all the best and most celebrated stars of the musical firmament, but never one has left such an impress on my mind. Chopin played October Falls in Edinburgh, and returned to London in November after various visits. We read of a Polish ball and concert at which he played, but the affair was not a success. He left England in January 1849, and heartily glad he was to go. Do you see the cattle in this meadow? he asked en route for Paris. Sa plus d'intelligence que des Anglais, which was not nice of him. Perhaps M. Nitrischke, to whom he made the remark, took as earnest a pure bit of nonsense, and perhaps he certainly disliked England and the English. Now the curtain prepares to fall on the last dreary finale of Chopin's life, a life not for a moment heroic, yet lived according to his lights and free from the sordid and the soil of vulgarity. Jules Janin said, He lived ten miraculous years with the breath ready to fly away, and we know that his servant Daniel had always to carry him to bed. For ten years he had suffered from so much illness that a relapse was not noticed by the world. His very death was at first received with incredulity, for as Stephen Haller said, he had been reported dead so often that the real news was doubted. In 1847, his legs began to bother him by swelling, and M. Mathias described him as a painful spectacle, the picture of exhaustion, the back bend, head bowed, but always amiable and full of distinction. His purse was empty, and his lodgings in the Rue Chaillot were represented to the proud man as being just half their cost, the balance being paid by the Countess Obreskov, a Russian lady. Like a romance is ascending by Miss Sterling of twenty-five thousand far, but it is nevertheless true. The noble-hearted Scotchwoman heard of Chopin's needs through Madame Rubio, a pupil, and the money was raised. That packet containing it was mislaid or lost by the porters of Chopin's house, but found after the woman had been taxed with keeping it. Chopin, his future assured, moved to Place Vendôme, number 12. There he died. His sister Louise was sent for, 
and came from Poland to Paris. In the early days of October he could no longer sit upright without support. Gutmann and the Countess Delphine Potoka, his sister, and Monsieur Gavard were constantly with him. It was Turgenev who spoke of the half-hundred countesses in Europe who claimed to have helped the dying Chopin in their arms. In reality, he died in Gutmann's, raising that pupil's hand to his mouth and murmuring, Charmy, as he expired. Solange's son was there, but not her mother, who called and was not admitted, so they say. Gutmann denies having refused her admittance. On the other hand, if she had called, Chopin's friends would have kept her away from him, from the man who told Franchomme two days before his death. She said to me that I would die in no arms but hers. Surely, unless she was monstrous in her egotism, and she was not, Georges Saint did not hear this sad speech without tears and boundless regrets. Alas, all things come too late for those who wait. Tarnovsky relates that Chopin gave his last orders in perfect consciousness. He begged his sister to burn all his inferior compositions. I owe it to the public, he said, and to myself to publish only good things. I kept to this resolution all my life. I wish to keep to it now. This wish has not been respected. The posthumous publications are, for the most part, feeble stuff. Chopin died October 17th, 1849, between three and four in the morning, after having been shrived by the Abbe Jelovisky. His last word, according to Gavard, was, plus, on being asked if he suffered. Regarding the touching and slightly melodramatic death that scene on the day previous, when Delphine Potocka sang Stradella and Mozart, or was it Marcello? Liszt, Karasowski, and Gutmann disagree. The following authentic account of the last hours of Chopin appears here for the first time in English, translated by Mr. Hugh Craig. In Liszt's well-known work on Chopin, second edition, 1879, mention is made of a conversation that he held with the Abbe Jalovisky respecting Chopin's death and in Nick's biography of Chopin some sentences from letters by the Abbé are quoted. These letters, written in French, have been translated and published in the Allgemeine Musikzeitung, to which they were given by the Princess Marie Hornlohr, the daughter of Princess Caroline Zane Wittgenstein, Liszt's universal legacy and executor, who died in 1887. For many years, so runs the document, the life of Chopin was but a breath. His frail, weak body was visibly unfitted for the strength and force of his genius. It was a wonder how in such a weak state he could live at all, and occasionally act with the greatest energy. His body was almost diaphanous. His eyes were almost shadowed by a cloud from which, from time to time, the lightnings of his glance flashed. Gentle, kind, bubbling with humour and every way charming. He seemed no longer to belong to earth, while unfortunately he had not yet thought of heaven. He had good friends, but many bad friends. These bad friends were his flatterers, that is, his enemies, men and women without principles, or rather, with bad principles. Even his unrivalled success, so much more subtle and thus so much more stimulating, than that of all other artists, carried the war into his soul and checked the expression of faith and of prayer. The teachings of the fondest, most pious mother became to him a recollection of his childhood's love. In the place of faith, doubt had stepped in, and only that decency innate in every generous heart hindered him from indulging in sarcasm and mockery over holy things and the consolations of religion. While he was in this spiritual condition, he was attacked by the pulmonary disease that was soon to carry him away from us. The knowledge of this cruel sickness reached me on my return from Rome. With beating heart I hurried to him, to see once more the friend of my youth, 
who saw was infinitely dearer to me than all his talent. I found him not sinner, for that was impossible, but weaker. His strength sank, his life faded visibly. He embraced me with affection and with tears in his eyes, thinking not of his own pain, but of mine. He spoke of my poor friend Edouard Vorter, whom I had just lost, you know how. He was shot a martyr of liberty at Vienna, November 10th, 1848. I availed myself of his softened mood to speak to him about his soul. I recalled his thoughts to the piety of his childhood and of his beloved mother. Yes, he said, in order not to offend my mother, I would not die without the sacraments. But for my part, I do not regard them in the sense that you desire. I understand the blessing of confession in so far as it is the unburdening of a heavy heart into a friendly hand, but not as a sacrament. I am ready to confess to you, if you wish it, because I love you, not because I hold it necessary. Enough. A crowd of anti-religious speeches filled me with terror and care for this elect soul, and I feared nothing more than to be called to be his confessor. Several months passed with similar conversations so painful to me, the priest and the sincere friend. Yet I clung to the conviction that the grace of God would obtain the victory over this rebellious soul, even if I knew not how. After all my exertions, prayer remained my only refuge. On the evening of October 12th, I had with my brethren retired to pray for a change in Chopin's mind, when I was summoned by orders of the physician, in fear that he would not live through the night. I hastened to him. He pressed my hand, but bade me at once to depart, while he assured me he loved me much, but did not wish to speak to me. Imagine, if you can, what a night I passed. Next day was the thirteenth, the day of St. Edward, the patron of my poor brother. I said mass for the repose of his soul, and prayed for Chopin's soul. My God, I cried, if the soul of my brother Edward is pleasing to thee, give me this day the soul of Friedrich. In double distress I then went to the melancholy abode of our poor sick man. I found him at breakfast, which was served as carefully as ever, and after he had asked me to partake, I said, My friend, today is the name day of my poor brother. Oh, do not let us speak of it, he cried. Dearest friend, I continued, you must give me something for my brother's name day. What shall I give you? Your soul. Ah! I understand. Here it is. Take it. At these words, unspeakable joy and anguish seized me. What should I say to him? What should I do to restore his face, how not to lose instead of saving this beloved soul? How should I begin to bring it back to God? I flung myself on my knees, and after a moment of collecting my thoughts, I cried in the depths of my heart, Draw it to thee, thyself, my God. Without saying a word, I held out to our dear invalid the crucifix. Rays of divine light, flames of divine fire streamed, I might say, visibly from the figure of the crucified Saviour, and at once illumined the soul and kindled the heart of Chopin. Burning tears streamed from his eyes. His face was once more revived, and with unspeakable fervour he made his confession and received the Holy Supper. After the blessed viaticum, penetrated by the heavenly consecration in which the sacraments pour forth the pious souls, he asked for extreme unction. He wished to pay lavishly the sacristan who accompanied me, and when I remarked that the sum presented by him was twenty times too much, he replied, Oh no, for what I have received is beyond price. From this hour he was a saint. The death struggle began and lasted four days. Patience, trust in God, even joyful confidence never left him, in spite of all his sufferings till the last breath. He was really happy, and called himself happy. In the midst of the sharpest sufferings, he expressed only ecstatic joy 
touching love of God, thankfulness that I had led him back to God, contempt of the world and its good, and a wish for a speedy death. He blessed his friends, and when, after an apparently last crisis, he saw himself surrounded by the crowd, the day and night filled his chamber, he asked me, Why do they not pray? At these words all fell on their knees, and even the Protestants joined in the litanies and prayers for the dying. Day and night he held my hand, and would not let me leave him. No, you will not leave me at the last moment, he said and leaned on my breast, as a little child in a moment of danger hides itself in its mother's breast. Soon he called upon Jesus and Mary, with a fervor that reached to heaven. Soon he kissed the crucifix in excess of peace, hope, and love. He made the most touching utterances. I love God and man, he said. I am happy so to die. Do not weep, my sister. My friends do not weep. I am happy. I feel that I am dying. Farewell. Pray for me. Exhausted by deathly convulsions, he said to the physicians, Let me die. Do not keep me longer in this world of exile. Let me die. Why do you prolong my life when I have renounced all things and God has enlightened my soul? God calls to me. Why do you keep me back? Another time, he said, O oh, lovely science, that only lets one suffer longer. Could it give you back my strength, qualify me to do any good, to make any sacrifice? But a life of fainting, of grief, of pain to all who love me, to prolong such a life, O oh, lovely science. Then he said again, You let me suffer cruelly. Perhaps you have erred about my sickness, but God errs not. He punishes me, and I bless him, therefore, Oh, how good is God to punish me here below! Oh, how good God is! His usual language was always elegant, with well-chosen words, but at last to express all his thankfulness, and at the same time all the misery of those who die unreconciled to God, he cried, Without you I should have croaked, crepidon, like a pig. While dying, he still called on the names of Jesus, Mary, Joseph, kissed a crucifix and pressed it to his heart with a cry, Now I am at the source of blessedness. This died Chopin, and in truth, his death was the most beautiful concerto of all his life. The worthy abbé must have had a phenomenal memory. I hope that it was an exact one. His story is given in its entirety because of its novelty. The only thing that makes me feel in the least sceptical is that La Mara, the pen name of a writer on musical subjects, translated these letters into German. But everyone agrees that Chopin's end was serene. Indeed, it is one of the musical deathbeds of history. Another was Mozart's. His face was beautiful and young in the flower-covered coffin, says Liszt. He was buried from the Madeleine, October 30th, with a ceremony befitting a man of genius. The B-flat minor funeral march, orchestrated by Henri Robert, was given, and during the ceremony, Effie Burvelli played on the organ the E and B minor preludes. The pallbearers were distinguished men, Meyerbeer, Delacroix, Blaine, and Franchomme. At least Théophile Gautier so reported it for his journal. Even at his grave in Père Lachaise, no two persons could agree about Chopin. This controversy is quite characteristic of Chopin, who was always the calm centre of argument. He was buried in evening clothes, his concert dress, but not at his own request. Kwiatowski, the portrait painter, told this to Nix. It is a Polish custom for the dying to select their grave clothes, yet Lombroso writes that Chopin in his will directed that he should be buried in a white tie, small shoes, and short breeches, adducing this as an evidence of his insanity. He further adds he abandoned the woman whom he tenderly loved, because she offered a chair to someone else before giving the same invitation to himself. Here we have a song story, 
raised to the dignity of a diagnosed symptom. It is like the other nonsense. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Chopin, The Man and His Music》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M. J. Frank《Chopin, The Man and His Music》by James Huneker《Chapter Four The Artist Chopin's personality was a pleasant, persuasive one, without being so striking or so dramatic as Liszt's. As a youth, his nose was too large, his lips thin, the lower one protruding. Later, Machele said that he looked like his music. Delicacy in a certain aristocratic bearing, a harmonious ensemble, produced a most agreeable sensation. He was of slim frame, middle height, fragile but wonderfully flexible limbs, delicately formed hands, very small feet, an oval, softly outlined head, a pale, transparent complexion, long silken hair of a light chestnut color parted on one side, tender brown eyes, intelligent rather than dreamy, a finely curved aquiline nose, a sweet, subtle smile, graceful and varied gestures. This precise description is by Niex. Liszt said he had blue eyes, but he has been overruled. Chopin was fond of elegant, costly attire, and was very correct in the matter of studs, walking sticks, and cravats. Not the ideal musician we read of, but a gentleman. Berlioz told Legouvé to see Chopin, for he is something which you have never seen, and someone you will never forget an orchidaceous individuality this with such personal refinement he was a man punctual and precise in his habits associating constantly with fashionable folk his naturally dignified behavior was increased he was an aristocrat there is no other word and he did not care to be hail fellow well met with the musicians a certain primness and asperity did not make him popular while teaching, his manner warmed, the earnest artist came to life, all halting of speech and polite insincerities were abandoned. His pupils adored him. Here, at least, the sentiment was one of solidarity. De Lenz is his most censorious critic, and did not really love Chopin. The dislike was returned, for the Pole suspected that his pupil was sent by Liszt to spy on his methods. This I heard in Paris. Chopin was a remarkable teacher. He never taught but one genius, little Filch, the Hungarian lad of whom Liszt said, When he starts playing, I will shut up shop. The boy died in 1845, aged 15. Paul Gunsberg, who died the same year, was also very talented. Once, after delivering in a lovely way the master's E minor concerto, Filch was taken by Chopin to a music store, and presented with the score of Beethoven's Fidelio. He was much affected by the talents of this youthful pupil. Lindsay Sloper and Brinley Richards studied with Chopin. Carolyn Hartmann, Gutmann, Liesberg, Georges Matthias, Mademoiselle O'Meara, many Polish ladies of rank, Delphine Potoka among the rest, Madame Stryker, Karl Mikugli, Madame Rubio, Madame Peruzzi, Thomas Tellefsen, Casimir Wernick, Gustav Schumann, Werner Steinbrecher, and many others became excellent pianists. Was the American pianist Louis Moreau Gottschalk ever his pupil? His friends say so, but Niex does not mention him. Ernst Power questions it. We know that Gottschalk studied in Paris with Camille Stamati and made his first appearance there in 1847. This was shortly before Chopin's death, when his interest in music had abated greatly. No doubt Gottschalk played for Chopin, for he was the first to introduce the Pole's music in America. Chopin was very particular about the formation of the touch, giving Clementi's preludes at first. Is that a dog barking? 
was his sudden exclamation at a rough attack. He taught the scales staccato and legato, beginning with E major. Ductility, ease, gracefulness were his aim. Stiffness, harshness annoyed him. He gave Clementi, Machelez, and Bach. Before playing in concert, he shut himself up and played. Not Chopin, but Bach, always Bach. Absolute finger independence and touch discrimination and color are to be gained by playing the preludes and fugues of Bach. Chopin started a method, but it was never finished, and his sister gave it to the Princess Czartoryska after his death. It is a mere fragment. Janotha has translated it. One point is worth quoting. He wrote, no one notices inequality in the power of the notes of a scale when it is played very fast and equally as regards time. In a good mechanism, the aim is not to play everything with an equal sound, but to acquire a beautiful quality of touch and a perfect shading. For a long time, players have acted against nature in seeking to give equal power to each finger. On the contrary, each finger should have an appropriate part assigned it. The thumb has the greatest power, being the thickest finger and the freest. Then comes the little finger at the other extremity of the hand. The middle finger is the main support of the hand, and is assisted by the first. Finally comes the third, the weakest one. As to this Siamese twin of the middle finger, some players try to force it with all their might to become independent, a thing impossible and most likely unnecessary. There are, then, many different qualities of sound, just as there are several fingers. The point is to utilize the differences, and this, in other words, is the art of fingering. Here it seems to me is one of the most practical truths ever uttered by a teacher. Pianists spend thousands of hours trying to subjugate impossible muscles. Chopin, who found out most things for himself, saw the waste of time and force. I recommend his advice. He was ever particular about fingering, but his innovations horrified the purists. Play as you feel, was his motto, a rather dangerous precept for beginners. He gave to his pupils the concertos and sonatas, all carefully graded, of Mozart, Scarlatti, Field, Dussek, Hummel, Beethoven, Mendelssohn, Weber, and Hiller, and of Schubert, the forehand pieces and dances. Liszt he did not favor, which is natural, Liszt having written nothing but brilliant paraphrases in those days. The music of the later Liszt is quite another thing. Chopin's genius for the pedal, his utilization of its capacity for the vibration of related strings, the overtones I refer to later. Rubinstein said, the piano bard, the piano rhapsodist, the piano mind, the piano soul is Chopin. Tragic, romantic, lyric, heroic, dramatic, fantastic, soulful, sweet, dreamy, brilliant, grand, simple. All possible expressions are found in his compositions, and all are sung by him upon his instrument. Chopin is dead only fifty years, but his fame has traversed the half-century with ease, and bids fair to build securely in the loves of our great-grandchildren. The six letters that comprise his name pursue every piano that is made. Chopin and modern piano playing are inseparable, and it is a strain upon homely prophecy to predict a time when the two shall be put asunder. Chopin was the greatest interpreter of Chopin, and following him came those giants of other days, Liszt, Tausig, and Rubinstein. While he never had the pupils to mold as had Liszt, Chopin made some excellent piano artists. They all had, or have, the old guard dies bravely, his tradition. But exactly what the Chopin tradition is, no man may dare say. Anton Rubinstein, when I last heard him, played Chopin inimitably. Never shall I forget the ballades, the two polonaises in F-sharp minor and A-flat major, the B-flat minor prelude, 
the A minor Winter Wind, the two C minor studies, and the F minor Fantasie. Yet the Chopin pupils, assembled in judgment at Paris when he gave his historical recitals, refused to accept him as an interpreter. His touch was too rich and full, his tone too big. Chopin did not care for Liszt's reading of his music, though he trembled when he heard him thunder in the Eroica Polonaise. I doubt if even Karl Tausig, impeccable artist, unapproachable Chopin player, would have pleased the composer. Chopin played as his moods prompted, and his playing was the despair and the delight. Chopin played as his moods prompted, and his playing was the despair and delight of his hearers. Rubinstein did all sorts of wonderful things with the coda of the Barcarolle. Such a page! But Sir Charles Halle said that it was clever, but not Chopin-esque. Yet Halle heard Chopin at his last Paris concert, February 1848, play the two forte passages in the Barcarolle pianissimo, and with all sorts of dynamic finesse. This is precisely what Rubinstein did, and his pianissimo was a whisper. Von Bülow was too much of a martinet to reveal the poetic quality. Though he appreciated Chopin on the intellectual side, his touch was not beautiful enough. The Slavic and Magyar races are your only true Chopin interpreters. Witness List the Magnificent, Rubinstein a passionate genius, Tausig, who united in his person all the elements of greatness, Essipawa, fascinating and feminine, the poetic Paderewski, de Pachmann, the fantastic, subtle Josephi, and Rosenthal, a phenomenon. A world-great pianist was this Frédéric François Chopin. He played as he composed, uniquely. All testimony is emphatic as to this, Scales that were pearls, a touch rich, sweet, supple, and singing, and a technique that knew no difficulties, these were part of Chopin's equipment as a pianist. He spiritualized the timbre of his instrument until it became transformed into something strange, something remote from its original nature. His pianissimo was an enchanting whisper. His forte seemed powerful by contrast so numberless were the gradations, so widely varied his dynamics. The fairy-like quality of his play, his diaphanous harmonies, his liquid tone, his pedaling, all were the work of a genius and a lifetime. And the appealing humanity he infused into his touch gave his listeners a delight that bordered on the supernatural. So the accounts, critical, professional, and personal read, there must have been a hypnotic quality in his performances that transported his audience wherever the poet willed. Indeed, the stories told wear an air of enthusiasm that borders on the exaggerated, on the fantastic. Crystalline pearls falling on red-hot velvet. Or did Scudo write this of Liszt? Infinite nuance and the mingling of silvery bells. These are a few of the least exuberant notices. Was it not Heine who called Thalberg a king, Liszt a prophet, Chopin a poet, Hertz an advocate, Kalkbrenner a minstrel, Madame Pleyel a sibyl, and Daler a pianist? The limpidity, the smoothness and ease of Chopin's playing were, after all, on the physical plane. It was the poetic melancholy, the grandeur, above all, the imaginative lift, that were more in evidence than more sensuous sweetness. Chopin had, we know, his salon side when he played with elegance, brilliancy, and coquetry, but he had dark moments when the keyboard was too small, his ideas too big for utterance. Then he astounded, thrilled his auditors. They were rare moments. His mood versatility was reproduced in his endless colorings and capricious rhythms. The instrument vibrated with these new, nameless effects, like the violin in Paganini's hands. It was ravishing. He was called the Ariel, the Undine of the piano. There was something imponderable, fluid, vaporous, evanescent in his music that eluded analysis and eluded all but hard-headed critics. 
This novelty was the reason why he has been classed as a gifted amateur, and even today is he regarded by many musicians as a skillful inventor of piano passages and patterned figures instead of what he really is, one of the most daring harmonists since Bach. Chopin's elastic hand, small, thin, with lightly articulated fingers, was capable of stretching tenths with ease. Examine his first study for confirmation of this. His wrist was very supple. Stephen Heller said that it was a wonderful sight to see Chopin's small hands expand and cover a third of the keyboard. It was like the opening of the mouth of a serpent about to swallow a rabbit whole. He played the octaves in the A-flat polonaise with infinite ease, but pianissimo. Now where is the tradition when confronted by the mighty crashing of Rosenthal in this particular part of the polonaise? Of Karl Tausig, Weizmann said that he relieved the romantically sentimental Chopin of his Weltschmerz and showed him in his pristine creative vigor and wealth of imagination. In Chopin's music there are many pianists, many styles, and all are correct if they are poetically musical, logical, and individually sincere. Of his rubato I treat in the chapter devoted to the mazurkas, making also an attempt to define the sal of his playing and music. When Chopin was strong he used a playel piano. When he was ill, an erard, a nice fable of Liszt's. He said that he liked the Erard, but he really preferred the Pleyel with its veiled sonority. What could not he have accomplished with the modern grand piano? In the artist's room of the Maison Pleyel, there stands the piano at which Chopin composed the Preludes, the G minor Nocturne, the Funeral March, the three supplementary Etudes, the A minor Mazurka, the Tarantelle, the F minor Fantasy, and the B minor Scherzo. A brass tablet on the inside lid notes this. The piano is still in good condition as regards tone and action. Mikuli asserted that Chopin brought out an immense tone in cantabiles. He had not a small tone, but it was not the orchestral tone of our day. Indeed, how could it be with the light action and tone of the French pianos built in the first half of the century? After all, it was quality not quantity that Chopin sought. Each one of his ten fingers was a delicately differentiated voice, and these ten voices could sing at times like the morning stars. Rubinstein declared that all the pedal marks are wrong in Chopin. I doubt if any addition can ever give them as they should be, for here again the individual equation comes into play. Apart from certain fundamental rules for managing the pedals, no pedagogic regulations should ever be made for the more refined nuanciren. The portraits of Chopin differ widely. There is the airy Scheffer, the Vigneron, praised by Matthias, the Bovi medallion, the Duval drawing, and the head by Kwiatowski. Delacroix tried his powerful hand at transfixing in oil the fleeting expressions of Chopin. Felix Barrias, Franz Winterhalter, and Albert Greffle are others who tried with more or less success. Anthony Kohlberg painted Chopin in 1848 to 49. Klesinski reproduces it. It is mature in expression. The Klesinger head I have seen at Père Lachaise. It is mediocre and lifeless. Kwiatowski has caught some of the Chopin spirit in the etching that may be found in Volume I of Niecks' biography. The Winterhalter portrait in Mr. Haddow's volume is too Hebraic, and the Greffel is a trifle ghastly. It is the dead Chopin, but the nose is that of a predaceous bird, painfully aquiline. The Echo Muczyzny Warsaw of October 1899 in Polish, 17 Pajernica, printed a picture of the composer at the age of 17. It is that of a thoughtful, poetic, but not handsome lad. 
his hair waving over a fine forehead, a feminine mouth, large aquiline nose, the nostrils delicately cut, and about his slender neck a Byronic collar. Altogether a novel likeness. Like the Chopin interpretation, a satisfactory Chopin portrait is extremely rare. As some difficulty was experienced in discovering the identity of Countess Delphine Potoka, I applied in 1899 to Mr. Jaroslav Desielinski, a pianist of Buffalo, New York, for assistance. He is an authority on Polish and Russian music and musicians. Here are the facts he kindly transmitted. In 1830, three beautiful Polish women came to Nice to pass the winter. They were the daughters of Count Komar, the business manager of the wealthy Count Potoki. They were singularly accomplished. They spoke half the languages of Europe, drew well, and sang to perfection. All they needed was money to make them queens of society. This they soon obtained, and with it high rank. Their graceful manners and loveliness won the hearts of three of the greatest of noblemen. Marie married the Prince de Beauvau Crown. Delphine became Countess Potoka, and Natalie Marchioness Medici Spada. The last name died young, a victim to the zeal in favor of the cholera-stricken of Rome. The other two sisters went to live in Paris and became famous for their brilliant elegance. Their sumptuous hotels or palaces were thrown open to the most prominent men of genius of their time, and hither came Chopin, to meet not only with the homage due to his genius, but with a tender and sisterly friendship which proved one of the greatest consolations of his life. To the amiable Princess de Beauvau, he dedicated his famous Polonaise in F-sharp minor, opus 44, written in the brilliant bravoure style for pianists of the first force. To Delphine, Countess Potoka, he dedicated the loveliest of his valses, opus 64, number 1, so well transcribed by Josephi into a study in thirds. Therefore the picture of the Grafin Potoka in the Berlin Gallery is not that of Chopin's devoted friend. Here is another Count Tarnowski story. It touches on a Potoka episode. Chopin liked and knew how to express individual characteristics on the piano, just as there formerly was a rather widely known fashion of describing dispositions and characters in so-called portraits, which gave to ready wits a scope for parading their knowledge of people and their sharpness of observation. So he often amused himself by playing such musical portraits. Without saying whom he had in his thoughts, he illustrated the characters of a few or of several people present in the room, and illustrated them so clearly and so delicately that the listeners could always guess correctly who was intended and admired the resemblance of the portrait. One little anecdote is related in connection with this, which throws some light on his wit, and a little pinch of sarcasm in it. During the time of Chopin's greatest brilliancy and popularity, in the year 1835, he once played his musical portraits in a certain Polish salon, where the three daughters of the house were the stars of the evening. After a few portraits had been extemporized, one of these ladies wished to have hers, Madame Delphine Potoka. Chopin, in reply, drew her shawl from her shoulders, threw it on the keyboard, and began to play, implying in this two things. First, that he knew the character of the brilliant and famous Queen of Fashion so well that by heart and in the dark he was able to depict it. Secondly, that this character and this soul is hidden under habits ornamentations, and decorations of an elegant worldly life, through the symbol of elegance and fashion of that day, as the tones of the piano through the shawl. Because Chopin did not label his works with any but general titles, ballads, scherzi, studies, preludes, and the like, his music sounds all the better. The listener is not pinned down to any precise mood, 
the music being allowed to work its particular charm without the aid of literary crutches for unimaginative minds. Dr. Niecks gives specimens of what the ingenious publisher, without a sense of humor, did with some of Chopin's compositions. Adieu à Varsovie, so was named the Rondo, Opus 1. Homage à Mozart, the Variations, Opus 2. La Gaité, Introduction and Polonaise, Opus 3, for piano and cello. La Posiana, what a name, the Rondo à la Masur, Opus 5. Murmurs de la Seine, Nocturnes, Opus 9. Les Zephyrs, Nocturnes, Opus 15. Invitation à la Valse, Valse, Opus 18. Souvenir d'Andalusie, Bolero, Opus 19, a bolero which sounds Polish. Le Banquet Infernal, the first scherzo, Opus 20, what a misnomer. Ballade on Wurt, the G minor ballad, there is a polyglot mess for you. Les Plantives, Nocturnes, Opus 27, La Meditation, second scherzo, B flat minor, meditation it is not. Il Lamento e la Consolazione, Nocturnes, Opus 32, Les Soupirs, Nocturnes, Opus 37, and Les Favorites, Polonaises, Opus 40. The C minor Polonaise of this opus was never, is not now, a favorite. The mazurkas generally received the title of Souvenir de la Pologne. In commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the death of Chopin, October 17, 1899, a medal was struck at Warsaw, bearing on one side an artistically executed profile of the Polish composer. On the reverse, the design represents a lyre surrounded by a laurel branch, and having engraved upon it the opening bars of the mazurka in A-flat major. The name of the great composer, with the dates of his birth and death, are given in the margin. Paderewski is heading a movement to remove from Paris to Warsaw the ashes of the pianist, but it is doubtful if it can be managed. Paris will certainly object to losing the bones of such a genius. Chopin's acoustic parallelisms are not so concrete, so vivid as Wagner's, nor are they so theatrical, so obvious. It does not, however, require much fancy to conjure up the drums and tramplings of three conquests in the Eroica Polonaise or the F-sharp major impromptu. The rhythms of the cradle song and the barcarolle are suggestive enough, and if you please there are dewdrops in his cadenzas, and there is the whistling of the wind in the last A minor study. Of the A-flat study Chopin said, Imagine a little shepherd who takes refuge in a peaceful grotto from an approaching storm. In the distance rushes the wind and the rain, while the shepherd gently plays a melody on his flute. This is quoted by Kleszynski. There are word whisperings in the next study in F minor, whilst the symbolism of the dance, the vals, mazurka, polonaise, menuetto, bolero, schottisch, krakowiak, and tarantella, is admirably indicated in all of them. The bells of the funeral march, the will-o'-wisp character of the last movement of the B flat minor sonata. The dainty butterfly study in G flat, opus 25, the aeolian murmurs of the E flat study in opus 10, the tiny prancing silvery hoofs in the F major study, opus 25, the flickering flame like C major study number 7, opus 10, the spinning in the D flat valse, and the cyclonic rush of chromatic double notes in the E flat minor scherzo. These are not studied imitations but spontaneous transpositions to the ideal plane of primary natural phenomena. Chopin's system, if it be a system, of cadenzas, fioriture embellishment, and ornamentation is perhaps traceable to the East. In his folk music studies, Mr. H. E. Krebiel quotes the description of a rhapsodical embellishment called a lop which, after going through a variety of ad libitum passages, 
rejoins the melody with as much grace as if it had never been disunited, the musical accompaniment all the while keeping time. These passages are not reckoned essential to the melody, but are considered only as grace notes introduced according to the fancy of the singer, when the only limitations by which the performer is bound are the notes peculiar to that particular melody and a strict regard to time. Chopin founded no school, although the possibilities of the piano were canalized by him. In playing, as in composition, only the broad trend of his discoveries may be followed, for his was a manner, not a method. He has had for followers Liszt, Rubinstein, Mikuli, Zaremsky, Nowakowski, Xaver Jarvenska, Sansin, Schultz, Heller, Mikode, Moritz Moschkowski, Paderewski, Stoyevsky, Arensky, Lechesitsky, the two Vienovskys, and a whole group of the younger Russians, Liadov, Skriabin, and the rest. Even Brahms, in his F-sharp major sonata and E-flat minor scherzo, shows Chopin's influence. Indeed, but for Chopin, much modern music would not exist. But a genuine school exists not. Henselt was only a German who fell asleep and dreamed of Chopin. To a Thalbergian euphony he has added a technical figuration not unlike Chopin's, and a spirit quite Teutonic in its sentimentality. Rubinstein calls Chopin the exhalation of the third epoch in art. He certainly closed one. With a less strong rhythmic impulse and formal sense, Chopin's music would have degenerated into mere over-perfumed impressionism. The French piano school of his day, indeed of today, is entirely drowned by its devotion to cold decoration, to unemotional ornamentation. Mannerisms he had, what great artist has not. But the Greek in him, as in Heine, kept him from formlessness. He is seldom a landscapist, but he can handle his brush deftly before nature if he must. He paints atmosphere, the open air at eventide, with consummate skill, and for playing fantastic tricks on your nerves in the depiction of the superhuman, he has a peculiar faculty. Remember that in Chopin's early days, the Byronic pose, the grandiose and the horrible prevailed. Witness the pictures of Ingres and Delacroix and Richter wrote with his heart-strings saturated in moonshine and tears. Chopin did not altogether escape the artistic vices of his generation. As a man, he was a bit of poseur, the little whisker grown on one side of his face, the side which he turned to his audience, is a note of foppery, but was ever a detester of the sham artistic. He was sincere, and his survival, when nearly all of Mendelssohn, much of Schumann, and half of Berlioz have suffered an eclipse, is proof positive of his vitality. The fruit of his experimentings in tonality we see in the whole latter-day school of piano, dramatic, and orchestral composers. That Chopin may lead to the development and adoption of the new enharmonic scales, the homotonic scales, I do not know. For these, M. A. de Bertha claimed the future of music. He wrote, Now vaporously illumined by the crepuscular light of a magical sky and the boundaries of the major and minor modes, now seeming to spring from the bowels of the earth with sepulchral inflections, melody moves with ease on the serried degrees of the enharmonic scales. Lively or slow, she always assumed in them the accents of a fatalist impossibility, for the laws of arithmetic have preceded her, and there still remains, as it were, an atmosphere of proud rigidity. Melancholy or passionate, she preserves the reflected lines of a primitive rusticity, which clings to the homotones in despite of their artificial origin. But all this will be in the days to come, when the flat keyboard will be superseded by a janko, many-banked clavier contrivance, when Mr. Krebiel's oriental srutis are in use, 
and Mr. Apthorpe's nullitonic order, no key at all, is invented. Then, too, a new Chopin may be born, but I doubt it. Despite his idiomatic treatment of the piano, it must be remembered that Chopin, under Sontag's and Paganini's influence, imitated both voice and violin on the keyboard. His lyricism is most human, while the portamento, the slides, trills, and indescribably subtle turns, are they not of the violin? Wagner said to Mr. Danruther, see Fink's Wagner and his works, that Mozart's music and Mozart's orchestra are a perfect match, an equally perfect balance exists between Palestrina's choir and Palestrina's counterpoint, and I find a similar correspondence between Chopin's piano and some of his etudes and preludes. I do not care for the lady Chopin. There is too much of the Parisian salon in that, but he has given us many things which are above the salon. Which latter statement is slightly condescending. Recollect, however, Chopin's calm depreciation of Schumann. Mr. John F. Runciman, the English critic, asserts that Chopin thought in terms of the piano and only the piano. So when we see Chopin's orchestral music or Wagner's music for the piano, we realize that neither is talking his native tongue, the tongue which nature fitted him to speak. Speaking of Chopin and the sick men, Mr. Runciman is most pertinent. These inheritors of rickets and exhausted physical frames made some of the most wonderful music of the century for us. Schubert was the most wonderful of them all, but Chopin runs him very close. He wrote less, far less than Schubert wrote. But for the quantity he did write, its finish is miraculous. It may be feverish, merely mournful, cadaver, or tranquil, and entirely beautiful but there is not a phrase that is not polished as far as a phrase will bear polishing. It is marvelous music, but all the same, it is sick, unhealthy music. Liszt's estimate of the technical importance of Chopin's works, writes Mr. W. J. Henderson, is not too large. It was Chopin who systematized the art of pedaling and showed us how to use both pedals in combination to produce those wonderful effects of color which are so necessary in the performance of his music. The harmonic schemes of the simplest of Chopin's works are marvels of originality and musical loveliness, and I make bold to say that his treatment of the passing note did much toward showing later writers how to produce the restless and endless complexity of the harmony in contemporaneous orchestral music. Heinrich Pudor, in his strictures on German music, is hardly complimentary to Chopin. Wagner is a thorough-going decadent, an offshoot, an epigonus, not a progonus. His cheeks are hollow and pale, but the Germans have the full red cheeks. Equally decadent is Liszt. Liszt is a Hungarian, and the Hungarians are confessedly a completely disorganized, self-outlived, dying people. No less decadent is Chopin, whose figure comes before one as flesh without bones. This morbid, womanly, womanish, slip-slop, powerless, sickly, bleached, sweet caramel pole. This has a ring of Nietzsche, Nietzsche who boasted of his Polish origin. Now listen to the fatidical pole Przybyszewski. In the beginning there was sex. Out of sex there was nothing, and in it everything was. And sex made itself brain, whence was the birth of the soul. And then, as Mr. Vance Thompson, who first Englished this mass of the dead, wrote, he pictures largely in great cosmic symbols, decorated with passionate and mystic fervors, the singular combat between the growing soul and the sex from which it fain would be free. Arno Holtz thus parodies Przybyszewski. In our soul there is surging and singing a song of the victorious bacteria. Our blood lacks the white corpuscles. On the sounding board of our consciousness there echoes along the frightful symphony of the flesh. It becomes objective in Chopin. He alone, the modern primeval man, 
puts our brains on the green meadows. He alone thinks in hyper-European dimensions. He alone rebuilds the shattered Jerusalem of our souls, all of which shows to what comically delirious lengths this sort of deleterious soul-probing may go. It would be well to consider this word decadent and its morbid implications. There is a fashion just now in criticism to over-accentuate the physical and moral weaknesses of the artist. Lombroso started the fashion, Nordau carried it to its logical absurdity, yet it is nothing new. In Hazlitt's day, he complains, that genius is called mad by foolish folk. Mr. Newman writes in his Wagner that art in general, and music in particular, ought not to be condemned merely in terms of the physical degeneration or abnormality of the artist. Some of the finest work in art and literature, indeed, has been produced by men who could not, from any standpoint, be pronounced normal. In the case of Flaubert, of de Maupassant, of Dostoevsky, of Poe, and a score of others, though the organic system was more or less flawed, the work remains touched with that universal quality that gives artistic permanence even to perceptions born of the abnormal. Mr. Newman might have added other names to his list, those of Michelangelo and Beethoven and Swinburne. Really, is any great genius quite sane, according to Philistine standards? The answer must be negative. The old enemy has merely changed his mode of attack. Instead of charging genius with madness, the abnormal used in an abnormal sense is lugged in, and though these imputations of degeneracy, moral and physical, have in some cases proven true, the genius of the accused one can in no wise be denied. But then, as Mr. Philip Hale asks, why this timidity at being called decadent? What's in the name? Havelock Ellis, in his masterly study of Joris Carl Huysmans, considers the much misunderstood phenomenon in art called decadence. Technically, a decadent style is only such in relation to a classic style. It is simply a further development of a classic style, a further specialization, the homogeneous in Spencerian phraseology having become heterogeneous. The first is beautiful because the parts are subordinated to the whole. The second is beautiful because the whole is subordinated to the parts. Then he proceeds to show in literature that Sir Thomas Brown, Emerson, Pater, Carlyle, Poe, Hawthorne, and Whitman are decadents, not in any invidious sense, but simply in the breaking up of the whole for the benefit of its parts. Nietzsche is quoted to the effect that in the period of corruption in the evolution of societies we are apt to overlook the fact that the energy which in more primitive times marked the operations of a community as a whole has now simply been transferred to the individuals themselves, and this aggrandizement of the individual really produces an even greater amount of energy. And further, Ellis. All art is the rising and falling of the slopes of a rhythmic curve between these two classic and decadent extremes. Decadence suggests to us going down, falling, decay. If we walk down a real hill, we do not feel that we commit a more wicked act than when we walked up it. Roman architecture is classic to become in its Byzantine developments completely decadent. And St. Mark's is the perfected type of decadence in art. We have to recognize that decadence is an aesthetic and not a moral conception. The power of words is great, but they need not befool us. We are not called upon to air our moral indignation over the base end of the musical clef. I recommend the entire chapter to such men as Lombroso Levi, Max Nordau, and Heinrich Pudor, who have yet to learn that all confusion of intellectual substances is foolish. Oscar By states the Chopin case most excellently. Chopin is a poet. It has become a very bad habit to place this poet in the hands of our youth. The concertos and polonaises being put aside, no one lends himself worse to youthful instruction than Chopin. 
because his delicate touches inevitably seem perverse to the youthful mind, he has gained the name of a morbid genius. The grown man who understands how to play Chopin, whose music begins where that of another leaves off, whose tones show the supremest mastery in the tongue of music, such a man will discover nothing morbid in him. Chopin, a Pole, strikes sorrowful chords which do not occur frequently to healthy normal persons. But why is a Pole to receive less justice than a German? We know that the extreme of culture is closely allied to decay, for perfect ripeness is but the foreboding of corruption. Children, of course, do not know this, and Chopin himself would have been much too noble ever to lay bare his mental sickness to the world. And his greatness lies precisely in this, that he preserves the mean between immaturity and decay. His greatness is his aristocracy. He stands among musicians in his faultless vesture, a noble from head to foot. The sublimest emotions toward whose refinement whole generations had tended, the last things in our soul, whose foreboding is interwoven with the mystery of judgment day, have in his music found their form. Further on I shall attempt, I write the word with a patibulary gesture, in a sort of Chopin variorum, to analyze the salient aspects, technical and aesthetic, of his music, to translate into prose, into any language, no matter how poetical, the images aroused by his music, is impossible. I am forced to employ the technical terminology of other arts, but against my judgment. Read Mr. W. F. Apthorpe's disheartening dictum in By the Way. The entrancing phantasmagoria of picture and incident which we think we see rising from the billowing sea of music is in reality nothing more than an enchanting fata morgana, visible at no other angle than that of our own eye. The true gist of music it never can be, it can never truly translate what is most essential and characteristic in its expression. It is but something that we have half unconsciously imputed to music, nothing that really exists in music. The shadowy miming of Chopin's soul has nevertheless a significance for this generation. It is now the reign of the brutal, the realistic, the impossible in music. Formal excellence is neglected, and program music has reduced art to the level of an anecdote. Chopin neither preaches nor paints, yet his art is decorative and dramatic, though in the climate of the ideal. He touches earth and its emotional issues in Poland only, otherwise his music is a pure aesthetic delight, an artistic enchantment freighted with no ethical or theatric messages. It is poetry made audible, the soul written in sound. All that I can faintly indicate is the way it affects me, this music with the petals of a glowing rose and the heart of grey ashes. Its analogies to Poe, Verlaine, Shelley, Keats, Heine, and Mickiewicz are but critical signposts, for Chopin is incomparable, Chopin is unique. Our interval, writes Walter Pater, is brief. Few pass it recollectedly and with full understanding of its larger rhythms and more urgent colors. Many endure it in frivol and violence, the majority in bored, sullen submission. Chopin, the new Chopin, is a foe to ennui and the spirit that denies. In his exquisite soul sorrow, sweet world pain, we may find rich, impersonal relief. End of chapter 4 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon Chapter 5 of Chopin, The Man and His Music this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie Vermolchem. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hanneker. 
Chapter 5 Poet and Psychologist Part 1 Music is an order of mystic sensuous mathematics, a sounding mirror, an oral mode of motion. It addresses itself on the formal side to the intellect. In its content of expression, it appeals to the emotions. Ribot, admirable psychologist, does not hesitate to proclaim music as the most emotional of the arts. It acts like a burn, like heat, cold or a caressing contact, and is a most dependent on psychological conditions. Music, then, the most vague of the arts in the matter of representing the concrete, is the swiftest, surest agent for attacking the sensibilities. The cry made manifest, as Wagner asserts, it is a cry that takes on fanciful shapes, each soul interpreting it in an individual fashion. Music and beauty are synonymous, just as their form and substance are indivisible. Havelock Ellis is not the only East Asian who sees the marriage of music and sex. No other art tells us such old forgotten secrets about ourselves. It is in the mightiest of all instincts, the primitive sex traditions of the race before man was, that music is rooted. Beauty is a child of love. Dante Gabriel Rossetti has imprisoned in a sonnet the almost intangible feeling aroused by music, the feeling of having pursued in the immemorial past the root of evanescence. Is it this guy's vast vault or ocean sound that is life's self and draws my life from me, and by instinct, ineffable decree, holds my breath quailing on the bitter bound? Nay, is it life or death, thus thunder-crowned, that midst the tide of all emergency, now notes my separate wave, and to what sea, its difficult eddies labour in the ground? O oh, what is this, that knows the road I came? The flame turned cloud, the cloud returned to flame, the lifted, shifted steeps and all the way, that draws around me at last this wind-warm space, and in regenerate rapture turns my face upon the devious covets of dismay. This azure psychology gives music its power, it steers straight for the soul through the cortical cells. During the last half of the nineteenth century, two men became rulers of musical emotion, Richard Wagner and Frédéric François Chopin. The music of the latter is the most ravishing gesture that art has yet made. Wagner and Chopin, the macrocosm and the microcosm. Wagner has made the largest impersonal synthesis attainable of the personal influences that thrill our lives cries Havelock Ellis. Chopin, a young man slight of frame, furiously playing out upon the keyboard his soul, the soul of his nation, the soul of his time, is the most individual composer that has ever sat humming the looms of our dreams. Wagner and Chopin have a motor element in their music that is fiercer, intenser, and more fugacious than that of all other composers. For them it is not the Buddhistic void, in which shapes slowly form and fade. Their psychical tempo is devouring. They voiced their age, they moulded their age, and we listen eagerly to them, to these vibrant prophetic voices so sweetly corrosive, bardic, and appealing. Chopin being nearer the soil in the selection of forms, his style and structure are more naive, more original than Wagner's, while his medium, less artificial, is easier filled than the vast empty frame of the theatre. Through their intensity of conception and of life, both men touch issues so widely dissimilar in all else. Chopin had greater melodic and as great harmonic genius as Wagner. He made more themes. He was, as Rubinstein wrote, 
the last of the original composers, but his scope was not scenic. He preferred the stage of his soul to the windy spaces of the music drama. His is the interior play, the eternal conflict between body and soul. He viewed music through his temperament, and it often becomes so imponderable, so bodiless, as to suggest a fourth dimension in the art. Space is obliterated. With Chopin, one does not get, as from Beethoven, the sense of spiritual vastness, of the overarching sublime. There is the pathos of spiritual distance, but it is pathos, not sublimity. His soul was a star and dwelt apart, so not in the Miltonic or Wordsworthian sense. A shelly like tenuity at times wings his thought, and he is a creator of a new thrill within the thrill. The charm of the dying fall, the unspeakable cadence of regret for the love that is dead, is in his music. Like John Keats, he sometimes sees charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Chopin, subtle souled psychologist, is more kin to Keats than Shelley. He is a greater artist than a thinker. His philosophy is of the beautiful, as was Keats. And while he lingers by the river's edge to catch the song of the reeds, and his gaze is often affixed on the choiring planets, he is nature's most exquisite sounding board, and vibrates to her with intensity, colour and vivacity that have no parallel. Stained with melancholy, his joy is never that of the strong man rejoicing in his muscles. Yet his very tenderness is tonic, and his cry is ever restrained by an attic sense of proportion. Like Alfred de Vigny, he dwelt in a tour d'ivoire that faced to the west, and for him the sunrise was not. But, oh, the miraculous moons he discovered, the sunsets and cloud shine. His notes cast great rich shadows, these chains of blown roses drenched in the dew of beauty. Pompeian colours are too restricted and flat. He divulges a world of half-tones, some enfolding sunny spots of greenery, or singing in silvery shade the song of chromatic ecstasy, others huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail, and black upon black. Chopin is a colour genius of the piano. His eye was attuned to hues the most fragile and attenuated. He can weave harmonies that are as ghostly as a lunar rainbow, and lunar-like in their libration are some of his melodies, glimpses, mysterious and vast, as of a strange world. His utterances are always dynamic, and he emerges betimes as if from Goya's tomb, and etches with sardonic finger nader and dust. But this spirit of denial is not an abiding mood. Chopin throws a net of tone over souls wearied with rancours and revolts, bridges salty strange seas of misery, and presently we are viewing a mirrored, a fabulous universe wherein death is dead, and love reigns lord of all. Part two. N said that every epoch is a sphinx which plunges into the abyss as soon as its problem is solved. Born in the very upheaval of the romantic revolution, a revolution evoked by the intensity of its emotion, rather than by the power of its ideas, Chopin was not altogether one of the insurgents of art. Just when his individual soul germinated, who may tell? In his early music are discovered the roots and fibres of Hummel and Field. His growth, involuntary, inevitable, put forth strange sprouts, and he saw in the piano an instrument of two dimensions, a third, and so his music deepened and took on stranger colours. The keyboard had never sung so before. He forged his formula. A new apocalyptic seal of melody and harmony 
was let fall upon it. Sounding scrolls, delicious arabesques, gorgeous in tint, martial, lyric, a resonance of emerald, a sobbing of fountains, as that Chopin of the gutter, Paul Verlaine has it, the tear crystallized midway, an arrested pearl where overheard in his music, and Europe felt a new shudder of sheer delight. The literary quality is absent, and so is the ethical. Chopin may prophesy, but he never flames into the diverse tongues of the upper heaven. Compared with his passionate abandonment to the dance, Brahms is a loud sea of music, the great infant born with grey hair and with the slow smile of childhood. Chopin seldom smiles, and while some of his music is young, he does not raise in the mind pictures of the fatuous romance of youth. His passion is mature, self-sustained, and never at a loss for the mot propre. And with what marvellous vibration he gamuts the passions, festooning them with carnations and great white tuberoses, but the dark dramatic motive is never lost in the decorative wiles of this magician. As the man grew, he laid aside his pretty garlands, and his line became sterner, its traceries more gothic. He made Bach his chief god, and within the woven walls of his strange harmonies he sings the history of a soul, a soul convulsed by antique madness, by the memory of awful things, a soul lured by beauty to secret glades wherein sacrifice and rites are performed to the solemn sound of unearthly music. Like Maurice de Guérin, Chopin perpetually strove to decipher beauty's enigma, and passionately demanded of the Sphinx that defies. Upon the shores of what oceans have they rolled the stones that hides them, O Macaraves? His name was as a stroke of a bell to the romancists. He remained aloof from them, though in a sympathetic attitude. The classic is but a romantic dead said an acute critic. Chopin was a classic without knowing it. He compassed for the dancers of his land what Bach did for the older forms. With N he led the spirit of revolt, that enclosed his note of agitation in a frame beautiful. The colour, the lies perpetual escape from the formal, deceived his critics, Schumann among the rest. Chopin like Flaubert, was the last of the idealists, the first of the realists. The newness of his form, his linear counterpoint, misled the critics, who accused him of the lack of it. Schumann's formal deficiency detracts from much of his music, and because of their formal genius, Wagner and Chopin will live. To Chopin might be addressed some Medodak Beladan's words. When your hand writes a perfect line, the cherubim descend to find pleasure therein as in a mirror. Chopin wrote many perfect lines. He is, above all, the faultless lyrist, the Swinburne, the master of fiery, many rhythms, the chanter of songs before sunrise, of the burden of the flesh, the sting of desire and large moulded lace of passionate freedom. His music is, to quote Thoreau, a proud, sweet satire on the meanness of our life. He had no feeling for the epic. His genius was too concentrated, and though he could be furiously dramatic, the sustained majesty of blank verse was denied him. With musical ideas he was ever gravid, with their intensity as parent to their brevity, and it must not be forgotten that with Chopin the form was conditioned by the idea. He took up the dancing patterns of Poland, because they suited his vivid inner life. He transformed them, idealized them, attaining to more prolonged phraseology and denser architecture in his ballads and scherzi. But these spirits are passionate, never philosophical. All artists are androgynous. In Chopin the feminine often prevails, but it must be noted that this quality is a distinguishing sign of masculine lyric genius, for when he unbends, coquettes and make graceful confessions, or whimpers in lyric loveliness at fate, 
Then his mother's sex peeps out, a picture of the capricious, beautiful, tyrannical Polish woman. When he stiffens his soul, when Russia gets into his nostrils, then the smoke and flame of his Polonaise, the tantalizing despair of his mazurkas are testimony to the strong man's soul in rebellion. But it is often a physical masquerade, the sag of melancholy is soon felt, and the old Chopin, the subjective Chopin, wails afresh in melodic moodiness. That he could attempt far flights, one may see in his B-flat minor sonata, in his scherzi, in several of the ballades, above all in the F minor fantasie. In this great work, the technical invention keeps pace with the inspiration. It coheres, there is not a flaw in the reverberating marble, not a rift in the idea. If Chopin, diseased to death's door, could erect such a palace of dreams, what might not he have dared had he been healthy? But forth from his misery came sweetness and strength, like honey from the lion. He grew amazingly the last ten years of his existence, grew with a promise that recalls Keats, Shelley, Mozart, Schubert, and the rest of the early slaughtered angelic crew. His flame-like spirit waxed and waned in the gusty surprises of a disappointed life. To the earth for consolation he bent his ear, and called to echoes of the cosmic comedy, the far-off laughter of the hills, the lament of the sea, and the muttering of its depths. These things, with tales of sombre cloud and shining skies, and whisperings of strange creatures dancing timidly in pavonine twilights, he traced upon the ivory keys of his instrument, and the world was richer for a poet. Chopin is not only the poet of the piano, he is also the poet of music, the most poetic of composers. Compared with him, Bach seems to make of solid polyphonic prose, Beethoven, a scooper of stars, a master of growling storms, Mozart, a weaver of gay tapestries, Schumann, a divine stammerer. Schubert alone of all the composers resembles him in his lyric prodigality. Both were masters of melody, but Chopin was a master workman of the two, and polished after bending and beating, his theme fresh from the fire of his forge. He knew that to complete his wailing Iliads, the strong hand of the reviser was necessary, and he also realized that nothing is more difficult for the genius than to retain his gift. Of all natures, the most prone to pessimism, procrastination, and vanity, the artist is most apt to become ennued. It is not easy to flame always at the focus, to burn fiercely with the central fire. Chopin knew this, and cultivated his ego. He saw, too, that the love of beauty, for beauty's sake, was fascinating, but led to the way called madness. So he rooted his art, gave it the earth of Poland, and its deliquescence is put off to the day when a new system of musical aestheticism will have rooted the old, when the ugly shall be king, and melody the handmaiden of science. But until that most grievous and undesired time, he will catch the music of our souls, and give it cry and flesh. Part 3 Chopin is the open door in music. Besides having been a poet, and giving vibratory expression to the concrete, he was something else. He was a pioneer, pioneer, because in youth he had bowed to the tyranny of the diatonic scale, and savoured the illicit joys of the chromatic. It is briefly curious that Chopin is regarded purely as a poet among musicians, and not as a practical musician. They will swear him a phenomenal virtuoso, but your musician, orchestral, and theoretical, raises the eyebrow of the supercilious if Chopin is called creative. A cunning fingersmith, a moulder of decorative patterns, a master at making new figures, 
all this is granted. But speak of Chopin's path-breaker in the harmonic forest, that true forest of numbers, as the forger of melodic metal, the sweetest, purest in temper, and, lo, you are regarded as one mentally askew. Chopin invented many new harmonic devices. He untied the cord that was restrained within the octave, leading it into the dangerous but delectable land of extended harmonies, and how he chromatized the prudish, rigid garden of German harmony, how he moistened it with the flashing, changeful waters until it grew bold and brilliant with promise. A French theorist, Albert Lavignac, called Chopin a product of the German Romantic school. This is hitching the star to the wagon. Chopin influenced Schumann. It can be proven a hundred times, and Schumann understood Chopin, else he could not have written the Chopin of the Carnaval, which quite out Chopin's Chopin. Chopin is a musical soul of Poland. He incarnates its political passion. First a Slav, by adopting a Parisian, he is open door, because he admitted into the West Eastern musical ideas, Eastern tonalities, rhythms, in fine, the Slavic, all that is objectionable, decadent, and dangerous. He inducted Europe into the mysteries and seductions of the Orient. His music lies wavering between the East and the West. A neurotic man, his tissues trembling, his sensibilities aflame, the offspring of a nation doomed to pain and partition. It was quite natural for him to go to France. Poland had ever been her historical client, the France that overheated all Europe. Chopin, born after two revolutions, the true child of insurrection, chose Paris for his second home. Revolt sat easily upon his inherited aristocratic instincts. No proletarian is quite so thorough a revolutionist as a born aristocrat, witness Nietzsche, and Chopin, in the bloodless battle of the Romantics, in the silent warring of Slav against Teuton, Gaul and Anglo-Saxon, will ever stand as protagonist of the artistic drama. All that followed, the breaking up of the old hard and fast boundaries on the musical map, is due to Chopin. A pioneer, he has been rewarded as such by a polite ignorement or bland condescension. He smashed the portals of the convention that forbade a man bearing his sword to the multitude. The psychology of music is the gainer thereby. Chopin, like Velasquez, could paint single figures perfectly, but to great masked effects he was a stranger. Wagner did not fail to profit by his marvellously drawn soul portraits. Chopin taught his century the pages of patriotism, and showed Grieg the value of a national awe. He practically recreated the harmonic charts. He gave voice to the individual, himself a product of a nation dissolved by overwrought individualism. As Schumann assures us, his is the proudest and most poetic spirit of his time. Chopin, subdued by his familiar demon, was a true specimen of Nietzsche's Übermensch, which is but Emerson's oversaw shorn of her wings. Chopin's transcendental scheme of techniques is the image of a supernormal lift in composition. He sometimes robs music of its corporeal vesture, and his transcendentalism lies not alone in his striving after strange tonalities and rhythms, but in seeking the emotionally recondite. Self-tormented, ever a dweller on the threshold, he saw visions that outshone the glories of hashish, and his nerve-swept soul ground in its mills exceeding fine music. His vision is of beauty. He persistently groped at the hem of her robe, but never sought to transpose or to tone the commonplace of life. For this he reproved Schubert. Such intensity cannot be purchased, but at the cost of breath, of sanity. And his picture of life is not so high, wide, sublime, or awful as Beethoven's. 
yet it is just as inevitable, sincere, and as tragically poignant. Stanislav Przybyszewski, in his Tour Psychologie des Individuums, approaches the morbid Chopin, the Chopin who threw open to the world the East, who waved his chromatic wand to Liszt, Tchaikovsky, Saint-Saëns, Goldmark, Rubinstein, Richard Strauss, Dvorak, and all Russia with his consonantal composers. This Polish psychologist, a fulgurant expounder of Nietzsche, finds in Chopin faith and mania, the true stigma of the mad individualist, the individual who, in the first instance, is moved but an oxidation apparatus. Nietzsche and Chopin are the most outspoken individualities of the age. He forgets Wagner. Chopin himself the finest flowering of a morbid and rare culture. His music is a series of psychoses. He has the Sehnsucht of a marvellously constituted nature, and the shrill dissonance of his nerves, as seen in the psychological outbursts of the B-minor scherzo, is the acne of a tortured soul. The piece is Chopin's Iliad, in it are the ghosts, that lurk near the hidden alleys of the soul, but here come out to leer and exult. Orla, the Orla of Guy de Maupassant, the sinister doppelganger of mankind, which races with him to the goal of eternity, perhaps to outstrip and master him in the next evolutionary cycle, master as does man the brute creation. This Orla, according to Fritsch Bichewski, conquered Chopin and became vocal in his music. This Orla has mastered Nietzsche, who, quite mad, gave the world that Bible of the Übermensch, the dancing lyric prose poem, also sprach Zarathustra. Nietzsche's discipline is half right. Chopin's moods are often morbid, his music often pathological. Beethoven, too, is morbid, but in his kingdom, so vast, so varied, the mood is lost or lightly felt, while in Chopin's province it looms a maleficent upas tree, with flowers of evil, and its leaves glistering with essentiousness. But so keen for symmetry, for all the term formal beauty implies, is Chopin, that seldom does his morbidity madden, his voluptuousness poison. His music has its morris, but also its upland, where the gale blows strong and true. Perhaps all art is, as the incorrigible Norda declares, a slight deviation from the normal, so Ribot scoffs at the existence of any standard of normality. The butcher and the candlestick maker have their orla, their secret soul convulsions, which they set down to taxation, the vapours or weather. Chopin has surprised the musical melody of the century. He is its chief spokesman. After the vague, mad, noble dreams of Byron, Shelley, and Napoleon, the awakening found those disillusioned souls, Wagner, Nietzsche, and Chopin. Wagner sought in the epical rehabilitation of a vanished Valhalla a surcease from the world pain. He consciously selected his anodyne, and in the Meister Singer touched a consoling earth. Chopin and Nietzsche, temperamentally finer and more sensitive than Wagner, the one musical, the other intellectually, sang themselves in music and philosophy, because they were so constituted. Their nerves rode them to their death. Neither found the serenity and repose of Wagner, for neither was as sane, and both suffered mortally from hyperesthesia, the penalty of all sick genius. Chopin's music is the aesthetic symbol of a personality nurtured on patriotism, pride, and love. That it is better expressed by the piano is because of that instrument's idiosyncrasies of evanescent tone, sensitive touch, and wide range in dynamics. It was Chopin's lyre, the orchestra of his heart. From it he exhorted music the most intimate since Sappho. Among lyric moderns, N closely resembles the pole. Both sang because they suffered. 
sang ineffable and ironic melodies. Both will endure, because of their brave sincerity, their surpassing art. The musical, the psychical history of the nineteenth century, would be incomplete without the name of Frédéric François Chopin. Wagner externalized its dramatic soul. In Chopin, the mad lyricism of the time spirit is made eloquent. Into his music modulated the poesy of his age. He is one of its heroes, a hero of whom Swinburne might have sung. O strong-winged soul was prophetic, lips hot with the blood-beads of song, with the tremor of hard strings magnetic, with thoughts asunder in throng, with consonant ardor of chords that pierce men's souls as with swords, and hail them hearing along. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six, Part One of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Andrus. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hunnaker. Part Two, His Music. Chapter Six, Part One. THE STUDIES TITANIC EXPERIMENTS October 20, 1829, Frederick Chopin, aged twenty, wrote to his friend Titus Wojciechowski from Warsaw, I have composed a study in my own manner, and November 14, the same year, I have written some studies, in your presence I would play them well. Thus, quite simply, and without booming of cannon or brazen proclamation by bell, did the great Polish composer announce an event of supreme interest and importance to the piano-playing world. Niecks thinks these studies were published in the summer of 1833, July or August, and were numbered Opus 10. Another set of studies, Opus 25, did not find a publisher, until 1837, although some of them were composed at the same time as the previous work. A Polish musician, who visited the French capital in 1834, heard Chopin play the studies contained in Opus 25. The C minor study, Opus 10, number 12, commonly known as the Revolutionary, was born at Stuttgart, September 1831, while under the excitement caused by the news of the taking of Warsaw by the Russians on September 8, 1831. These dates are given so as to rout effectually any dilatory suspicion that Liszt influenced Chopin in the production of his masterpieces. Lena Roman, in her exhaustive biography of Franz Liszt, openly declares that numbers 9 and 12 of Opus 10 and numbers 11 and 12 of Opus 25, reveal the influence of the Hungarian virtuoso. Figures prove the fallacy of her assertion. The influence was the other way, as Liszt's three concert studies show, not to mention other compositions. When Chopin arrived in Paris, his style had been formed. He was the creator of a new piano technique. The three studies, known as the Trois Nouvelles Etudes, which appeared in 1840 in Moschel's and Fetis' Method of Methods, were published separately afterward. Their date of composition we do not know. Many are the editions of Chopin's studies, but after going over the ground, one finds only about a dozen worthy of study and consultation. Karasowski gives the date of the first complete edition of the Chopin works as 1846, with Gebetner and Wolff, Warsaw, as publishers. Then, according to Niecks, following Tellefsen, Klindworth, Boughton Bach, Schultz, Peters, Breitkopf and Hartl, Mikuli, Schilbert, Kant, Steingraber, 
better known as Mertges, and Schlesinger, edited by the great pedagogue Theodore Kulak. Xaver Schwerenka has edited Klindworth for the London edition of Augener and Co. Macaulay criticized the Tellefsen edition, yet both men had been Chopin pupils. This is a significant fact and shows that little reliance can be placed on the brave talk about tradition. Yet Macaulay had the assistance of a half dozen of Chopin's favorite pupils, and in addition Ferdinand Hiller. Hermann Stolz, who edited the works for Peters, based his results on careful inspection of original French, German, and English editions, besides consulting M. Georges Mathias, a pupil of Chopin. If Fontana, Wolfe, Gutmann, Macaulay, and Tellefsen, who copied from the original Chopin manuscripts under the supervision of the composer, cannot agree, then upon what foundation are reared the structures of the modern critical editions? The early French, German, and Polish editions are faulty, indeed useless, because of misprints and errata of all kinds. Every succeeding edition has cleared away some of these errors, but only in Karl Klindworth has Chopin found a worthy, though not faultless, editor. His edition is a work of genius, and was called by von Bülow the only model edition. In a few sections, others, such as Kulak, Dr. Hugo Riemann, and Hans von Bülow, may have outstripped him. But as a whole, his editing is amazing for its exactitude, scholarship, fertility in novel fingerings, and sympathetic insight in phrasing. This edition appeared at Moscow from 1873 to 1876. The twenty-seven studies of Chopin have been separately edited by Riemann and von Bülow. Let us narrow our investigations and critical comparisons to Klindworth, von Bülow, Kulek, and Riemann. Karl Reinecke's edition of the studies in Breitkopf and Hartel's collection offers nothing new, neither do Mertke, Schultz, and Mikuli. The latter one should keep at hand because the possible freedom from impurities in his text, but of phrasing or fingering he contributes little. It must be remembered that, with the studies, while they completely exhibit the entire range of Chopin's genius, the play's the thing, after all. The poetry, the passion of the ballads, and Scherzi wind throughout these technical problems like a flaming scheme. With the modern avidity for exterior as well as interior analysis, Macaulay, Reinecke, Mertke, and Schultz evidence little sympathy. It is then from the masterly editing of Kulak, von Bülow, Raymond, and Klendworth that I shall draw copiously. They have, in their various ways, given us a clue to their musical individuality, as well as their precise scholarship. Klindworth is the most genially intellectual, von Bülow the most pedagogic, and Kulak is poetic. While Riemann is scholarly, the latter gives more attention to phrasing than to fingering. The Chopin studies are poems fit for Parnassus, yet they also serve a very useful purpose in pedagogy. Both aspects, the material and the spiritual, should be studied and with four such guides the student need not go astray. In the first study of the first book, Opus 10, dedicated to Liszt, Chopin, at a leap, reached new land. Extended chords had been sparingly used by Hummel and Clemente, but to take a dispersed harmony and transform it into an epical study to raise the chord of the tenth to heroic stature, that could have been accomplished by Chopin only, and this first study in C is heroic. Theodore Kulak writes of it, Above a ground bass, proudly and boldly striding along, flow mighty waves of sound. The etude, whose technical end is the rapid execution of widely extended chord figurations, exceeding the span of an octave, is to be played on the basis of forte throughout. With sharply dissonant harmonies, the forte is to be increased to fortissimo, diminishing again with consonant ones. 
pithy accents. Their effect is enhanced when combined with an elastic recoil of the hand. The irregular, black, ascending and descending staircases of notes strike the neophyte with terror. Like Piranesi's marvellous aerial architectural dreams, these dizzy acclivities and descents of Chopin exercise a charm, hypnotic if you will, for eye as well as ear. Here is the new technique in all its nakedness, new in the sense of figure, design, pattern, web, new in a harmonic way. The old order was horrified at the modulatory harshness, the young sprigs of the new fascinated and a little frightened. A man who could explode a mine that assailed the stars must be reckoned with. The nub of modern piano music is in the study the most formally reckless Chopin ever penned. Kulak gives Chopin's favorite metronome sign, 176 to the quarter, but this editor rightly believes that the majestic grandeur is impaired and suggests 152 instead. The gain is at once apparent. Indeed, Kulak, a man of moderate pulse, is quite right in his strictures on the Chopin tempi, tempi that sprang from expressively light mechanism of the prevailing pianos of Chopin's day. Von Bülow declares that the requisite suppleness of the hand in gradual extension and rapid contraction will be most quickly attained if the player does not disdain, first of all, to impress on the individual fingers the chord which is the foundation of each arpeggio, a sound pedagogic point. He also inveighs against the disposition to play the octave bass arpeggio. In fact, those basses are the argument of the play. They must be granitic, ponderable, and powerful. The same authority calls attention to a misprint C, which he makes B flat, the last note treble in the twenty-ninth bar. Von Bülow gives the Chopin metronomic marking. It remained for Riemann to make some radical changes. This learned and worthy doctor astonished the musical world a few years by his new marks of phrasing in the Beethoven symphonies. They topsy-turvied the old bowing. With Chopin, new dynamic and agogic accents are rather dangerous, at least to the peace of mind of worshippers of the Chopin fetish. Riemann breaks two bars into one. It is a finished period for him and by detaching several of the sixteenths in the first group, the first and fourth, he makes the accent clearer, at least to the eye. He indicates a la breve with eighty-eight to the half. In latter studies, examples will be given of this phrasing, a phrasing that becomes a mannerism with the editor. He offers no startling finger changes. The value of his criticism throughout the volume seems to be in the phrasing, and this by no means conforms to accepted notions of how Chopin should be interpreted. I intend quoting more freely from Riemann than from the others, but not for the reason that I consider him as cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night in the desirable land of the Chopin fitudes. Rather, because his piercing analysis lays bare the very roots of these shining examples of piano literature, Clindworth contents himself with a straightforward version of the C major study, his fingering being the clearest and most admirable. The Mikuli addition makes one addition. It is a line which binds the last note of the first group to the first of the second. The device is useful and occurs only on the upward flights of the arpeggio. This study suggests that its composer wished to begin the exposition of his wonderful technical system with a skeletonized statement. It is the tree stripped of its bark, the flower of its leaves, yet, austere as is the result, there is compensating power, dignity, and unswerving logic. This study is the key with which Chopin unlocked not his heart, but the kingdom of technique. It should be played for variety unisono, with both hands, omitting, of course, the octave bass. Vian Bulo writes cannily enough that the second study in A minor 
being chromatically related to Moschel's Etude, Opus 70, Number 3, that piece should prepare the way for Chopin's more musical composition. In different degrees of tempo, strength and rhythmic accent, it should be practiced, omitting the thumb and first finger. Mikuli's metronome is 144 to the quarter, von Bülow's 114, Klindworth's the same as Mikuli, and Riemann is 72 to the half, with an a la breve. The fingering in three of these authorities is almost identical. Riemann has ideas of his own, both in the phrasing and figuration. Look at these first two bars. Von Bülow orders the middle harmonies to be played throughout distinctly and yet transiently. In German, Fluchtung. In fact, the entire composition, with its murmuring, meandering, chromatic character, is a forerunner to the whispering, weaving, moonlit effects in some of his later studies. The technical purpose is clear, but not obtrusive. It is intended for the fourth and fifth finger of the right hand, but given in unison with both hands, it becomes a veritable but laudable torture for the thumb of the left. With the repeat of the first bar at thirty-six, von Bülow gives a variation in fingering. Kulak's method of fingering is this. Everywhere that two white keys occur in succession, the fifth finger is to be used for C and F in the right hand, and for F and E in the left. He has also something to say about holding the hand sideways, so that the back of the hand and arm form an angle. This question of hand position, particularly in Chopin, is largely a matter of individual formation. No two hands are alike. No two pianists use the same muscular movements. Play along the easiest line of resistance. We now have reached a study, the third, in which the more intimately known Chopin reveals himself. This one in E is among the finest flowering of the composer's choice garden. It is simpler, less morbid, sultry and languorous, therefore saner, than the much bepraised study in C sharp minor, number seven, opus twenty five. Niecks writes that this study may be counted among Chopin's loveliest compositions. It combines classical chasteness of contour with the fragrance of romanticism. Chopin told his faithful Gutmann that he had never in his life written another such melody, and once when hearing it raised his arms aloft and cried out, Oh, ma patre! I cannot vouch for the sincerity of Chopin's utterance, for, as Runciman writes, they were a very Byronic set, these young men, and they took themselves with ludicrous seriousness. Von Bülow calls it a study in expression, which is obvious, and thinks it should be studied in company with number six in e flat minor this reason is not patent emotions should not be hunted in couples and the very object of the collection variety in mood as well as mechanism is thus defeated but von bulow was ever an ardent classifier perhaps he had his soul compartmentized he also attempts to regulate the rubato this is the first of the studies wherein the rubato's rights must be acknowledged. The bars are even mentioned, 32, 33, 36, and 37, where tempo license may be indulged. But here is the case which innate taste and feeling must guide. You can no more teach a real Chopin rubato, not the mawkish imitation, than you can make a donkey comprehend Kant. The metronome is the same in all editions. 100 to the eighth. Kulek rightly calls this lovely study Ein Wunderschons Poetisches Tonstruck, more in the nocturne than the study style. He gives in the bravura like cadenza an alternate for small hands, but small hands should not touch this piece unless they can grapple the double sixths with ease. Klindworth fingers the study with great care. The figuration in three of the editions is the same. 
Mikulai separating the voices distinctly. Ryman exercises all his ingenuity to make the beginning clear to the eye. What a joy is the next study, number four! How well Chopin knew the value of contrast in tonality and sentiment! A veritable classic is this piece, which, despite its dark key color, C-sharp minor as a foil to the preceding one in E, bubbles with life and spurts flame. It reminds one of the story of the Polish peasants, who are happiest when they sing in the minor mode. Kulak calls this a bravura study for velocity and lightness in both hands, accentuation fiery, while von Bülow believes that the irresistible interest inspired by the spirited content of this truly classical and model piece of music may become a stumbling block in attempting to conquer the technical difficulties. Hardly. The techniques of this composition do not lie beneath the surface. They are very much in the way of clumsy fingers and heavy wrists. Presto 88 to the half is the metronome indication in all five editions. Clindworth does not comment, but I like his fingering and phrasing best of all. Ryman repeats his trick of breaking a group, detaching a note for emphasis, although he is careful to retain the legato bow. One wonders why this study does not figure more frequently on programs of piano recitals. It is a fine, healthy technical test. It is brilliant, and the coda is very dramatic. Ten bars before the return of the theme, there is a stiff digital hedge for the student. A veritable lance of tone is this study, if justly poised. Ryman has his own ideas of the phrasing of the following one, the fifth and familiar, black key etude. Examine the first bar. Von Bülow would have grown jealous if he had seen this rather fantastic phrasing. It is a trifle too financial though it must be confessed, looks pretty. I like longer-breathed phrasing. The student may profit by this analysis. The piece is, indeed, as Kulak says, full of Polish elegance. Von Bülow speaks rather disdainfully of it as a Damon Salon etude. It is certainly graceful, delicately witty, a trifle naughty, arch and rugish, and it is delightfully invented. Technically, it requires smooth, velvet-tipped fingers and a supple wrist. In the fourth bar, third group, third note of group, Clindworth and Ryman print E-flat instead of D-flat. Mikulai, Kulik, and Von Bülow use the D-flat. Now, which is right? The D-flat is preferable. There are already two E-flats in the bar. The change is an agreeable one. Josephi has made a concert variation for this study. The metronome of the original is given at one sixteen to the quarter. A dark, doleful nocturne is number six in E flat minor. Nax praises it in company with the preceding one in E. It is beautiful, if music so sad may be called beautiful, and the melody is full of stifled sorrow. The study figure is ingenuous but subordinated to the theme. In the E major section, the piece broadens to dramatic vigor. Chopin was not yet the slave of his mood. There must be a psychical program to this study, some record of a youthful disillusion, but the expression of it is kept well within chaste lines. The Sarmatian composer had not yet unlearned the value of reserve. The Clindworth reading of this troubled poem is the best, though Kulak used Chopin's autographic copy. There is no metronomic sign in this autograph. Tellefsen gives 69 to the quarter, Clindworth 60, Ryman 69, Mikulai the same, Von Bülow and Kulak 60. Kulak also gives several variant from the text adding an A-flat to the last group in bar two. Ryman and the others make the same addition. The note must have been accidentally omitted from the Chopin autograph. Two bars will illustrate what Ryman can accomplish when he makes up his mind to be explicit, leaving little to the imagination. 
A luscious touch and a sympathetic soul is needed for this nocturne study. We emerge into a clearer, more bracing atmosphere in the C major study, number seven. It is a genuine toccata, with moments of tender twilight, serving a distinct technical purpose, the study of double notes and changing on one key, and is as healthy as the toccata by Robert Schumann. Here is a brave, an undaunted Chopin, a gay cavalier, with the sunshine shimmering about him. There are times when the study seems like light dripping through the trees of a mysterious forest. With the delicato there are pluck-like rustlings, and all the while the pianist, without imagination, is exercising wrist and fingers in a technical exercise. Wherever beauty and duty so mated in double harness, Pegasus pulling a cloud charged with rain over an arid country. For study, playing the entire composition with a wrist stroke is advisable. It will secure clear articulation, staccato and finger memory. Von Bulow phrases the study in groups of two, Kulak and Sixes, Clindworth and Mikuli the same, while Ryman in alternate twos, fours and sixes. One sees his logic rather than hears it. Von Bülow plastically reproduces the flitting, elusive character of the study far better than the others. It is quite like him to suggest to the panting and ambitious pupil that the performance in F sharp major, with the same fingering as the next study in F, number eight, would be beneficial. It certainly would. By the same token, the playing of the F minor sonata, the Appassionata of Beethoven, in the key of F sharp minor, might produce good results. This was another crotchet of Wagner's friend, and probably was born of the story that Beethoven transposed the Bach fugues in all keys. The same is said of St. Sands. In his notes to the F major study, Theodore Kulak expiates at length upon his favorite idea that Chopin must not be played according to his metronomic markings. The original autograph gives 96 to the half, the Tellefsen edition 88, Clindworth 80, Von Bülow 89, Mikulay 88, and Ryman the same. Kulak takes the slower tempo of Clindworth, believing that the old Hertz and Cyrene ideals of velocity are vanquished, that the shallow dip of the keys in Chopin's day had much to do with the swiftness and lightness of his playing. The noble, more sonorous tone of a modern piano requires greater breadth of style and less speedy passage work. There can be no doubt as to the wisdom of a broader treatment of this charming display piece. How it makes the piano sound! What a rich, brilliant sweep it secures! It elbows the treble to its last euphonious point, glitters and crusts itself, only to fall away as if the sea were melodic and could shatter and tumble into tuneful foam. The emotional content is not marked. The piece is for the fashionable salon or the concert hall. One catches at its close the overtones of bustling plaudits and the clapping of gloved palms. Ductility, an aristocratic ease, a delicate touch and fluent technique, will carry off this study with good effect. Technically, it is useful. One must speak of the usefulness of Chopin, even in these imprisoned, iridescent soap-bubbles of his. On the fourth line and in the first bar of the Kulak version, there is a chord of the dominant seventh in dispersed position that does not occur in any other edition. Yet it must be Chopin or one of his disciples, for this autograph is in the Royal Library at Berlin. Kulak thinks it ought to be omitted. Moreover, he slights an E-flat that occurs in all the other editions situated in the fourth group of the twentieth bar from the end. The F minor study, number nine, is the first one of these tone studies of Chopin in which the mood is more petulant than tempestuous. The melody is morbid, almost irritating, and yet not without certain accents of grandeur. There is a persistency in repetition that foreshadows the Chopin of the latter, sadder years. 
the figure in the left hand is the first in which a prominent part is given to that member not as noble and sonorous a figure as the one in c minor study it is a distant forerunner of the bass of the d minor prelude in this f minor study the stretch is the technical object it is rather awkward for close-knit fingers the best fingering is von bulow's it is five three one four one three for the first figure all the other editions except ryman's recommend the fifth finger on f the fourth on c von bulow believes that small hands beginning with his system will achieve quicker results than by the chopin fingering this is true ryman phrases the study with a multiplicity of legato bows and dynamic accents kullak prefers the telephone metronome eighty rather than the traditional ninety six most of the others use eighty eight to the quarter except ryman who espouses the more rapid gait of ninety six klindworth with his eighty eight strikes a fair medium the verdict of von bulow on the following study in a flat number ten has no uncertainty of tone in its proclamation he who can play the study in a really finished manner may congratulate himself on having climbed to the highest point of the pianist's parnassus as it is perhaps the most difficult piece of the entire set the whole repertory of piano music does not contain a study of perpetuum mobile so full of genius and fancy as this particular one is universally acknowledged to be except perhaps liszt's faux follets the most important point would appear to lie not so much in the interchange of the groups of legato and staccato as in the exercise of rhythmic contrasts the alternation of the two and three part metre that is the four and six in the same bar to overcome this fundamental difficulty in the art of musical reproduction is the most important thing here and with true zeal it may even be accomplished easily kullak writes harmonic anticipations a rich rhythmic life originating in the changing articulation of the twelve eighths in groups of three and two each this etude is an exceedingly piquant composition possessing for the hearer a wondrous fantastic charm if played with the proper insight the metronomic marking is practically the same in all editions one fifty two to the quarter notes the study is one of the most charming of the composer there is more depth in it than in the g flat and f major studies and its effectiveness in the virtuoso sense is unquestionable a savor of the salon hovers over its perfumed measures but there is grace spontaneity and happiness chopin must have been as happy as his sensitive nature would allow when he conceived this vivacious caprice in all the editions Ryman's excepted, there is no doubt left as to the alternations of meters. Here are the first few bars of von Bülow's, which is normal phrasing. Read Ryman's version of these bars. Ryman is conducive to clear-sighted phrasing, and will set the student thinking, but the general effect of accentuation is certainly different. All the editors quoted agree with von Bülow, Clintworth, and Kulak but if this is a marked specimen of Ryman, examine his reading of the phrase wherein Chopin's triple rhythm is supplemented by double. This von Bülow, and who will dare cavil? Ryman. The difference is more imaginary than real, for the stems of the accented notes give us the binary meter. But the illustration serves to show how Dr. Ryman is disposed to refine upon the gold of Chopin. Kulak dilates upon a peculiarity of Chopin, the dispersed position of his underlying harmonies. This is a footnote to the eleventh study of Opus 10. Here one must let go the critical view, else strangle in pedagogics. So much has been written so much that is false perverted sentimentalism and unmitigated cant about the nocturnes that the wonder is the real chopin lover has not rebelled there are pearls and diamonds in the jewelled collection of nocturnes many are dolorous 
few dramatic, and others are sweetly insane and songful. I yield to none in my admiration for the first one of the two in G minor, for the psychical despair in the C-sharp minor nocturne, for the noble drama called the C minor nocturne, for the B major, the tuberose nocturne, and for the E, D-flat, and G major nocturnes. It remains unabated. But in the list there is no such picture painted, a Corot if ever there was one, as this E-flat study. Its novel design, delicate arabesques, as if the guitar had been dowered with a soul, and the richness and originality of its harmonic scheme, gives us pause to ask if Chopin's invention is not almost boundless. The melody itself is plaintive, a plaintive grace informs the entire piece. The harmonization is far more wonderful, but to us the chord of the tenth and more remote intervals seem no longer daring. Modern composition has deviled the musical alphabet into the very caverns of the grotesque. Yet there are harmonies in the last page of the study that still excite wonder. The fifteenth bar from the end is one that Richard Wagner might have made from that bar to the close. Every group is a masterpiece. Remember, this study is a nocturne, and even the accepted metronomic markings in most editions, seventy-six to the quarter, are not too slow. They might even be slower. Allegretto and not a shade speedier. The color scheme is celestial and the ending a sigh, not unmixed with happiness. Chopin, sensitive poet, had his moments of peace, of divine content. Liebenstruhe. The dizzy appoggiatura leaps in the last two bars set the seal of perfection upon this unique composition. Touching upon the execution, one may say that it is not for small hands, nor yet for big fists. The former must not believe that any arrangements or simplified versions will ever produce the aerial effect, the swaying of the tendrils of tone intended by Chopin. Very large hands are tempted by the reach to crush the life out of the study in not arpeggiating it. This I have heard and the impression was indescribably brutal. As for fingering, Mikulay, von Bülow, Kulik, Ryman, and Klindworth all differ, and from them must most pianists differ. Your own grasp, individual sense of fingering, and tact will dictate the management of techniques. Von Bülow gives a very sensible pattern to work from, and Kulik is still more explicit. He analyzes the melody, and planning the arpeggiating with scrupulous fidelity, he shows why the arpeggiating must be effected with utmost rapidity, bordering on simultaneousness of harmony in the case of many chords. Kulik has something to say about the grace notes, and this bids me call your attention to von Bülow's change in the appoggiatura of the last return of the subject. A bad misprint is in the von Bülow edition. It is in the seventeenth bar from the end, the lowest note in the first bass group, and should read E natural, instead of the E flat that stands. Von Bülow does not use the arpeggio sign after the first chord. He rightly believes it makes unclear for the student the subtleties of harmonic changes in fingering. He also suggests quite like the fertile Hans Guido, that players who have sufficient patience and enthusiasm for the task would find it worth their while to practice the arpeggio in the reverse way, from top to bottom, or in the contrary motion, beginning with the top note in one hand and the bottom note in the other. A variety of devices like this would certainly help to give greater finish to the task. Doubtless, but consider... Man's years are but threescore and ten. The phrasing of the various editions examined do not vary much. Ryman is accepted, who has his say in this fashion at the beginning. More remarkable still is the diversity of opinion regarding the first three bass chord groups in the fifteenth bar from the close. The bottom notes, 
in the von bulow and klindworth editions are b flat and two a naturals and in the ryman kulak and mcculley editions the notes are two b flats and one a natural the former sounds more varied but we may suppose the latter to be correct because of mcculley here is the particular bar as given by ryman yet this exquisite flight into the blue this nocturne which should be played before sundown excited the astonishment of mendelssohn the perplexed wrath of moschel and the contempt of ralstab editor of the iris who wrote in that journal in eighteen thirty four of the studies in opus ten those who have distorted fingers may put them right by practising these studies but those who have not should not play them at least not without having a surgeon at hand what incredible surgery would have been needed to get within the skull of this narrow critic any savour of the beauty of these compositions in the years to come the chopin studies will be played for their music without any thought of their technical problems now the young eagle begins to face the sun begins to mount on wind-weaving pinions we have reached the last study of opus ten the magnificent one in c minor four pages suffice for a background upon which the composer has flung with overwhelming fury the darkest the most demonic expressions of his nature here is no veiled surmise no smothered rage but all sweeps along in tornadic passion karasowski's story may be true regarding the genesis of this work but true or not it is one of the greatest dramatic outbursts in piano literature great in outline pride force and velocity it never relaxes its grim grip from the first shrill dissonance to the overwhelming coil close this end rings out like the crack of creation it is elemental kulak calls it a bravura study of the very highest order for the left hand it was composed in eighteen thirty one in stuttgart shortly after chopin had received tidings of the taking of warsaw by the russians september eighth eighteen thirty one karasowski wrote grief anxiety and despair over the fate of his relatives and his dearly beloved father filled the measure of his sufferings under the influence of this mood he wrote the c minor etude called by many the revolutionary etude out of the mad and tempestuous storm of passages for the left hand the melody rises aloft now passionate and anon proudly majestic until thrills of awe stream over the listener and the image is evoked of zeus hurling thunderbolts at the world next thinks it superbly grand and furthermore writes the composer seems fuming with rage the left hand rushes impetuously along and the right hand strikes in with passionate ejaculations von bulow said this c minor study must be considered a finished work of art in an even higher degree than the study in c sharp minor all of which is pretty but not enough to the point von bulow fingers the first passage for the left hand in a very rational manner klindworth differs by beginning with the third instead of the second finger while ryman dear innovator asks the group second first third and then the fifth finger on d if you please kulak is more normal beginning with the third here is ryman's phrasing and grouping for the first few bars notice the half note with peculiar changes of fingering at the end it gives surety and variety von bulow makes the changes ring on the second and fifth instead of the third and fifth fingers thus ryman in the above the accustomed phrasing is altered for in all other editions the accent falls upon the first note of each group in ryman the accentuation seems perverse but there is no question as to its pedagogic value it may be ugly but it is useful though i should not care to hear it in the concert room another striking peculiarity of the ryman phrasing is his heavy accent on the top e flat in the principal passage for the left hand 
He also fingers what von Bülow calls the chromatic meanderings in an unusual manner, both on the first page and the last. His idea of the enunciation of the first theme is peculiar. Mikulay places a legato bow over the first three octaves. So does Kulak. Von Bülow only over the last two, which gives a slightly different effect, while Klindworth does the same as Kulak. The heavy dynamic accents employed by Riemann are unmistakable. They signify the vital importance of the phrase at its initial entrance. He does not use it at the repetition, but throughout both dynamic and agogic accents are unsparingly used, and the study seems to resound with the sullen booming of a park of artillery. The working out section, with its anticipations of Tristan and Isolde, is phrased by all the editors as it is never played. Here the technical figure takes precedence over the law of phrase, and so most virtuosi place the accent on the fifth finger regardless of the pattern. This is as it should be. In Clindworth there is a misprint at the beginning of the fifteenth bar from the end in the bass. It should read E natural, not B flat. The metronome is the same in all editions, one sixty to the quarter, but speed should give way to breadth at all hazards. Von Bülow is the only editor, to my knowledge, who makes an enharmonic key change in this working-out section. It looks neater, sounds the same, but is it Chopin? He also gives a variant for the public performance by transforming the last run in unisono into a veritable hurricane by interlocked octaves. The effect is brazen. Chopin needs no such clangorous padding in this etude, which gains by legitimate strokes the most startling contrasts. The study is full of tremendous pathos. It compasses the sublime, and in its most torrential moments the composer never quite loses his mental equipoise. He too can evoke tragic spirits, and at will send them scurrying back to their dim profound. It has but one rival in the Chopin studies, number 12, opus 25, in the same key. End of chapter 6, part 1Chapter 6, Part 2 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shalifa Malikam. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hanukkah. Chapter 6, Part 2 The Studies, Titanic Experiments. Opus 25, Twelve Studies by Friedrich Chopin are dedicated to Madame la Comtesse d'Ajou. The set opens with a familiar study in A-flat, so familiar that I shall not make further ado about it, except to say that it is delicious, but played often and badly. All that modern editing can do since Miluki is to hunt out fresh accentuation. Von Bulow is a worse sinner in this respect for he discovers quaint nooks and dells for his dynamics, undreamed of by the composer. His edition should be respectfully studied, and, when mastered, discarded for a more poetic interpretation. Above all, poetry, poetry, and pedals. Without paddling of the most varied sort, this study will remain as dry as a dog-gnawed bone. Von Bülow says, the figure must be treated as a double triplet, twice three, and not three times two, as indicated in the first two bars. Klindworth makes the group a sextolet. Von Bülow has set forth numerous directions in fingering and phrasing, giving the exact number of notes in the vast trill at the end. Kulak uses a most ingenious fingering. Look at the last group of the last bar, second line, third page. It is a last word in fingering. Better to end with Robert Schumann's beautiful description of this study, as quoted by Kulak. In treating of the present book of Etudes, 
Robert Schumann, after comparing Chopin to a strange star seen at midnight, wrote as follows. Whither his path lies and leads, or how long, how brilliant its course is yet to be, who can say? As often, however, as it shows itself, there has ever seemed the same deep dark glow, the same starry light and the same austerity, so that even a child could not fail to recognize it. But besides this, I have had the advantage of hearing most of these etudes played by Chopin himself, and quite a la Chopin did he play them. Of the first one especially he writes, Imagine that an alien harp possessed all the musical scales, and that a hand of an artist were to cause them all to intermingle in all sorts of fantastic embellishments, yet in such a way as to leave everywhere audible a deep fundamental tone and a soft continuously singing upper voice, and you will get the right idea of his playing. But it would be an error to think that Chopin permitted every one of the small notes to be distinctly heard. It was rather an undulation of the A-flat major chord, here and there thrown aloft in you by the pedal. Throughout all the harmonies, one always heard in great tones a wondrous melody, while once only, in the middle of the piece, besides that chief song, a tenor voice became prominent in the midst of chords. After the etude, as of having seen in a dream, a beatific picture which, when half awake, one would gladly recall. After these words, there can be no doubt as to the mode of delivery. No commentary is required to show that the melodic and other important tones indicated by means of large notes must emerge from within the sweetly whispering waves, and that the upper tones must be combined so as to form a real melody with the finest and most thoughtful shadings. The twenty-fourth bar of this study in A major is so Listian that Liszt must have benefited by its harmonies. And then he played the second in the book in F minor, one in which his individuality displays itself in a manner never to be forgotten. How charming, how dreamy it was! Soft as the song of a sleeping child. Schumann wrote this about the wonderful study in F minor, which whispers, not of baleful deed in a dream, as does the last movement of the B-flat minor sonata, but is the song of a sleeping child. No comparison could be prettier, for there is a sweet, delicate drone that sometimes issues from childless lips, having a charm for ears not attuned to grosser things. This must have been the study that Chopin played for Henrietta Voigt at Leipzig, September 12th, 1836. In her diary she wrote, The over-excitement of his fantastic manner is imparted to the keen-eared. It made me hold my breath. Wonderful is the ease with which his velvet fingers glide. I might almost say, fly over the keys. He has enraptured me, in a way which hitherto had been unknown to me. What delighted me was a childlike, natural manner which he showed in his demeanour and in his playing. Von Bulow believes the interpretation of this magical music should be without sentimentality, almost without shading, clearly, delicately, and dreamily executed. An ideal pianissimo, an accentless quality, and completely without passion or rubato. There is little doubt this was the way Chopin played it. Liszt is an authority on the subject, and Mr. Matthias corroborates him. Regarding the rhythmical problem to be overcome, the combination of two opposing rhythms, von Bulow indicates an excellent method, and Kulak devotes part of a page to examples of how to ride, then the left, and finally both hands are to be treated. Kulak furthermore writes, or, if one will, he may also betake himself in fancy to a still green dusky forest, and listen in profound solitude to the mysterious rustling and whispering of the foliage. What, indeed, despite the algebraic character of the tone language, may not a lively fancy conjure out of, or rather, into, this etude? But one thing is to be held fast. 
it is to be played in that Chopin-like whisper of which, among others, Mendelssohn also affirmed that for him nothing more enchanting existed. But enough of subjective fancies. This study contains much beauty, and every bar rules over a little harmonic kingdom of its own. It is so lovely that not even the Brahms distortion in double notes or the version in octaves can dull its magnetic crooning. At times so delicate is its design that it recalls a faint fantastic tracery made by frost on glass. In all instances, save one, it is written as four unbroken quarter triplets in the bar right hand. Not so Riemann. He has use of his own, both as to fingering and phrasing. Musical score excerpt. Jean Kleczynski's interesting brochure, the works of Frédéric Chopin and their proper interpretation, is made up of three lectures delivered at Warsaw. While the subject is of necessity foreshortened, he says some practical things about the use of the pedals in Chopin's music. He speaks of this very study in F minor, and the enchanting way Rubinstein and Esipova ended it. The echo-like effects on the four seas, the paddle floating the tone. The paddles are half the battle in Chopin playing. One can never play Chopin beautifully enough. Realistic treatment dissipates his dream palaces, shatters his aerial architecture. He may be played broadly, fervently, dramatically, but coarsely, never. I deprecate the rose-leaf sentimentalism in which he is swathered by nearly all pianists. Chopin is a sigh with something pleasing in it, wrote someone, and it is precisely this notion which has created such havoc among his interpreters. But if excess in feeling is objectionable, so too is a healthy reading accorded his works by pianists with more brawn than brain. The real Chopin play is born, and can never be a product of the schools. Schumann thinks the third study in F less novel in character, although here the master showed his admirable bravura powers. But, he continues, they are all models of bold, indwelling, creative force, truly poetic creations, though not without small bloods in their details, but on the whole striking and powerful. Yet if I give my complete opinion, I must confess that his earlier collection seems more valuable to me. Not that I mean to imply any deterioration, for these recently published studies were nearly all written at the same time as the earlier ones, and only a few were composed a little while ago, the first in A-flat and the last magnificent one in C minor, both of which display great mastership. One may be permitted to disagree with Schumann, for Opus 25 contains at least two of Chopin's greatest studies, A minor and C minor. The most valuable point of the passage quoted is the clenching of the fact that the studies were composed in a bunch that settles many important psychological details. Chopin had suffered much before going to Paris, had undergone the purification and renunciation of an unsuccessful love affair, and arrived in Paris with his style fully formed, in his case, the style was most emphatically the man. Kulak calls a study in F a spirited little caprice, whose kernel lies in the simultaneous application of four different little rhythms to form a single figure in sound, which figure is then repeated continuously to the end. In these repetitions, however, changes of accentuation, fresh modulations, and piquant antithesis serve to make the composition extremely vivacious and effective. He pulls apart the brightly coloured petals of the thematic flower, and reveals the inner chemistry of this delicate growth. Four different voices are distinguished in the kernel. The third voice is the chief one, and after it the first, because they determine the melodic and harmonic contents. Musical score excerpt Kulak and Mikuli dot the C of the first bar. Klindworth and von Bulow do not. As to phrasing and fingering, I pin my faith to Riemann. 
His version is the most satisfactory. Here are the first bars. The idea is clearly expressed. Musical score excerpt. Best of all is a careful accentuation, and at a place indicated in no other edition that I have examined. With the arrival of the thirty-second notes, Riemann punctuates the theme this way. Musical score excerpt. The melody, of course in profile, is in the eighth notes. This gives meaning to the decorative pattern of the passage. And what charm, buoyancy, and sweetness there is in this caprice! It has a tantalizing, elusive charm of a hummingbird in full flight. The human element is almost illuminated. We are in the open, the sun blazes in the blue, and all is gay, atmospheric, and eluding. Even where the tone deepens, where the shadows grow cooler and darker in the B major section, there is little hint of preoccupation with sadness. Subtle are the harmonic shifts, admirable the ever-changing devices of the figuration. Riemann accents the B, the E, A, B-flat, C, and F at the close, perilous leaps for the left hand, but they bring into fine relief the exquisite harmonic web. An easy way of avoiding the tricky position in the left hand at this spot, thirteen bars from the close, is to take the upper C and bass with the right hand thump, and in the next bar the upper B and bass the same way. This minimizes the risk of the skip, and it is perfectly legitimate to do this, in public at least. The ending to be breathed away, according to Kulak, is verily fingered. He also prescribes a most trying fingering for the first group, fourth finger on both hands. This is useful for study, but for performance the third finger is surer. Von Bulow advises the players to keep the upper part of the body as still as possible, as any haste of movement would destroy the object in view, which is the acquisition of a loose wrist. He also suggests certain phrasing in bar 17, and forbids the sharp-cutting manner in playing this word sati at the last return of the subject. Kulak is copious in his directions, and thinks the touch should be light, and the hand gliding, and in the B major part, fiery, willful accentuation of the inferior beats. Capricious, fantastic, and graceful, this study is Chopin in rare spirits. Schumann has a phrase, the study should be executed with amiable bravura. There is a misprint in the Kulak edition. At the beginning of the thirty-second notes, an A instead of an F upsets the tonality, besides being absurd. Of the fourth study, in A minor, there is little to add to Theodore Kulak, who writes, In the broadest sense of the word, every piece of music is an etude. In a narrower sense, however, we demand of an etude that it shall have a special end in view, promote facility in something, and lead to the conquest of some particular difficulty, whether of techniques, of rhythm, expression, or delivery. Robert Schumann, Collected Writings, 1, 201. The present study is less interesting from a technical than a rhythmical point of view, while the chief beats of the measure, first, third, fifth, and seventh eighths, are represented only by single tones, in the bass part, which are to a certain extent free and unconcerned, and void of all encumbrance. The inferior parts of the measure, second, fourth, sixth, and eighth eighths, are burdened with chords, the most of which, moreover, are provided with accents in opposition to the regular beats of the measure. Further, there is associated with these chords, or there may be said to grow out of them, a cantilene in the upper voice, which appears in syncopated form opposite to the strong beat of the bass. This cantilene begins on a weak beat, and produces numerous suspensions, which, in view of the time of their entrance, appear as so many retardations and delayals of melodic tones. All these things combined to give the composition a wholly peculiar colouring, to render its flow somewhat restless, and to stamp the etude as a little characteristic piece, a capriccio, which might well be named inquietude. 
As regards techniques, two things are to be studied, the staccato of the chords and the execution of the cantilena. The chords must be formed more by pressure than by striking. The fingers must support themselves very lightly upon the chord keys, and then rise again with the back of the hand in the most elastic manner. The upward movement of the hand must be very slight. Everything must be done with greatest precision, and not merely in a superficial manner. Where the cantilena appears, every melodic tone must stand apart from the tones of the accompaniment, as if in relief. Hence the fingers for the melodic tones must press down the keys allotted to them with a special force, in doing which the back of the hand may be permitted to turn lightly to the right, sideward stroke, especially when there is a rest in the accompaniment. Compare with this etude the introduction to the capriccio in B minor with the orchestra by Felix Mendelssohn, first page. Aside from a few rallentando places, the etude is to be played strictly in time. I prefer the Clintworth edition of this rather sombre, nervous composition, which may be merely an etude, but it also indicates a slightly pathological condition. With its breast-catching syncopations and narrow emotional range, the A minor study has nevertheless moments of power and interest. Riemann's phrasing, while careful, is not more enlightening than Clintworth's. Von Bülow says, The bass must be strongly marked throughout, even when piano, and brought out in imitation of the upper part. Singularly enough, his is the only edition in which the left-hand arpeggios, at the close, though in the final bar, both hands may do so. This is editorial quibbling. Stephen Heller remarked that this study reminded him of the first bar of the Kyrie, rather the Regium Aeternam of Mozart's Requiem. It is safe to say that the fifth study in E minor is less often heard in the concert room than any one of its companions. I cannot recall having heard it since Annette Esipova gave that famous recital during which she played the entire twenty-seven studies. Yet it is a sonorous piano piece, rich in embroideries and general decorative effect in the middle section. Perhaps the rather perverse, capricious, and not altogether amiable character of the beginning has caused pianists to be wary of introducing it at a recital. It is hugely effective, and also difficult, especially if played with the same fingering throughout, as von Bulow suggests. Niecks quotes Stephen Heller's partiality for this very study. In the Gazette Musicale, February 24th, 1839, Heller wrote of Chopin's Opus 25, what more do we require to pass one or several evenings in as perfect a happiness as possible? As for me, I seek in this collection of poesy. This is the only name appropriate to the works of Chopin, some favourite pieces which I might fix in my memory rather than others. Who could retain everything? For this reason I have in my notebook quite particularly marked the numbers four, five and seven of the present poems. Of these twelve much-loved studies, every one of which has a charm of its own, the three numbers of those I prefer to all the rest. The middle part of this E minor study recalls Thalberg. Von Bulow cautions the student against the accenting of the first note with thumb right hand, as it does not form part of the melody, but only comes in as an unimportant passing note. This refers to the melody in E. He also writes that the addition of the third in the left hand, Clintworth's addition, needs no special justification. I discovered one marked difference in the Clintworth edition. The leap in the left hand, first variety of the theme, tenth bar from beginning, is preceded by an appoggiatura, E natural. The jump is to F-sharp instead of G, as in the Mikuli, Kulak, and Riemann editions. Von Bülow uses the F-sharp, but without a ninth below. Riemann phrases a piece so as to get the top melody, B, E, and G, and his stems are below instead of above, 
as in Mikuli and von Bulow. Kulak dots the eighth note. Riemann uses a sixteenth thus. Musical score excerpt. Kulak writes that the figure 184 is not found on the older metronomes. This is not too fast for the capriccio, with its pretty and ingenious rhythmical transformations. As regards the execution of the 130th bar, von Bulow says, The acciature, prefixes, are to be struck simultaneously with the other parts, as also the shake in bar 134 and following bars. This must begin with the upper auxiliary note. These details are important. Kulak concludes his notes thus. Despite all the little transformations of the motive member which forms the kernel, its recognizability remains essentially unimpaired. Meanwhile, out of these little metamorphoses, there is developed a rich rhythmic life which the performer must bring out with great precision. If, in addition, he possesses a fine feeling for what is graceful, coquettish, or agreeably capricious, he will understand how to heighten still further the charm of the chief part, which, as far as its character is concerned, reminds one of Etude, Opus 25, Number 3. The secondary part, in major, begins. Its kernel is formed of a beautiful broad melody which, if soulfully conceived and delivered, will sing its way deep into the heart of the listener. For the accompaniment in the right hand, we find chord arpeggiations in triplets, afterward in sixteenths, calmly ascending and descending, and surrounding the melody as with a veal. They are to be played almost without accentuation. It was Louis Ehlert, who wrote of the celebrated study in G-sharp minor, Op. 25, number 6. Chopin not only versifies an exercise in thirds, he transforms it into such a work of art that in studying it one could sooner fancy himself on Parnassus than at a lesson. He deprives every passage of all mechanical appearance by promoting it to become the embodiment of a beautiful thought which, in turn, finds graceful expression in its motion. And, indeed, in the piano literature, no more remarkable merging of matter and manner exists. The means justifies the end, and the means employed by the composer are beautiful. There is no other word to describe the style and architectonics of this noble study. It is seldom played in public because of its difficulty. With the Schumann Toccata, the G-sharp minor study, stands at the portals of the delectable land of double notes. Both compositions have a common ancestry in the Czerny Toccata, and both are the parents of such a sensational offspring as Balakirev's Isleme. In reading through the double note studies for the instrument, it is in the nature of a miracle to come upon Chopin's transfiguration of such a barren subject. This study is first music, then a technical problem. Where two or three pianists are gathered together in the name of Chopin, the conversation is bound to formulate itself thus. How do you finger the double chromatic third in the G-sharp minor study? That question answered, your digital politics are known. You are classified, ranged. If you are heterodox, you are eagerly questioned. If you follow von Bulow and stand by the Czerny fingering, you are regarded as a curiosity. As the interpretation of the study is not taxing, let us examine the various fingerings. First, a fingering given by Leopold Godowski. It is for double chromatic thirds. Reader's note, please fit it to provide a link to archive.org to see the musical score excerpt. End of reader's note. You will now be presented with a battalion of authorities, so that you may see at a glance the various efforts to climb those slippery chromatic heights. Here is Mikuli. Musical score excerpt. Kulak's is exactly the same as above. It is the so-called Chopin fingering, as contrasted with the so-called Czerny fingering, though in reality Clementi's, as Mr. John Couch contends. In the latter, 
the third and fifth fingers fall upon c sharp and e and f sharp and a in the right hand and upon c and e flat and g and b flat in the left Clintworth also employs a chopin fingering von bulow makes this statement as the peculiar fingering adopted by chopin for chromatic scales and thirds appears to us to render their performances in legatissimo utterly unattainable on our modern instruments we have exchanged it where necessary for the older method of hummel two of the greatest executive artists of modern times alexander dreischock and karl tausig were theoretically and practically of the same opinion it is to be conjectured that chopin was influenced in his method of fingering by the piano of his favourite makers player and wolf of paris who before they adopted the double échappement certainly produced instruments with the most pliant touch possible and therefore regarded the use of the thump in the ascending scales on two wide keys in succession the semitones e f and b c as practicable on the grand piano of the present day we regard it as irreconcilable with conditions of crescendo legato this chopin fingering in reality derives directly from hummel see his piano school so he gives this fingering musical score excerpt he also suggests the following phrasing for the left hand this is excellent musical score excerpt Riemann not only adopts new fingering for the double note scale, but also begins a study with a trill on first and third, second and fourth, instead of the usual first and fourth, second and fifth fingers adopted by the rest. This is his notion of the run in chromatic thirds. Musical score excerpt. For the rest, the study must be played like the wind, or as Kulak says, apart from a few places and some accents the etude is to be played almost throughout in that chopin whisper the right hand must play its thirds especially the diatonic and chromatic scales with such a quality that no angularity of motion shall be noticeable where the fingers pass under or over each other the left hand too must receive careful attention and special study the chord passages and all similar ones must be executed discreetly and legatissimo notes with double stems must be distinguished from notes with single stems by means of stronger shadings for they are mutually interconnected end of chapter six part two chapter six part three of chopin the man and his music this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. Chopin, The Man and His Music, by James Hunnicker. Chapter 6, Part 3, The Studies, Titanic Experiments. Von Bulow calls the seventh study, the one in C-sharp minor, a nocturne, a duo for cello and flute. He ingeniously smooths out the unequal rhythmic differences of the two hands, and justly says the piece does not work out any special technical matter. This study is the most lauded of all. Yet I cannot help agreeing with Nikes, who writes of it, he oddly enough places it in the key of E, quote, a duet between a he and a she, of whom the former shows himself more talkative and emphatic than the latter, is indeed very sweet, but perhaps also somewhat tiresomely monotonous, as such tete-a-tetes naturally are to third parties. For Chopin's contemporaries, this was one of his greatest efforts. Heller wrote, It engenders the sweetest sadness, the most enviable torments, and if in playing it one feels oneself insensibly drawn toward mournful and melancholy ideas, it is a disposition of the soul which I prefer to all others. Alas! How I love these somber and mysterious dreams, 
and Chopin is the God who created them. In this etude, Kleczynski thinks there are traces of weariness of life, and quotes Orlowski, Chopin's friend. Quote, he is only afflicted with homesickness. Unquote. Willoughby calls this study the most beautiful of them all. For me, it is both morbid and elegiac. There is nostalgia in it, the nostalgia of a sick, lacerated soul. It contains in solution all the most objectionable and most endearing qualities of the master. Perhaps we have heard its sweet, highly perfumed measures too often. Its interpretation is a matter of taste. Kulak has written the most ambitious program for it. Here is a quotation from Albert R. Parsons' translation in Schreimer's edition of Kulak. Throughout the entire piece, an elegiac mood prevails. The composer paints with psychologic truthfulness a fragment out of the life of a deeply clouded soul. He lets a broken heart, filled with grief, proclaim its sorrow in a language of pain which is incapable of being misunderstood. The heart has lost not something, but everything. The tones, however, do not always bear the impress of a quiet, melancholy resignation. More passionate impulses awaken, and the still plaint becomes a complaint against cruel fate. It seeks the conflict and tries through force of will to burst the fetters of pain, or at least to alleviate it through absorption in a happy past. But in vain. The heart has not lost something. It has lost everything. The musical poem divides into three, or if one views the little episode in B major as a special part, into four parts strophes, of which the last is an elaborated repetition of the first with a brief closing part appended. The whole piece is a song, or, better still, an aria, in which two principal voices are to be brought out. The upper one is in imitation of a human voice, while the lower one must bear the character throughout of an obligato violoncello. It is well known that Chopin was very fond of the Olencello, and that in his piano compositions he imitated the style of passages peculiar to that instrument. The two voices correspond closely, supplementing and imitating each other reciprocally. Between the two a third element exists, an accompaniment of eighths in uniform succession without any significance beyond that of filling out the harmony. This third element is to be kept wholly subordinate. The little, one-voiced introduction in recitative style which precedes the aria reminds one vividly of the beginning of the ballad in G minor, opus 23. The D-flat study, number 8, is called by von Bulow, quote, the most useful exercise in the whole range of etude literature. It might truly be called le indispensable di pianista if the term, through misuse, had not fallen into disrepute. As a remedy for stiff fingers and preparatory to performing in public, playing it six times through is recommended even to the most expert pianist. Unquote. Only six times? The separate study of the left hand is recommended. Kulak finds this study, quote, surprisingly euphonious, but devoid of depth of content, unquote. It is an admirable study for the cultivation of double sixths. It contains a remarkable passage of consecutive fifths that set theorists by the ears. Riemann manages to get some new editorial comment upon it. The nimble study, number nine, which bears the title of the butterfly is in G-flat. Von Bulow transposes it enharmonically to F-sharp, avoiding numerous double flats. The change is not laudable. He holds anything but an elevated opinion of the piece, classing it with a composition of the Charles Mayer order. This is unjust. The study, if not deep, is graceful and certainly very effective. 
it has lately become the stamping ground for the display of piano athletics nearly all modern virtuosi pull to pieces the wings of this gay little butterfly they smash it they bang it and adding insult to cruelty they finish it with three chords mounting an octave each time thus giving a conventional character to the close the very thing the composer avoids the telefson's edition and Kleinworth's give these differences macaulay von bulow and kulak place the legato bow over the first three notes of the group riemann of course is different the metronomic markings are about the same in all editions asiatic wildness according to von bulow pervades the b minor study opus twenty five number ten although willoughby claims it to be only a study in octaves quote, for the left hand von bulow furthermore compares it because of its monophonic character to the chorus of derivishes in beethoven's ruins of athens nyack says it is quote, a real pandemonium for a while holier sounds intervene but finally hell prevails unquote. The study is for Kulak, quote, somewhat far-fetched and forced in invention, and leaves one cold, although it plunges on wildly to the end, unquote. Von Bulow has made the most complete edition. Kleinwirth strengthens the first and the seventh eighth notes of the fifth bar before the last by filling in the harmonics of the left hand. This etude is an important one, technically. Because many pianists make little of it does not abate its musical significance, and I am almost inclined to group it with the last two studies of this opus. The opening is portentous and soon becomes a driving whirlwind of tone. Chopin has never penned a lovelier melody than the one in B, the middle section of this etude. It is only to be compared to the one in the same key in the B minor scherzo, while the return to the first subject is managed as consummately as in the E flat minor scherzo from opus 35. I confess to being stirred by this B minor study, with its tempo at a forced draft and with its precipitous close. There is a lushness about the octave melody. The tune may be a little overripe, but it is sweet sensuous music and about it hovers the hush of a rich evening in early autumn and now the winter wind the study in a minor opus 25 number 11 here even von bulow becomes enthusiastic Quote, it must be mentioned as a particular merit of this the longest and in every respect the grandest of chopin's studies that while producing the greatest fullness of sound imaginable it keeps itself so entirely and utterly unorchestral and represents piano music in the most accurate sense of the word to chopin is due the honor and credit of having set fast the boundary between piano and orchestral music which through other composers of the romantic school especially robert schumann has been defaced and blotted out to the prejudice and damage of both species. Unquote. Kulak is equally as warm in his praise of it. Quote, One of the grandest and most ingenious of Chopin's etudes, and a companion piece to Opus 10, number 12, which perhaps it even surpasses. It is a bravura study of the highest order, and it is captivating through the boldness and originality of its passages whose rising and falling waves, full of agitation, overflow the entire keyboard, captivating through its harmonic and modulatory shadings, and captivating, finally, through a wonderfully invented little theme, which is drawn like a red thread through all the flashing and glittering waves of tone, and which, as it were, prevents them from scattering to all quarters of the heavens. This little theme, strictly speaking only a phrase of two measures is in a certain sense the motto which serves as a superscription for the etude appearing first one voiced and immediately after four voiced the slow time 
lento shows the great importance which is to be attached to it they who have followed thus far and agree with what has been said cannot be in doubt concerning the proper artistic delivery to execute the passages quite in the rapid time prescribed one must possess a finished technique great facility lightness of touch equality strength and endurance in the forte passages together with the clearest distinctness in the piano and pianissimo all of this must have been already achieved for the interpreter must devote his whole attention to the poetic contents of the composition especially to the delivery of the march-like rhythms which possess a life of their own appearing now calm and circumspect and anon bold and challenging the march-like element naturally requires strict playing time Unquote. this study is magnificent and moreover it is music in bar fifteen von bulow makes be natural the second note of the last group although all other editions except Kleinworth, uses a b flat von bulow has common sense on his side the b flat is a misprint the same authority recommends slow staccato practice with the lid of the piano closed then the hurly-burly of tone will not intoxicate the player and submerge his critical faculty each editor has his notion of the phrasing of the initial sixteenths thus macaulay's which is normal as regards grouping riemann follows von bulow but places his accents differently the canvas is chopin's largest for the idea and its treatment are on a vastly grander scale than any contained in the two concertos the latter are after all miniatures precious ones if you will joined and built with cunning artifice in neither work is there the restless overflow of this etude which has been compared to the screaming of the winter blasts ah how chopin puts to flight those modern men who scheme out a big decorative pattern and then have nothing wherewith to fill it he never relaxes his theme and its fluctuating surprises are many the end is notable for the fact that scales appear chopin very seldom uses scale figures in his studies from hummel to thalberg and hertz the keyboard had glittered with spangled scales chopin must have been sick of them as sick of them as of the left-hand melody with arpeggiated accompaniment at the right a la thalberg scales had been used too much hence chopin's sparing employment of them in the first c sharp minor study opus ten there is a run for the left hand in the coda in the seventh study same key opus twenty five there are more the second study of opus ten in a minor is a chromatic scale study but there are no other specimens of the form until the mighty run at the conclusion of this a minor study it takes prodigious power and endurance to play this work prodigious power passion and no little poetry it is open-air music storm music and at times moves in processional splendor small-souled men no matter how agile their fingers should avoid it the prime technical difficulty is the management of the thumb kulak has made a variant at the end for concert performance it is effective the average metronomic marking is sixty-nine to the half kulak thinks the twelfth and last study of opus twenty five in c minor quote, a grand magnificent composition for practice in broken chord passages for both hands which requires no comment unquote. i differ from this worthy teacher rather is nike's more to my taste quote, number twelve c minor in which the emotions rise not less high than the waves of arpeggios which symbolize them unquote. von bulow is didactic Quote, the requisite strength for this grandiose bravura study can only be attained by the utmost clearness and thus only by a gradually increasing speed it is therefore most desirable to practice it piano also by way of variety
for otherwise the strength of tone might easily degenerate into hardness, and in the poetic striving after a realistic portrayal of a storm on the piano the instrument, as well as the piece, would come to grief. The pedal is needful to give the requisite effect, and must change with every new harmony, but it should only be used in the latter stages of study, when the difficulties are nearly mastered. Unquote. We have our preferences. Mine, in Opus 25, is the C minor study, which, like the prelude in D minor, is full of the sound of great guns. Willoughby thinks otherwise. On page 81, in his Life of Chopin, he has the courage to write, quote, Had Professor Nyack applied the term monotonous to number 12, we should have been more ready to endorse his opinion, as, although great power is manifested, the very sameness of the form of the arpeggio figure causes a certain amount of monotony to be felt. Unquote. The C minor study is, in a degree, a return to the first study in C. While the idea in the former is infinitely nobler, more dramatic and tangible, there is in the latter naked, primeval simplicity, the elemental puissance. Monotonous? A thousand times no. Monotonous as is the thunder and spray of the sea when it tumbles and roars on some sullen, savage Thor. Beethoven, in its ruggedness, the Chopin of this C minor study is as far removed from the musical dandyisms of the Parisian drawing rooms as is Beethoven himself. It is orchestral in intention and a true epic of the piano. Riemann places half notes at the beginning of each measure as a reminder of the necessary clinging of the thumbs. I like von Vulof's version the best of all. His directions are most minute. He gives the list method of working up the climax in octave triplets. How Liszt must have thundered through this tumultuous work! Before it, all criticism should be silenced that fails to allow Chopin a place among the greatest creative musicians. We are here in the presence of Chopin the musician, not Chopin the composer for piano. In 1840, Troy Nouvelle Etude by Frédéric Chopin appeared in the Méthode de Méthode pour le Piano by F. J. Fitti and I. Moschel. It was odd company for the Polish composer. Internal evidence seems to show, writes Nyx, that these weakest of the master's studies, which, however, are by no means uninteresting and certainly very characteristic, may be regarded more than Opus 25 as the outcome of a gleaning. The last decade has added much to the artistic stature of these three supplementary studies. They have something of the concision of the preludes. The first is a masterpiece. In F minor, the theme in triplet quarters, broad, sonorous, and passionate, is unequally pitted against four eight notes in the bass. The technical difficulty to be overcome is purely rhythmic, and Kulak takes pains to show how it may be overcome. It is the musical, the emotional content of the study that fascinates. The worthy editor calls it a companion piece to the F minor study in Opus 25. The comparison is not an apt one. Far deeper is this new study, and although the doors never swing quite open, we divine the tragic issues concealed. Beautiful in a different way is the A-flat study which follows. Again, the problem is a rhythmical one, and again the composer demonstrates his exhaustless invention and his power of evoking a single mood, viewing all its lovely contours and letting it melt away like dream magic. Full of gentle sprightliness and lingering sweetness is this study. Chopin has the hypnotic quality more than any composer of the century, Richard Wagner excepted. After you have enjoyed playing this study, read Kulak and his Triplicity in Biplicity. It may do you good, and it will not harm the music. In all the editions save one that I have seen, 
the third study in D-flat begins on A-flat, like the famous valse in D-flat. The exception is Kleendworth, who starts with B-flat, the note above. The study is full of sunny, good humor, spiritualized humor, and leaves the most cheering impression after its performance. Its technical object is a simultaneous legato and staccato. The result is an idealized valsa in allegretto tempo, the very incarnation of joy, tempered by aristocratic reserve. Chopin never romps, but he jests wittily, and always in supremely good taste. This study fitly closes his extraordinary labors in this form, and it is as if he had signed it F. Chopin at Ego in Arcady. Among the various editions, let me recommend Kleendworth for daily usage, while frequent reference to von Bulow, Riemann, and Kulak cannot fail to prove valuable, curious, and interesting. Of the making of Chopin editions, there is seemingly no end. In 1894, I saw in manuscript some remarkable versions of the Chopin studies by Leopold Godowski. The study in G-sharp minor was the first one published and played in public by this young pianist. Unlike the Brahms derangements, they are musical but immensely difficult. Topsy-turvied as are the figures, a Chopin, even if lopsided, hovers about, sometimes with eyebrows lifted, sometimes with angry knitted forehead, and not seldom amused to the point of smiling. You see his narrow shoulders, shrugged in the Polish fashion as he examines the study in double-thirds transposed to the left hand. Curiously enough, this transcription, difficult as it is, does not tax the fingers as much as a bedevilment of the A minor, opus 25, number 4, which is extremely difficult, demanding color discrimination and individuality of finger. More breath-catching, and a piece at which one must cry out, hats off, gentlemen, a tornado, is the caprice called badinage. But if it is meant to badinage, it is no sport for the pianist of everyday technical attainments. This is formed of two studies. In the right hand is the G-flat study, opus 25, number 9, and in the left the black key study, opus 10, number 5. The two go laughing through the world like old friends. Brother and sister they are tonally, trailing behind them a cloud of iridescent glory. Godowski has cleverly combined the two, following their melodic curves as nearly as possible. In some places he has thickened the harmonies and shifted the black key figures to the right hand. It is the work of a remarkable pianist. This is the way it looks on paper at the beginning. The same study, G-flat, opus 10, number 5, is also treated separately, the melody being transferred to the treble. The butterfly octaves, in another study, are made to hop nimbly along in the left hand, and the C major study, opus 10, number 7, Chopin's Toccata, is arranged for the left hand, and seems very practical and valuable. Here the adapter has displayed great taste and skill, especially on the third page. The pretty musical idea is not destroyed, but viewed from other points of vantage. Opus 10, number 2, is treated like a left-hand study as it should be. Chopin did not always give enough work to the left hand, and the first study of this opus in C is planned on brilliant lines for both hands. Ingenious is the manipulation of the seldom played Opus 25, number 5 in E minor. As a study in rhythms and double notes, it is very welcome. The F minor study, Opus 25, number 2, as considered by the ambidextrous Godowski, is put in the bass, where it whirls along to the melodic encouragement of a theme of the paraphraser's own in the right. This study has suffered the most of all, for Brahms, in his heavy, Teutonic way, set it grinding double sixths, while Isidore Philippe, in his studies for the left hand, has harnessed it to sullen octaves. This Frenchman, by the way, also arranged for left hand alone the G-sharp minor, the D-flat double sixths, the A minor, winter wind, studies, 
the b flat minor prelude and terrible to relate the last movement of the chopin b flat minor sonata are the godowski transcriptions available certainly in ten years so rapid is the technical standard advancing they will be used in the curriculum of students whether he has treated chopin with reverence i leave my betters to determine what has reverence to do with the case anyhow plato is parsed in the schoolroom and beethoven taught in conservatories therefore why worry over the question of godowski's attitude besides he is writing for the next generation presumably a generation of rosenthal's and now having passed over the salt and stubbly domain of pedagogics what is the dominant impression gleaned from the twenty-seven chopin studies is it not one of admiration tinged with wonder at the prodigal display of thematic and technical invention their variety is great the aesthetic side is nowhere neglected for the purely mechanical and in the most poetic of them stuff may be found for delicate fingers astounding canorous enchanting alembicated and dramatic the chopin studies are exemplary essays in emotion and manner in them is mirrored all of chopin the planetary as well as the secular chopin when most of his piano music has gone the way of all things fashioned by mortal hands, these studies will endure, will stand for the 19th century as Beethoven crystallized the 18th, Bach the 17th centuries in piano music. Chopin is a classic. End of chapter 6, part 3 End of chapter 6 Read by Robert Hoffman Chapter 7 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hunnicker. Chapter 7 Moods in Miniature. The Preludes. The preludes bear the opus number 28 and are dedicated to J.C. Kessler, a composer of well-known piano studies. It is only the German edition that bears his name, the French and English being inscribed by Chopin, K. son omi Pleyel. As Pleyel advanced the pianist 2,000 francs for the preludes, he had a right to say, quote, These are my preludes. Unquote. Niecks is authority for Chopin's remark, quote, I sold the preludes to Pleyel because he liked them. Unquote. This was in 1838, when Chopin's health demanded a change of climate. He wished to go to Majorca with Madame Sand and her children, and had applied for money to the piano maker and publisher, Camille Pleyel. He received but 500 francs in advance, the balance being paid on delivery of the manuscript. The preludes were published in 1839 yet there is internal evidence which proves that most of them had been composed before the trip to the Balearic Islands. This will upset the very pretty legend of making music at the monastery of Aldamosa. Have we not all read, with sweet credulity, the eloquent pages in George Sand, in which the storm is described that overtook the novelist and her son Maurice? After terrible trials, dangers, and delays, they reached their home and found Chopin at the piano. Uttering a cry, he arose and stared at the pair. Ah, I knew well that you were dead. It was the sixth prelude, the one in B minor, that he played, and dreaming, as Sand writes, that, quote, he saw himself drowned in a lake. Heavy, ice-cold drops of water fell at regular intervals upon his breast, and when I called his attention to those drops of water which were actually falling upon the roof, he denied having heard them. He was even vexed at what I translated by the term imitative harmony. He protested with all his might, and he was right, against the puerility of these imitations for the ear. His genius was full of mysterious harmonies of nature. Yet this prelude was composed previous to the Majorcan episode. The preludes, says Niecks, 
consist, to a great extent at least, of pickings from the composer's portfolios, of pieces, sketches, and memoranda written at various times and kept to be utilized when occasion might offer. Gutmann, Chopin's pupil, who nursed him to the last, declared the preludes to have been composed before he went away with Madame Sand, and to Niecks personally he maintained that he had copied all of them. Niecks does not credit him altogether, for there are letters in which several of the preludes are mentioned as being sent to Paris, so he reaches the conclusion that, quote, Chopin's labors at Majorca on the preludes were confined to selecting, filling, and polishing. This seems to be a sensible solution. Robert Schumann wrote of these preludes, quote, I must signalize them as most remarkable. I will confess I expected something quite different, carried out in the grand style of his studies. It is almost the contrary here. These are sketches, the beginning of studies, or, if you will, ruins, eagle's feathers, all strangely intermingled. But in every piece we find in his own hand, Frederick Chopin wrote it. One recognizes him in his pauses, in his impetuous respiration. He is the boldest, the proudest poet soul of his time. To be sure, the book also contains some morbid, feverish, repellent traits, but let everyone look in it for something that will enchant him. Philistines, however, must keep away. Unquote. It was in these preludes that Ignaz Moscheles first comprehended Chopin and his methods of execution. The German pianist had found his music harsh and dilettantish in modulation, but Chopin's originality of performance, quote, he glides lightly over the keys in a fairy-like way with his delicate fingers, unquote, quite reconciled the elder man to this strange music. To Liszt, the preludes seem modestly named, but, quote, are not the less types of perfection in a mode created by himself, and stamped, like all his other works, with the high impress of his poetic genius. Written in the commencement of his career, they are characterized by a youthful vigor not to be found in some of his subsequent works, even when more elaborate, finished, and richer in combinations, a vigor which is entirely lost in his latest productions, marked by an overexcited sensibility, a morbid irritability, and giving painful imitations of his own state of suffering and exhaustions. Unquote. Liszt, as usual, erred on the sentimental side. Chopin, being essentially a man of moods, like many great men, and not necessarily feminine in this respect, cannot always be pinned down to any particular period. Several of the preludes are very morbid. I purposely use this word, as is some of his early music, while he seems quite gay just before his death. The preludes follow out no technical idea, are free creations on a small basis, and exhibit the musician in all his versatility. Says Louis Elhert, quote, No work of Chopin's portrays his inner organization so faithfully and completely. Much is embryonic. It is as though he turned the leaves of his fancy without completely reading any page. Still, one finds in them the thundering power of the scherzi, the half-satirical, half-coquettish elegance of the mazurkas, and the southern, luxuriously fragrant breath of the nocturnes. Often it is as though they were small falling stars dissolved into tones as they fall. Unquote. Jean Klixensky, who is credited with understanding Chopin, himself a Pole and a pianist, thinks that, quote, people have gone too far in seeking in the preludes for traces of that misanthropy, of that weariness of life to which he was prey during his stay in the island of Majorca. Very few of the preludes present this character of ennui, and that which is the most marked, the second one, must have been written, according to Count Tarnowski, a long time before he went to Majorca. What is there to say concerning the other preludes, full of good humor and gaiety? Number 18 in E-flat, number 21 in B-flat, number 23 in F, or the last in D minor. Is it not strong and energetic, concluding as it does with three cannon shots? Willoughby, in his Frédéric Francois Chopin, considers at length the preludes. He agrees in the main with Niecks, that certain of these compositions were written at Valdemosa, numbers 4, 6, 9, 13, 20, and 21. 
and that chopin having sketches of others with him completed the whole there and published them under one opus number Quote, the atmosphere of those i have named is morbid and exotic and to them there clings a faint flavor of disease a something which is overripe in its lusciousness and furbile in its passion this in itself inclines me to believe they were written at the time named Unquote. this is all very well but Chopin was faint and febrile in his music before he went to Majorca, and the plain facts adduced by Gutmann and Niecks cannot be passed over. Henry James, an old admirer of Madame Sand, admits her utter unreliability, and so we may look upon her evidence as romantic but by no means infallible. The case now stands. Chopin may have written a few of the preludes at Majorca, filed them, finished them, but the majority of them were in his portfolio in 1837 and 1838. Opus 45, a separate prelude in C-sharp minor, was published in December 1841. It was composed at Nohant in August of that year. It is dedicated to Mademoiselle la Princesse Elizabeth Szczenchev, whose name, as Chopin confesses in a letter, he knows not how to spell. Theodore Kulak is curt and pedagogic in his preface to the Preludes. He writes, Chopin's genius nowhere reveals itself more charmingly than within narrowly bounded musical forms. The Preludes are, in their aphoristic brevity, masterpieces of the first rank. Some of them appear like briefly sketched mood pictures related to the nocturne style, and offer no technical hindrance even to the less advanced player. I mean numbers four, six, seven, nine, fifteen, and twenty. More difficult are numbers seventeen, twenty-five, and eleven, without, however, demanding eminent virtuosity. The other preludes belong to a species of character etude. Despite their brevity of outline, they are on a par with the great collections Opus Ten and Opus Twenty-five. In so far as it is practicable, special cases of individual endowments not being taken into consideration i would propose the following order of succession begin with numbers one fourteen ten twenty two twenty three three and eighteen very great bravura is demanded by numbers twelve eight sixteen and twenty four the difficulty of the other preludes numbers two five thirteen nineteen and twenty one lies in the delicate piano and legato technique which on account of the extended position leaps and double notes presupposes a high degree of development this is eminently a common sense grouping the first prelude which like the first etude begins in c has all the characteristics of an impromptu we know the wonderful bach preludes which grew out of a free improvisation to a collection of dance forms called a suite and the preludes which precede his fugues. In the latter, Bach sometimes exhibits all the objectivity of the study or toccata, and often wears his heart in full view. Chopin's preludes, the only preludes to be compared to Bach's, are largely personal, subjective, and intimate. This first one is not Bachian, yet it could have been written by no one but a devout Bach student. The pulsating, passionate, agitated, feverish, hasty qualities of the piece are modern. So is the change from modulation. It is a beautiful composition, rising to no dramatic heights, but questioning and full of life. Kleindworth writes in triplet groups, Kulak in quintolets. Bretkopf and Hartel do not. Dr. Hugo Riemann, who has edited a few of the preludes, phrases the first bars thus musical excerpt desperate and exasperating to the nerves is the second prelude in a minor it is an asymmetric tune chopin seldom wrote ugly music but is this not ugly forlorn despairing almost grotesque and discordant it indicates the deepest depression in its sluggish snake-like progression willoughby finds a resemblance to the theme of the first nocturne and such a theme. The tonality is vague, beginning in E minor. Chopin's method of thematic parallelism is here very clear. A small figure is repeated in descending key until hopeless gloom and depraved melancholy are reached in the closing chords. 
Chopin now is morbid. Here are all his most antipathetic qualities. There is aversion to life. In this music he is a true lycanthrope. A self-induced hypnosis, a mental and emotional atrophy are all present. Kulak divides the accompaniment, difficult for small hands, between the two. Riemann detaches the eighth notes of the bass figures, as is his wont for greater clearness. Like Klingwerth, he accents heavily the final chords. He marks his metronome fifty to the half note. All the additions are lento with alla brevi. That the preludes are a sheaf of moods, loosely held together by a rather vague title, is demonstrated by the third, in the key of G. The rippling, rain-like figure for the left hand is in the nature of a study. The melody is delicate in sentiment, Gaelic in a spirit. A true salon piece, this prelude has no hint of artificiality. It is a precise antithesis to the mood of the previous one. Graceful and gay, the G major prelude is a fair reflex of Chopin's sensitive and naturally buoyant nature. It requires a light hand and nimble fingers. The melodic idea requires no special comment. Kulak phrases it differently from Riemann and Klindworth. The latter is preferable. Klindworth gives 72 to the half note as his metronomic marking. Riemann only 60, which is too slow, while Klindworth contents himself by marking a simple vivace. Regarding the fingering, one may say that all tastes are pleased in these three editions. Clean verse is the easiest. Riemann breaks up the phrase in the bass figure, but I cannot see the gain on the musical side. Niecks truthfully calls the fourth prelude in E minor, quote, a little poem, the exquisitely sweet, languid pensiveness of which defies description. The composer seems to be absorbed in the narrow sphere of his ego from which the wide, noisy world is for the time shut out." Unquote. Willoughby finds this prelude to be, quote, one of the most beautiful of these spontaneous sketches, for they are no more than sketches. The melody seems literally to wail, and reaches its greatest pitch of intensity at the stretto. Unquote. For Karasowski it is a, quote, real gem, and alone would immortalize the name of Chopin as a poet. Unquote. It must have been this number that impelled Rubinstein to assert that the preludes were the pearls of his works. In the Klindworth edition, fifth bar from the last, the editor has filled in the harmonies to the first six notes of the left hand, added thirds, which is not reprehensible, although uncalled for. Kulak makes some new dynamic markings and several enharmonic changes. He also gives as metronome 69 to the quarter. This tiny prelude contains wonderful music. The grave reiteration of the theme may have suggested to Peter Cornelius his song, In Tone. Chopin expands a melodic unit, and one singularly pathetic. The whole is like some canvas by Rembrandt, Rembrandt, who first dramatized the shadow in which a single motif is powerfully handled, some somber effect of echoing light in the profound of a Dutch interior. For background, Chopin has substituted his soul. No one in art, except Bach or Rembrandt, could paint as Chopin did in this composition. Its despair has the antique flavor, and there is a breadth, nobility, and proud submission, quite free from the tortured, whimpering complaint of the second prelude. The picture is small, but the subject looms large in meanings. The fifth prelude, in D, is Chopin at his happiest. Its aberesque pattern conveys a most charming content, and there is a dewy freshness, a joy in life, that puts to flight much of the morbid tittle-tattle about Chopin's sickly soul. The few bars of this prelude, so seldom heard in public, reveal musicianship of the highest order. The harmonic scheme is intricate. Klindworth phrases the first four bars so as to bring out the alternate B and B-flat. It is Chopin spinning his finest, his most iridescent web. The next prelude, the sixth, in B minor, is doleful, pessimistic. As George Sand says, quote, it precipitates the soul into frightful depression, unquote. It is the most frequently played, and oh, how meaninglessly, prelude of the set, this and the one in D flat. 
classical in its repression of feeling, its pure contour. The echo effect is skillfully managed, monotony being artfully avoided. Kleinwerth rightfully slurs the duple group of eighths. Kulak tries for the same effect by different means. The duality of the voices should be clearly expressed. The tempo, marked in both editions, lento assai, is fast. To be precise, Kleinwerth gives sixty-six to the quarter. The plaintive little mazurka of two lines, the seventh prelude, is a mere silhouette of the national dance. Yet in its measures is compressed all Mazovia. Kleinwerth makes a variant in the fourth bar from the last, a G-sharp instead of an F-sharp. It is a more piquant climax, perhaps not admissible to the Chopin purist. In the F-sharp minor prelude, number eight, Chopin gives us a taste of his grand manner. For Niecks, the piece is jerky and agitated, and doubtless suggests a mental condition bordering on anxiety. But if frenzy there is, it is kept well in check by the exemplary taste of the composer. The sadness is rather elegiac, remote, and less poignant than the E minor prelude. Harmonic heights are reached on the second page. Surely Wagner knew these bars when he wrote Tristan and Isolde while the ingenuity of the figure and avoidance of rhythmical monotone are evidences of chopin's feeling for the decorative it is a masterly prelude Kleinwerth accents the first of the bass triplets and makes an unnecessary enharmonic change at the sixth and seventh lines there is a measure of grave content in the ninth prelude in e it is rather gnomic and contains hints of both brahms and beethoven it has an ethical quality, but that may be because of its churchly rhythm and color. The C-sharp minor prelude, number 10, must be the, quote, eagle's wings of Schumann's critique. There is a flash of steel gray, deepening into black, and then the vision vanishes, as though some huge bird aloft had plunged down through blazing sunlight, leaving a color echo in the void as it passed to its quarry. Or, to be less figurative, this prelude is a study in arpeggio, with double notes interspersed, and is too short to make more than a vivid impression. Number 11 in B is all too brief. It is vivacious, dolce indeed, and most cleverly constructed. Kleinwerth gives a more blinding character of the first double notes. Quote, Another gleam of the Chopin sunshine. Unquote. Storm clouds gather in the G-sharp minor, the twelfth prelude, so unwittingly imitated by Grieg in his minuetto of the same key, and in its driving presto we feel the passionate clench of Chopin's hand. It is convulsed with woe, but the intellectual grip, the self-command are never lost in these two pages of perfect writing. The figure is suggestive, and there is a well-defined technical problem as well as a psychical character. Disputed territory is here. The editors do not agree about the twelfth and eleventh bars from the last. According to Brett Kopf and Hartel, the bass octaves are E both times. Mikuli gives G-sharp the first time instead of E. Kleinwerth, G-sharp the second time, Riemann, E, and also Kulak. The G-sharp seems more various. In the thirteenth prelude, F-sharp major, there is lovely atmosphere, pure and peaceful. The composer has found mental rest. Exquisitely poised are his pinions for flight, and in the pilento he wheels significantly and majestically about in the blue. The return to earth is the signal for some strange modulatory tactics. It is an impressive close. Then, almost without pause, the blood begins to boil in this fragile man's veins. His pulse beat increases and with stifled rage he rushes into the battle. In the fourteenth prelude, in the sinister key of E-flat minor, and its heavy, sullen arch triplets recalls for Niecks the last movement of the B-flat minor sonata. But there is less interrogation in the prelude, less sophistication, and the heat of the conflict over it all. There is not a break in the clouds until the beginning of the fifteenth, the familiar prelude in D-flat. This must be George Sand's, quote, Some of them create such vivid impressions that the shades of dead monks seem to rise and pass before the hearer in solemn and gloomy funeral pomp. Unquote. 
the work needs no program its serene beginning lugubrious interlude with the dominant pedal never ceasing a basso ostinato gives color to Clexensi's contention that the prelude in b minor is a mere sketch of the idea fully elaborated in number fifteen Quote, the foundation of the picture is the drops of rain falling at regular intervals Unquote. the echo principle again which by their continual patter bring the mind to a state of sadness a melody full of tears is heard through the rush of the rain then passing to the key of c-sharp minor it rises from the depths of the bass to a prodigious crescendo indicative of the terror which nature in its deathly aspect excites in the heart of man here again the form does not allow the ideas to become too somber notwithstanding the melancholy which seizes you a feeling of tranquil grandeur revives you to Niecks, the c-sharp minor portion affects one as in an oppressive dream Quote, the reutterance of the opening d flat which dispels the dreadful nightmare comes upon one with the smiling freshness of dear familiar nature Unquote. the prelude has a nocturnal character it has become slightly banal from frequent repetition likewise the c-sharp minor study in opus twenty five but of its beauty balance and exceeding chastity there can be no doubt the architecture is at once Greek and Gothic. The sixteenth prelude in the relative key of B-flat minor is the boldest of the set. Its scale figures, seldom employed by Chopin, boil and glitter, the thematic thread of the idea never being quite submerged. Fascinating, full of perilous acclivities and sudden treacherous descents, this most brilliant of preludes is Chopin in riotous spirits he plays with the keyboard it is an avalanche anon a cascade then a swift stream which finally after mounting to the skies descends to an abyss full of imaginative lift caprice and stormy dynamics this prelude is the darling of the virtuoso its pregnant introduction is like a madly jutting rock from which the eagle spirit of the composer precipitates itself in the twenty-third bar there is a curious editorial discrepancy. Klindworth uses an A natural in the first of the four groups of sixteenths, Kulak a B natural. Riemann follows Kulak. Nor is this all. Kulak in the second group, right hand, has an E flat, Klindworth a D natural, which is correct. Klindworth's texture is more closely chromatic and it sounds better, the chromatic parallelism being more carefully preserved yet i fancy that kulak has tradition on his side the seventeenth prelude niecks finds mendelssohnian i do not it is suave sweet well developed yet chopin to the core and its harmonic life surprisingly rich and novel the mood is one of tranquillity the soul loses itself in early autumnal reverie while there is yet splendor on earth and in the skies Full of tonal contrasts, this highly finished composition is grateful to the touch. The eleven booming A-flats on the last page are historical. Klindworth uses a B-flat instead of a G at the beginning of the melody. It is logical, but is it Chopin? The fiery recitatives of number 18 in F minor are a glimpse of Chopin, muscular and not hectic. In these editions you will find three different groupings of the cadenzas. It is Riemann's opportunity for pedagogic editing, and he does not miss it. In the first long-breathed group of twenty-two sixteenth notes, he phrases as shown on the following page. It may be noticed that Riemann even changes the arrangement of the bars. This prelude is dramatic almost to an operatic degree, sonorous, rather grandiloquent, it is a study in declamation, the declamation of the slow movement in the F minor concerto. Schumann may have had the first phrase in his mind when he wrote in his Aufschwung. This page is Chopin's, the torse of a larger idea, in nobly rhetorical. Musical excerpt. What piano music is the nineteenth prelude in E flat? its widely dispersed harmonies its murmuring grace and june-like beauty are they not chopin the chopin we best love 
he is ever the necromancer ever invoking phantoms but with its whirling melody and furtive caprice this particular shape is an alluring one and difficult it is to interpret with all its plangent lyric freedom number twenty in c minor contains in its thirteen bars the sorrows of a nation it is without doubt a sketch for a funeral march and of it george sand must have been thinking when she wrote that one prelude of chopin contained more music than all the trumpetings of meyerbeer of exceeding loveliness is the b flat major prelude number twenty one it is superior in content and execution to most of the nocturnes in feeling it belongs to that form the melody is enchanting the accompaniment figure shows inventive genius Klindworth employs a short appoggiatura kulak the long in the second bar judge of what is true editorial sialism when i tell you that riemann who evidently believes in a rigid melodic structure has inserted an e-flat at the end of bar four thus maiming the tender elusive quality of chopin's theme this is cruelly pedantic the prelude arrests one in ecstasy the fixed period of contemplation of the saint or the hypnotized sets in and the awakening is almost painful chopin adopting the relative minor key as a pendant to the picture in b flat thrills the nerves by a bold dissonance in the next prelude number twenty two again concise paragraphs filled with the smoke of revolt and conflict the impetuosity of this largely molded piece in g minor its daring harmonics read the seventeenth and eighteenth bars and dramatic note make it an admirable companion to the prelude in f minor technically it serves as an octave study for the left hand in the concluding bar but one chopin has in the f major prelude attempted a most audacious feat in harmony an e flat in the bass of the third group of sixteenths leaves the whole composition floating enigmatically in thin air it deliciously colors the close leaving a sense of suspense of anticipation which is not tonally realized for the succeeding number is in a widely divorced key but it must have pressed hard the philistines and this prelude the twenty-third is fashioned out of the most volatile stuff aerial imponderable and like a sun-shot spider-web oscillating in the breeze of summer its hues change at every puff it is in extended harmonics and must be delivered with spirituality the horny hand of the toilsome pianist would shatter the delicate swinging fantasy of the poet kulak points out a variant in the fourteenth bar g instead of b natural being used by riemann klindworth prefers the latter we have reached the last prelude of opus twenty eight in d minor it is sonorously tragic troubled by fevers and visions and capricious irregular and massive in design it may be placed among chopin's greater works the two etudes in c minor the a minor and the f sharp minor prelude the bass requires an unusual span and the suggestion by kulak that the thumb of the right hand may eke out the weakness of the left is only for the timid and the small of fist but i do not counsel following his two variants in the fifth and twenty-third bars chopin's text is more telling like the vast reverberation of monstrous waves on the implacable coast of a remote world is this prelude despite its fatalistic ring its note of despair is not dispiriting its issues are larger more impersonal more elemental than the other preludes it is a veritable appassionata but its theatre is cosmic and no longer behind the closed doors of the cabinet of chopin's soul the seal and shry of stanislaw Presbyzewski is here explosions of wrath and revolt not chopin suffers but his countrymen klecksinski speaks of the three tones at the close they are the final clangor of oppressed almost overthrown reason after the subject reappears in c minor there is a shift to d flat and for a moment a point of repose is gained but this elusive rest is brief the theme reappears in the tonic and in octaves and the tension becomes too great the accumulated passion discharges and dissolves in a fierce gust of double chromatic thirds and octaves powerful repellent 
this prelude is almost infernal in its pride and scorn but in it I discern no vestige of uncontrolled hysteria. It is well nigh as strong, rank, and human as Beethoven. The various editorial phraseology is not of much moment. Riemann uses thirty-second notes for the cadenzas, Kulak eighths, and Klingwerth sixteenths. Niecks writes of the prelude in C-sharp minor, opus 45, that it, quote, deserves its name better than almost any one of the twenty-four. Still, I would rather call it improvisata. It seems unpremeditated, a heedless outpouring, when sitting at the piano in a lonely, dreary hour, perhaps in the twilight. The quaver figure rises aspiringly, and the sustained parts swell out proudly. The piquant cadenza forestalls in the progression of diminished chords, favorite effects of some of our most modern composers. The modulation from C sharp minor to D major and back again, after the cadenza, is very striking and equally beautiful. Elsewhere I have called attention to the Brahmsian coloring of this prelude. Its mood is fugitive and hard to hold after capture. Recondite it is, and not music for the multitude. Niecks does not think Chopin created a new type in the preludes. Quote, they are too unlike each other in form and character. Unquote. Yet notwithstanding the fleeting, evanescent moods of the preludes, there is designedly a certain unity of feeling and contrasted tonalities, all being grouped in approved Bachian manner. This may be demonstrated by playing them through at a sitting, which Arthur Friedheim, the Russian virtuoso, did in a concert with excellent effect. As if wishing to exhibit his genius in perspective, Chopin carved these cameos with exceeding fineness, exceeding care. In a few of them the idea overbalances the form, but the greater number are exquisite examples of a just proportion of manner and matter, a true blending of voice and vision. Even in the more microscopic ones the tracery, echoing like the spirals in strange seashells, is marvelously measured. Much in miniature are these sculptured preludes of the Polish poet. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. Chopin, The Man and His Music, by James Honecker. Chapter Eight, Impromptus and Valses. To write of the four impromptus in their own key of unrestrained feeling and pondered intention would not be as easy as recapturing the first careless rapture of the lark. With all the freedom of an improvisation, the Chopin impromptu has a well-defined form. There is structural impulse, although the patterns are free and original. The mood color is not much varied in three, the first, third, and fourth, but in the second there is a ballade-like quality that hints of the tragic. The A-flat impromptu, opus 29, is, if one is pinned down to the title, the happiest named of the set. Its seething, prankish, nimble, bubbling quality is indicated from the start. The D-natural in the treble against the C and E-flat, the dominant, in the bass, is a most original effect and the flowing triplets of the first part of this piece give a ductile, gracious, high-bred character to it. The chromatic involutions are many and interesting. When the F minor part is reached the ear experiences the relief of a strongly contrasted rhythm. The simple dupla measure, so naturally ornamented, is nobly, broadly melodious. After the return of the first dimpling theme there is a short coda, a chiaroscura, and then with a few chords the composition goes to rest. A bird flew that way. Rubato should be employed, for as Klesinski says, here everything totters from foundation to summit, and everything is, nevertheless, so beautiful and so clear. But only an artist with velvety fingers should play this sounding arabesque. 
There is more limpidezza, more pure grace of line in the first impromptu than in the second in F-sharp, op. 36. Here symmetry is abandoned, as Kulak remarks, but the compensation of intenser emotional issues is offered. There is something sphinx-like in the pose of this work. Its nocturnal beginning with the carillon-like bass, a bass that ever recalls to me the faint buried tones of Hauptmann's sunken bell, the sweetly grave close of the section, the faint hoof-beats of an approaching cavalcade, with the swelling thunders of its passage, surely suggests a narrative, a programme. After the D major episode there are two bars of anonymous modulation. These bars creak on their hinges, and the first subject reappears in F, then climbs to F-sharp, thence merges into a glittering melodic organ-point, exciting, brilliant, the whole subsiding into an echo of earlier harmonies. The final octaves are marked fortissimo, which always seems brutal. Yet its logic lies in the scheme of the composer. Perhaps he wished to arouse us harshly from his dreamland, as was his habit while improvising for friends. A glissando would send them home shivering after an evening of delicious reverie. Niecks finds this impromptu lacking the pith of the first. To me it is of more moment than the other three. It is irregular and wavering in outline, the moods are wandering and capricious, yet who dares deny its power, its beauty? In its use of accessory figures it does not reveal so much ingenuity, but just because the figure in the carpet is not so varied in pattern, its passion is all the deeper. It is another ballade, sadder, more meditative of the tender grace of vanished days. The third impromptu in G-flat, op. 51, is not often played. It may be too difficult for the vandal with an average technique, but it is neither so fresh in feeling nor so spontaneous in utterance as its companions. There is a touch of the faded, blasé, and it is hardly healthy in sentiment. Here are some ophidian curves and triplets, as in the first impromptu, but with interludes of double notes in colouring tropical and rich to morbidity. The E-flat minor trio is a fine bit of melodic writing. The absence of simplicity is counterbalanced by greater freedom of modulation and complexity of pattern. The impromptu flavour is not missing, and there is allied to delicacy of design a strangeness of sentiment, that strangeness which Edgar Poe declared should be a constituent element of all great art. The Fantasie Impromptu in C-sharp minor, op. 66, was published by Fontana in 1855, and it is one of the few posthumous works of Chopin worthy of consideration. It was composed about 1834. A true impromptu, but the title of Fantasie given by Fontana is superfluous. The piece presents difficulties, chiefly rhythmical. Its involuted first phrases suggest the Bellinian fioriture so dear to Chopin, but the D-flat part is without nobility. Here is the same kind of saccharine melody that makes mawkish the trio in the Marche Funèbre. There seems no danger that this fantaisie impromptu will suffer from neglect, for it is the joy of the piano student, who turns its presto into a slow, blurred mess of badly related rhythms, and its slower movement into a long-drawn, sentimental agony. But in the hands of a master, the C-sharp minor impromptu is charming, though not of great depth. The first impromptu, dedicated to Mademoiselle la Comtesse de Lobau, was published December 1837, the second May 1840, the third, dedicated to Madame la Comtesse Esterhazy, February 1843. Not one of these four impromptus is as naive as Schubert's. They are more sophisticated, and do not smell of nature and her simplicities. Of the Chopin valses it has been said that they are dances of the soul and not of the body. Their animated rhythms, insouciant airs, and brilliant coquettish atmosphere, the true atmosphere of the ballroom, seem to smile at Ellert's poetic exaggeration. The valses are the most objective of the Chopin works, and in few of them is there more than a hint of the sullen sargasson seas of the nocturnes and scherzi. Nietzsche's La Gaia Scienza, the gay science, is beautifully set forth in the fifteen Chopin valses. They are less intimate, in the psychic sense, but exquisite exemplars of social intimacy and aristocratic abandon. 
as Schumann declared, the dancers of these valses should be at least countesses. There is a high-bred reserve despite their intoxication, and never a hint of the brawling peasants of Beethoven, Grieg, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, and the rest. But little of Vienna is in Chopin. Around the measures of this most popular of dances he has thrown mystery, allurement, and in them secret whisperings and the unconscious sigh. It is going too far not to dance to some of this music, for it is putting Chopin away from the world he at times loved. Certain of the valses may be danced, the first, second, fifth, sixth, and a few others. The dancing would of necessity be more picturesque and less conventional than required by the average waltz, and there must be fluctuations of tempo, sudden surprises, and abrupt languors. The mazurkas and polonaises are danced to-day in Poland. Why not the valses? Chopin's genius reveals itself in these dance-forms, and their presentation should be not solely a psychic one. Kulak, stern old pedagogue, divides these dances into two groups, the first dedicated to terpsichore, the second a frame for moods. Chopin admitted that he was unable to play valses in the Viennese fashion, yet he has contrived to rival Strauss in his own genre. Some of these valses are trivial, artificial, most of them are bred of candlelight and the swish of silken attire, and a few are poetically morbid and stray across the border into the rhythms of the mazurka. All of them have been edited to death, reduced to the commonplace by vulgar methods of performance, but are altogether sprightly, delightful specimens of the composer's careless, vagrant, and happy moods. Kulak utters words of warning to the unquiet sex regarding the habitual neglect of the bass. It should mean something in valse tempo, but it usually does not. Nor need it be brutally banged. The fundamental tone must be cared for, the subsidiary harmonies lightly indicated. The rubato in the valses need not obtrude itself, as in the mazurkas. Opus 18 in E-flat was published in June 1834, and dedicated to Mademoiselle Laura Harford. It is a true ballroom picture, spirited and infectious in rhythms. Schumann wrote rhapsodically of it. The D-flat section has a tang of the later Chopin. There is bustle, even chatter, in this valse, which in form and content is inferior to Opus 34, number 1, A-flat. The three valses of this set were published December 1838. There are many editorial differences in the A-flat valse, owing to the careless way it was copied and pirated. Clindworth and Kulak are the safest for dynamic markings. This valse may be danced as far as its dithyrambic coda. Notice in this coda, as in many other places, the debt Schumann owes Chopin for a certain passage in the preambule of his Carnival. The next valse in A minor has a tinge of Sarmatian melancholy. Indeed, it is one of Chopin's most desponding moods. The episode in C rings of the mazurka, and the A major section is of exceeding loveliness. Its coda is characteristic. This valse is a favorite, and who need wonder? The F major valse, the last of this series, is a whirling wild dance of atoms. It has the perpetuum mobile quality, and older masters would have prolonged its giddy arabesques into pages of senseless spinning. It is quite long enough as it is. The second theme is better, but the appoggiatures are flippant. It buzzes to the finish. Of it is related that Chopin's cat sprang upon his keyboard, and in its feline flight gave him the idea of the first measures. I suppose, as there is a dog valse, there had to be one for the cat. But, as Rossini would have said, Sa son de Scarlatti. The A minor valse was, of the three, Chopin's favorite. When Stephen Heller told him that this too was his beloved valse, Chopin was greatly pleased, inviting the Hungarian composer, Nix relates, to luncheon at the Café Riche. Not improvised in the ballroom as the preceding, yet a marvellous epitome is the A flat valse, Opus 42, published July, 1840. It is the best rounded specimen of Chopin's experimenting with the form. The prolonged trill on the E-flat, summoning us to the ballroom, the suggestive intermingling of rhythms, duple and triple, the coquetry, hesitation, passionate avowal and the superb coda, with its echoes of evening, have not these episodes a charm beyond compare? Only Schumann, in certain pages of his carnival, seizes the secret of young life and love, but his is not so finished, so glowing a tableau. 
Regarding certain phrasing of this valse, Moritz Rosenthal wrote to the London Musical Standard, In music there is liberty and fraternity, but seldom equality, and in music social democracy has no voice. Notes have a right in the aftertone, nachton, and this right depends upon their role in the key. The Vorhalt, accented passing note, will always have an accent. On this point Riemann must without question be considered right. Likewise the feeling player will mark those notes that introduce the transition to another key. We will now consider our example and set down my accents. Musical score excerpt. In the first bar we have the tonic chord of its major key as bass, and are thus not forced to any accent. In the second bar we have the dominant harmony in the bass, and in the treble C, which falls upon the downbeat as Vorhalt to the next tone, B-flat, so it must be accented. Also in the fourth bar the B-flat is Vorhalt to the B-flat, and likewise requires an accent. In bars six, seven, and eight the notes, A-flat, B-flat, and C, are without doubt the characteristic ones of the passage, and the E-flat has in each case only a secondary significance. That a genius like Chopin did not indicate everything accurately is quite explainable. He flew where we merely limp after. Moreover these accents must be felt rather than executed, with softest touch, and as tenderly as possible. The D-flat valse, Le Valse du Petit Chien, is of Georges Sand's own prompting. One evening at her home in the Square d'Orléans she was amused by her little pet dog chasing its tail. She begged Chopin, her little pet pianist, to set the tail to music. He did so, and behold the world is richer for this piece. I do not dispute the story. It seems well grounded, but then it is so ineffably silly. The three valses of this Opus 64 were published September 1847, and are respectively dedicated to the Comtesse Delphine Potochka, the Baron Nathaniel de Rothschild, and the Baron Bronica. I shall not presume to speak of the execution of the D-flat valse. Like the rich, it is always with us. It is usually taken at a meaningless, rapid gait. I have heard it played by a genuine Chopin pupil, M. Georges Mathias, and he did not take it prestissimo. He ran up the D-flat scale, ending with a sforzato at the top, and gave a variety of nuance to the composition. The cantabile is nearly always delivered with sloppiness of sentiment. This valse has been served up in a highly indigestible condition for concert purposes by Tausig, Josephi, whose arrangement was the first to be heard here, Theodore Ritter, Rosenthal, and Isidore Philippe. The C-sharp minor valse is the most poetic of all. The first theme has never been exhaled by Chopin for a species of veiled melancholy. It is a fascinating, lyrical sorrow, and what Kulak calls the psychologic motivation of the first theme in the curving figure of the second does not relax the spell. A space of clearer skies, warmer, more consoling winds are in the D-flat interlude, but the spirit of unrest, ennui, returns. The elegic imprint is unmistakable in this soul dance. The A-flat valse which follows is charming. It is for superior souls who dance with intellectual joy, with the joy that comes of making exquisite patterns and curves. Out of the salon and from its brilliantly lighted spaces the dancers do not wander, do not dance into the darkness and churchyard, as Ellert imagines of certain other valses. The two valses in Opus 69, three valses, opus seventy, and the two remaining valses in E minor and E major, need not detain us. They are posthumous. The first of opus sixty-nine in F minor was composed in 1836, the B minor in 1829, G flat, opus seventy, in 1835, F minor in 1843, and D flat major, 1830. The E major and E minor were composed in 1829. Fontana gave these compositions to the world. The F minor valse, Opus 69, No. 1, has a charm of its own. Kulak prints the Fontana and Clindworth variants. This valse is suavely melancholy, but not so melancholy as the B minor of the same opus. It recalls in color the B minor mazurka. Very gay and sprightly is the G-flat valse, Opus 70, No. 1. The next in F minor has no special physiognomy, while the third in D-flat contains, as Niecks points out, germs of the Opus 42 and the Opus 34 valses. It recalls to me the D-flat study in the supplementary series. 
The E minor valse without opus is beloved. It is very graceful and not without sentiment. The major part is the early Chopin. The E major valse is published in the Mikuli edition. It is commonplace, hinting of its composer only in places. Thus ends the collection of valses, not Chopin's most signal success in art, but a success that has dignified and given beauty to this conventional dance form. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Chopin, The Man and His Music This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Smith Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Honecker Chapter 9 Night and Its Melancholy Mysteries, The Nocturnes here is the chronology of the nocturnes. Opus 9, Three Nocturnes, January 1833. Opus 15, Three Nocturnes, January 1834. Opus 27, Two Nocturnes, May 1836. Opus 32, Two Nocturnes, December 1837. Opus 37, Two Nocturnes, May 1840. Opus 48, Two Nocturnes, November 1841. Opus 55, Two Nocturnes, August 1844. Opus 62, Two Nocturnes, September 1846. In addition, there is a nocturne written in 1828 and published by Fontana with the opus number 72, number 2, and the lately discovered one in C-sharp minor, written when Chopin was young, and published in 1895. This completes the nocturne list, but following Niecks' system of formal grouping, I include the Berceurs and the Barcarolle as full-fledged specimens of nocturnes. John Field has been described as the forerunner of Chopin. The limpid style of this pupil and friend of Clementi, his beautiful touch and finished execution were certainly admired and imitated by the Pole. Fields' nocturnes are now neglected, so curious are time's caprices, and without warrant, for not only is Field the creator of the form, but in both his concertos and nocturnes he has written charming, sweet, and sane music. He rather patronized Chopin, for whose melancholy pose he had no patience. He has the talent of the hospital, growled Field, in the intervals between his wine-drinking, pipe-smoking, and the washing of his linen, the latter economical habit he contracted from Clementi. There is some truth in his stricture. Chopin, seldom exuberantly cheerful, is morbidly sad and complaining in many of the nocturnes. The most admired of his compositions, with the exception of the valses, they are in several instances his weakest. Yet he ennobled the form originated by Field, giving it dramatic breadth, passion, and even grandeur. Set against Field's naive and idyllic specimens, Chopin's efforts are often too bejeweled for true simplicity, too lugubrious, too tropical, Asiatic is a better word, and they have the exotic savour of the heated conservatory, and not the fresh scent of the flowers reared in the open by the less poetic Irishman. And then Chopin is so desperately sentimental in some of these compositions. They are not altogether to the taste of this generation. They seem to be suffering from anemia. However, there are a few noble nocturnes, and methods of performance may have much to answer for the sentimentalizing of some others. More vigour, a quickening of the time pulse, and a less languishing touch will rescue them from lush sentiment. Chopin loved the night and its soft mysteries as much as did Robert Louis Stevenson, and his nocturnes are true night pieces, some with agitated, remorseful countenance, others seen in profile only, while many are whisperings at dusk. Most of them are called feminine, a term psychologically false. The poetic side of men of genius is feminine, and, in Chopin, the feminine note was overemphasized. At times it was almost hysterical, particularly in these nocturnes. 
the scotch have a proverb she wove her shroud and wore it in her lifetime in the nocturnes the shroud is not far away chopin wove his to the day of his death and he wore it sometimes but not always as many think one of the most elegiac of his nocturnes is the first in b flat minor it is one of three opus nine dedicated to madame camille Pleyel. of far more significance than its two companions it is for some reason neglected while i am far from agreeing with those who hold that in the early chopin all his genius was completely revealed yet this nocturne is as striking as the last for it is at once sensuous and dramatic melancholy and lovely emphatically a mood it is best heard on a grey day of the soul when the times are out of joint its silken tones will bring a triste content as they pour out upon one's hearing the second section in octaves is of exceeding charm as a melody it has all the lurking voluptuousness and mystic crooning of its composer there is flux and reflux throughout passion peeping out in the coda the e flat nocturne is graceful shallow of content but if it is played with purity of touch and freedom from sentimentality it is not nearly so banal as it usually seems it is field-like therefore play it as did rubinstein in a field-like fashion hado calls attention to the remote and recondite modulations in the twelfth bar the chromatic double notes for him they only are one real modulation the rest of the passage is an iridescent play of colour an effect of superficies not an effect of substance it was the e-flat nocturne that unloosed relstab's critical wrath in the iris of it he wrote where field smiles chopin makes a grinning grimace where field sighs chopin groans where field shrugs his shoulders chopin twists his whole body where field puts some seasoning into the food chopin empties a handful of cayenne pepper in short if one holds field's charming romances before a distorting concave mirror so that every delicate impression becomes a coarse one one gets chopin's work we implore mr chopin to return to nature relstab might have added that while field was often commonplace chopin never was rather is to be preferred the sound judgment of j w davison the english critic and husband of the pianist arabella goddard of the early works he wrote commonplace is instinctively avoided in all the works of chopin a stale cadence or a trite progression a humdrum subject or a worn-out passage a vulgar twist of the melody or a hackneyed sequence a meagre harmony or an unskilful counterpoint may in vain be looked for throughout the entire range of his compositions the prevailing characteristics of which are a feeling as uncommon as beautiful a treatment as original as felicitous a melody and a harmony as new fresh vigorous and striking as they are utterly unexpected and out of the original track in taking up one of the works of chopin you are entering as it were a fairyland untrodden by human footsteps a path hitherto unfrequented but by the great composer himself gracious even coquettish is the first part of the b major nocturne of this opus well knit the passionate intermezzo has the true dramatic chopin ring it should be taken a la breve the ending is quite effective i do not care much for the f major nocturne opus fifteen number one the opus is dedicated to ferdinand hiller Ehlert speaks of the ornament in triplets with which he brushes the theme as with the gentle wings of a butterfly and then discusses the artistic value of the ornament which may be so profitably studied in the chopin music from its nature the ornament can only beautify the beautiful music like chopin's with its predominating elegance could not forego ornament but surely he did not purchase it of a jeweller 
he designed it himself with a delicate hand. He was the first to surround a note with diamond facets and to weave the rushing floods of his emotions with the silver beams of the moonlight. In his nocturnes there is a glimmering as of distant stars. From these dreamy heavenly gems he has borrowed many a line. The Chopin nocturne is a dramatized ornament. And why may not art speak for once in such symbols? In the much-admired F-sharp major nocturne, the principal theme makes its appearance so richly decorated that one cannot avoid imagining that his fancy confined itself to the arabesque form for the expression of its poetical sentiments. Even the middle part borders upon what I should call the tragic style of ornament. The ground thought is hidden behind a dense veil, but a veil, too, can be an ornament. In another place, Eilhert thinks that the F-sharp major nocturne seems inseparable from champagne and truffles. It is certainly more elegant and dramatic than the one in F major which precedes it. That, with the exception of the middle part in F minor, is weak, although rather pretty and confiding. The F-sharp nocturne is popular, the doppio movimento is extremely striking, and the entire piece is saturated with young life, love, and feelings of goodwill to men. Read Klesinski. The third nocturne of the three is in G minor, and contains some fine picturesque writing. Kulak does not find in it aught of the fantastic. The languid, earth-weary voice of the opening, and the churchly refrain of the chorale, is not this fantastic contrast? This nocturne contains in solution all that Chopin developed later in a nocturne of the same key. But I think the first stronger. Its lines are simpler, more primitive, its colouring less complicated, yet quite as rich and gloomy. Of it, Chopin said, after Hamlet, but changed his mind. Let them guess for themselves, was his sensible conclusion. Kulak's programme has a conventional ring. It is the lament for the beloved one, the lost Lenore, with the consolation of religion thrown in. The bell tones of the plain chant bring to my mind little that consoles, although the piece ends in the major mode. It is like Poe's Ulalum, a complete and tiny tone poem. Rubinstein made much of it. In the fourth bar, and for three bars, there is a held note F, and I heard the Russian virtuoso, by some miraculous means, keep this tone prolonged. The tempo is abnormally slow, and the tone is not in a position where the sustaining pedal can sensibly help it. Yet, under Rubinstein's fingers, it swelled and diminished, and went singing into D, as if the instrument were an organ. I suspected the inaudible changing of fingers on the note or a sustaining pedal. It was wonderfully done. The next nocturne, opus 27, number 1, brings us before a masterpiece. With the possible exception of the C minor nocturne, this one, in the sombre key of C sharp minor, is the great essay in the form. Klesinski finds it a description of a calm night at Venice, where, after a scene of murder, the sea closes over a corpse and continues to serve as a mirror to the moonlight. This is melodramatic. Willoughby analyzes it at length with the scholarly fervor of an English organist. He finds the accompaniment to be mostly on a double pedal and remarks that higher art than this one could not have if simplicity of means be a factor of high art. The wide-meshed figure of the left hand supports a morbid, persistent melody that grates on the nerves. From the piu mosso the agitation increases, and here let me call to your notice the Beethovenish quality of these bars, which continue until the change of signature. There is a surprising climax followed by sunshine and favour in the D-flat part, then after mounting dissonances, a bold succession of octaves returns to the feverish plaint of the opening. Kulak speaks of a resemblance to Meerbeer's song, Le Moine. The composition reaches exalted states. 
its psychological tension is so great at times as to border on a pathological condition. There is unhealthy power in this nocturne, which is seldom interpreted with sinister subtlety. Henry T. Fink rightfully thinks it embodies a greater variety of emotion and more genuine dramatic spirit on four pages than many operas on four hundred. The companion picture in D-flat, opus 27, number 2, has, as Karasowski writes, a profusion of delicate fioriture. It really contains but one subject, and is a song of the sweet summer of two souls, for there is obvious meaning in the duality of voices. Often heard in the concert room, this nocturne gives us a surfeit of sixths and thirds of elaborate ornamentation and monotone of mood. Yet it is a lovely, imploring melody, and harmonically most interesting. A curious marking, and usually overlooked by pianists, is the crescendo and con forza of the cadenza. This is obviously erroneous. The theme, which occurs three times, should first be piano, then pianissimo, and lastly forte. This opus is dedicated to the Comtesse de Pogny. The best part of the next nocturne, B major, opus 32, number one, dedicated to Madame de Billing, is the coda. It is in the minor, and is like the drumbeat of tragedy. The entire ending, a stormy recitative, is in stern contrast to the dreamy beginning. Kulak, in the first bar of the last line, uses a G. Fontana, F-sharp, and Klindworth, the same as Kulak. The nocturne that follows in A-flat is a reversion to the field type, the opening recalling that master's B-flat nocturne. The F minor section of Chopin's broadens out to dramatic reaches, but as an entirety, this opus is a little tiresome. Nor do I admire inordinately the nocturne in G major, opus 37, number 1. It has a complaining tone, and the choral is not noteworthy. This particular part, so Chopin's pupil Gutmann declared, is taken too slowly, the composer having forgotten to mark the increased tempo. But the Nocturne in G, opus 37, number 2, is charming. Painted with Chopin's most ethereal brush, without the cloying splendours of the one in D-flat, the double sixths, fourths and thirds are magically euphonious. The second subject, I agree with Karasowski, is the most beautiful melody Chopin ever wrote. It is in true Barcarolle vein, and most subtle are the shifting harmonic hues. Pianists usually take the first part too fast, the second too slowly, transforming this poetic composition into an etude. As Schumann wrote of this opus, the two nocturnes differ from his earlier ones, chiefly through greater simplicity of decoration and more quiet grace. We know Chopin's fondness in general for spangles, gold trinkets and pearls. He has already changed and grown older. Decoration he still loves, but it is of a more judicious kind, behind which the nobility of the poetry shimmers through with all the more loveliness. Indeed, taste, the finest, must be granted him. Both numbers of this opus are without dedication. They are the offspring of the trip to Majorca. Niecks, writing of the G major nocturne, adjures us not to tarry too long in the treacherous atmosphere of this capua. It bewitches and unmans. Kaczynski calls the one in G minor homesickness, while the celebrated nocturne in C minor is the tale of a still greater grief told in an agitated recitando, Celestial Harps. Ah, I hear the squeak of the old romantic machinery, come to bring one ray of hope which is powerless in its endeavour to calm the wounded soul, which sends forth to heaven a cry of deepest anguish. It doubtless has its despairing movement, this same nocturne in C minor, opus 48, number 1, but Karasowski is nearer right when he calls it broad and most imposing, with its powerful intermediate movement, 
a thorough departure from the nocturne style. Willoughby finds it sick and laboured, and even Niecks does not think it should occupy a foremost place among its companions. The ineluctable fact remains that this is the noblest nocturne of them all. Biggest in conception, it seems a miniature music drama. It requires the grand manner to read it adequately, and the doppio movemento is exciting to a dramatic degree. I fully agree with Kulak that too strict adherence to the marking of this section produces the effect of an inartistic precipitation which robs the movement of clarity. Klesinski calls the work The Contrition of a Sinner and devotes several pages to its elucidation. De Lentz chats most entertainingly with Tausig about it. Indeed, an imposing march of splendour is the second subject in C. A fitting pendant is this work to the C-sharp minor nocturne. Both have the heroic quality, both are free from mawkishness, and are of the greater Chopin, the Chopin of the mode masculine. Niecks makes a valuable suggestion. In playing these nocturnes, Opus 48, there occurred to me a remark of Schumann's when he reviewed some nocturnes by Count Wielhorski. He said that the quick middle movements which Chopin frequently introduced into his nocturnes are often weaker than his first conceptions, meaning the first portions of his nocturnes. Now, although the middle part in the present instances are on the contrary slower movements, yet the judgment holds good, at least with respect to the first nocturne, the middle part of which has nothing to recommend it but a full, sonorous instrumentation, if I may use this word in speaking of one instrument. The middle part of the second, D-flat, molto più lento, however, is much finer. In it we meet again, as we did in some other nocturnes, with soothing, simple chord progressions. When Goodman studied the C-sharp minor nocturne with Chopin, the master told him that the middle section, the molto più lento in D-flat major, should be played as a recitative. A tyrant commands the first two chords, he said, and the other asks for mercy. Of course, Niecks means the F-sharp minor, not the C-sharp minor nocturne, opus 48, number 2, dedicated with the C minor to Mademoiselle L. Dupère. Opus 55, two nocturnes in F minor and E flat major, need not detain us long. The first is familiar. Plesinski devotes a page or more to its execution. He seeks to vary the return of the chief subject with nuances, as would an artistic singer the couplets of a classic song. There are cries of despair in it, but at last a feeling of hope. Kulak writes of the last measures, Thank God the goal is reached. It is the relief of a major key after prolonged wanderings in the minor. It is a nice nocturne, neat in its sorrow, yet not epoch-making. The one following has the impression of an improvisation. It also has the merit of being seldom heard. These two nocturnes are dedicated to Mademoiselle J. W. Sterling. Opus 62 brings us to a pair in B major and E major inscribed to Madame de Conneritz. The first, the tuberose nocturne, is faint with a sick, rich odour. The climbing trellis of notes that so unexpectedly leads to the tonic is charming, and the chief tune has a charm, a fruity charm. It is highly ornate, its harmonies dense, the entire surface overrun with wild ornamentation and a profusion of trills. The piece, the third of its sort in the key of B, is not easy. Metke gives the following explication of the famous chain trills. Musical score excerpt. Although this nocturne is luxuriant in style, it deserves warmer praise than is accorded it. Irregular as its outline is, its troubled lyrism is appealing, is melting, and the A-flat portion, with its hesitating, timid accents, has great power of attraction. The E major nocturne has a bardic ring. Its song is almost declamatory and not at all sentimental, unless so distorted, as Niecks would have us imagine. 
the intermediate portion is wavering and passionate like the middle of the f-sharp major nocturne it shows no decrease in creative vigor or lyrical fancy the Klindworth version differs from the original, as an examination of the following examples will show, the upper being Chopin's. Musical score excerpt. The posthumous nocturne in E minor, composed in 1827, is weak and uninteresting. Moreover, it contains some very un Chopin like modulations. The recently discovered nocturne in C sharp minor is hardly a treasure trove. It is vague and reminiscent. The following note was issued by its London publishers, Ascherberg and Company. The first question, suggested by the announcement of a new posthumous composition of Chopin's, will be, what proof is there of its authenticity? To musicians and amateurs who cannot recognize the beautiful nocturne in C-sharp minor as indeed the work of Chopin, it may in the first place be pointed out that the original manuscript, of which a facsimile is given on the title page, is in Chopin's well-known handwriting, and secondly, that the composition, which is strikingly characteristic, was at once accepted as the work of Chopin by the distinguished composer and pianist Balakirev, who played it for the first time in public at the Chopin commemoration concert, held in the autumn of 1894 at the Zelazoa Vola, and afterward at Warsaw. This nocturne was addressed by Chopin to his sister Louise at Warsaw in a letter from Paris, and was written soon after the production of the two lovely piano concertos, when Chopin was still a very young man. It contains a quotation from his most admired concerto in F minor, and a brief reference to the charming song known as The Maiden's Wish, two of his sister's favorite melodies. The manuscript of the Nocturne was supposed to have been destroyed in the sacking of the Zamoshki Palace at Warsaw toward the end of the insurrection of 1863, but it was discovered quite recently among papers of various kinds in the possession of a Polish gentleman, a great collector, whose son offered Mr. Polinski the privilege of selecting from such papers. His choice was three manuscripts of Chopin's, one of them being this Nocturne. A letter from Mr. Polinski on the subject of this nocturne is in the possession of Miss Janotha. Is this the nocturne of which Tausig spoke to his pupil Josephy as belonging to the master's best period, or did he refer to the one in E minor? The Bursar's Opus 57, published in June 1845 and dedicated to Mademoiselle Elise Gavard, is the very sophistication of the art of musical ornamentation. It is built on a tonic and dominant bass, the triad of the tonic and the chord of the dominant seventh. A rocking theme is set over this basso ostinato, and the most enchanting effects are produced. The rhythm never alters in the bass, and against this background, the monotone of a dark grey sky, the composer arranges an astonishing variety of fireworks, some florid, some subdued, but all delicate in tracery and design. Modulations from pigeon egg blue to Nile green, most misty and subtle modulations dissolve before one's eyes, and for a moment the sky is peppered with tiny stars in doubles, each independently tinted. Within a small segment of the chromatic bow, Chopin has imprisoned new, strangely dissonant colours. It is a miracle, and after the drawn-out chord of the dominant seventh and the rain of silvery fire ceases, one realises that the whole piece is a delicious illusion, but an ululation in the key of D-flat, the apotheosis of pyrotechnical colorature. Niex quotes Alexander Dumas fils, who calls the berceurs muted music, but introduces a Turkish bath comparison which crushes the sentiment. Mertke shows the original and Klindworth's reading of a certain part of the berceurs, adding a footnote to the examples. The Barcarolle, Op. 60, published in September 1846, is another highly elaborated work. Niex must be quoted here. One day, Tausig, the great piano virtuoso, promised W. de Lentz to play him Chopin's Barcarolle, adding, That is a performance which must not be undertaken before more than two persons. I shall play you my own self. I love the piece, but take it rarely. 
Lenz got the music, but it did not please him. It seemed to him a long movement in the nocturne style, a babel of figuration on a lightly laid foundation. But he found that he had made a mistake, and after hearing it played by Tausig, confessed that the virtuoso had infused into the nine pages of innovating music of one and the same long-breathed rhythm so much interest, so much motion, so much action, that he regretted the long piece was not longer. Tausig's conception of the Barcarolle was this. There are two persons concerned in the affair. It is a love scene in a discreet gondola. Let us say this mise-en-scene is the symbol of a lover's meeting generally. This is expressed in thirds and sixths. The dualism of two notes, persons, is maintained throughout. All is two-voiced, two-souled. In this modulation in C-sharp major, superscribed dolce sfogato, there are kiss and embrace. This is evident. When, after three bars of introduction, the theme, lightly rocking in the bass solo, enters in the fourth, this theme is nevertheless made use of throughout the whole fabric only as an accompaniment. And on this, the cantilena in two parts is laid. We have thus a continuous, tender dialogue. The Barcarolle is a nocturne painted on a large canvas with larger brushes. It has Italian colour in spots. Schumann said that melodically Chopin sometimes leans over Germany into Italy and is a masterly one in sentiment, pulsating with amorousness. To me, it sounds like a lament for the splendours now vanished of Venice the Queen. In bars 8, 9 and 10, counting backward, Louis Eilhert finds obscurities in the middle voices. It is dedicated to the Baron de Stockhausen. The nocturnes, including the Berceurs and Barcarolle, should seldom be played in public, and not the public of a large hall. Something of Chopin's delicate, tender warmth and spiritual voice is lost in larger spaces. In a small auditorium, and from the fingers of a sympathetic pianist, the nocturnes should be heard, that their intimate night side may be revealed. Many are like the music en sourdine of Paul Verlaine in his Chanson d'Automne, or Le Piano que baise une main frêle. They are essentially for the twilight, for solitary enclosures, where there's still mysterious tones, silent thunder in the leaves, as Yeats sings, become eloquent and disclose the poetry and pain of their creator. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Chopin, the Man and His Music」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chopin, the Man and His Music by James Huneker Chapter 10 The Ballades, Fairy Drama W. H. Haddo has said some pertinent things about Chopin in Studies in Modern Music, yet we cannot accept unconditionally his statement that, in structure, Chopin is a child playing with a few simple types and almost as helpless as soon as he advances beyond them. In phraseology, he is a master whose felicitous perfection of style is one of the abiding treasures of the art. Chopin, then, according to Haddo, is no builder of the lofty rhyme, but the poet of the single line, the maker of the phrase exquisite. This is hardly comprehensive. With the more complex classical types of the musical organism, Chopin had little sympathy, but he contrived nevertheless to write two movements of a piano sonata that are excellent. The first half of the B-flat minor sonata, the idealized dance forms he preferred, the Polonaise, Mazurka, and Valse were already there for him to handle, but the Ballade was not. Here he is not imitator, but creator. 
not loosely jointed but compact structures glowing with genius and presenting definite unity of form and expression are the ballades commonly written in six eight and six four time none of chopin's composition surpasses in masterliness of form and beauty and poetry of contents his ballades in them he attains the acme of his power as an artist remarks Neeks. I am ever reminded of Andrew Lang's lines, The Thunder and Surge of the Odyssey, when listening to the G minor ballade, Opus 23. It is the odyssey of Chopin's soul. That cello-like largo with its noiseless suspension stays us for a moment in the courtyard of Chopin's house beautiful. Then, told in his most dreamy tones, the legend begins. As in some fabulous tales of the genii, this ballade discloses surprising and delicious things. There is the tall lily in the fountain that nods to the sun. It drips in cadenced monotone, and its song is repeated on the lips of the slender-hipped girl with the eyes of midnight. And so might I weave for you a story of what I see in the ballade. And you would be aghast or puzzled. With such a composition, any program could be sworn to, even the silly story of the Englishman who haunted Chopin, beseeching him to teach him this ballade. That Chopin had a program, a definite one, there can be no doubt. But he has, wise artist, left us no clue beyond Miskiewicz, the Polish bard with Lithuanian poems. In Leipzig, Karasowski relates that when Schumann met Chopin, the pianist confessed having been incited to the creation of the ballades by the poetry of his fellow countrymen. The true narrative tone is in this symmetrically constructed ballade, the most spirited, most daring work of Chopin, according to Schumann. Louis Ehlert says of the four ballades, each one differs entirely from the others, and they have but one thing in common, their romantic working out and the nobility of their motives. Chopin relates in them, not like one who communicates something really experienced. It is though he told what never took place, but what has sprung up in his inmost soul the anticipation of something longed for. They may contain a strong element of national woe, much outwardly expressed and inwardly burning rage over the sufferings of his native land, yet they do not carry with a positive reality like that which in a Beethoven sonata will often call words to our lips. Which means that Chopin was not such a realist as Beethoven? Ehlert is one of the few sympathetic German Chopin commentators, yet he did not always indicate the salient outlines of his art. Only the Slav may hope to understand Chopin thoroughly. But these ballades are more truly touched by the universal than any other of his works. They belong as much to the world as to Poland. The G minor ballade after Konrad Wallenrod is a logical, well-knit, and largely planned composition. The closest parallelism may be detected in its composition of themes. Its second theme in E-flat is lovely in line, color, and sentiment. The return of the first theme in A minor and the quick answer in E of the second are evidences of Chopin's feeling for organic unity. Development, as in strict cyclic forms, there is not a little. After the cadenza, built on a figure of wavering tonality, a valse-like theme emerges and enjoys a capricious butterfly existence. It is fascinating. Passage work of an etherealized character leads to the second subject, now augmented and treated with a broad brush. The first questioning theme is heard again, and with a perpendicular roar the presto comes upon us. For two pages the dynamic energy displayed by the composer is almost appalling. A whirlwind, I have called it elsewhere. It is a storm of the emotions, muscular in its virility. I remember Dick Pachmann, a close interpreter of certain sides of Chopin, playing this coda piano, pianissimo, and prestissimo. The effect was strangely irritating to the nerves and reminded me of a tornado seen from the wrong end of an opera glass. According to his own lights, the Russian virtuoso was right. His strength was not equal to the task. And so, imitating Chopin, he topsy-turvied the shading. It recalled most Scholli's description of Chopin's playing. His piano is so softly breathed forth that he does not require any strong forte to produce the wished-for contrast. This G minor ballade was published in June 1836 and is dedicated to Baron Stockhausen. The last bar of the introduction has caused some controversy. 
Gutmann, Mikuli, and other pupils declare for the E flat. Kleindworth and Kulak use it. Xavier Sharvenka has seen fit to edit Kleindworth and gives a D natural in the Augener edition. That he is wrong, internal testimony abundantly proves. Even Willoughby, who personally prefers the D natural, thinks Chopin intended the E flat and quotes a similar effect 28 bars later. He might have added that the entire composition contains examples. Look at the first bar of the valse episode in the bass. As Niecks thinks, this dissonant E-flat may be said to be the emotional keynote of the whole poem. It is a questioning thought that, like a sudden pain, shoots through mind and body. There is other and more confirmatory evidence. Ferdinand von Inten, a New York pianist, saw the original Chopin manuscript at Stuttgart. It was the property of Professor Liebert, Levy, since deceased, and in it, without any question, stands the much-discussed E-flat. This testimony is final. The D-natural robs the bar of all meaning. It is insipid, colorless. Kulik gives 60 to the half-note at the moderato. On the third page, third bar, he uses F-natural in the treble. So does Kleindworth, although F-sharp may be found in some editions. On the last page, second bar, first line, Kulik writes the passage beginning with E-flat in eighth notes, Kleindworth in sixteenths. The close is very striking, full of the splendors of glancing scales and shrill octave progressions. It would inspire a poet to write words to it, said Robert Schumann. Perhaps the most touching of all that Chopin has written is the tale of the F major ballade. I have witnessed children lay aside their games to listen thereto. It appears like some fairy tale that has become music. The four-voiced part has such a clearness withal, it seems as if warm spring breezes were waving the lithe leaves of the palm tree. How soft and sweet a breath steals over the senses and the heart. And how difficult it seems to be to write of Chopin except in terms of impassioned prose. Louis Ehlert, a romantic in feeling and a classicist in theory, is the writer of the foregoing. The second ballade, although dedicated to Robert Schumann, did not excite his warmest praise. A less artistic work than the first, he wrote, but equally fantastic and intellectual. Its impassioned episodes seem to have been afterward inserted. I recollect very well that when Chopin played this ballade for me it finished in F major. It now closes in A minor. Willoughby gives its key as F minor. It is really in the keys of F major, A minor. Chopin's psychology was seldom at fault. A major ending would have crushed this extraordinary tone poem, written, Chopin admits, under the direct inspiration of Adam Miskiewicz's Le La de Willy. Willoughby accepts Schumann's dictum of the inferiority of this ballade to its predecessor. Niecks is quite justified in asking how Two such wholly dissimilar things can be compared and weighed in this fashion. In truth, they cannot. The second ballade possesses beauties in no way inferior to those of the first, he continues. What can be finer than the simple strains of the opening section? They sound as if they had been drawn from the people's storehouse of song. The entrance of the presto surprises and seems out of keeping with what precedes. But what we hear after the return of Tempo Primo the development of those simple strains, or rather the cogitations on them, justifies the presence of the presto. The second appearance of the latter leads to an urging restless coda in A minor, which closes in the same key and pianissimo with a few bars of the simple, serene, now-veiled first strain. Rubinstein bore great love for this second ballade. This is what it meant for him. Is it possible that the interpreter does not feel the necessity of representing to his audience a field flower caught by a gust of wind, a caressing of the flower by the wind, the resistance of the flower, the stormy struggle of the wind, the entreaty of the flower, which at last lies there broken, and paraphrased, the field flower a rustic maiden, the wind a knight? I can find no lack of affinity between the Andantino and Presto. The surprise is a dramatic one, withal rudely vigorous. Chopin's robust treatment of the first theme results in a strong piece of craftsmanship. The episodical nature of this ballad is the fruit of the esoteric moods of its composer. 
It follows a hidden story and has the quality, as the second impromptu in F sharp, of great unpremeditated art. It shocks one by its abrupt but by no means fantastic transitions. The key color is changeful, and the fluctuating themes are well contrasted. It was written at Majorca while the composer was only too noticeably disturbed in body and soul. Presto con fuoco, Chopin marks the second section. Kulik gives 84 to the quarter, and for the opening, 66 to the quarter. He also wisely marks crescendos in the bass at the first thematic development. He prefers the E, as does Kleindworth, nine bars before the return of the presto. At the eighth bar, after this return, Kulik adheres to the E instead of F at the beginning of the bar, treble clef. Kleindworth indicates both. Nor does Kulik follow Mikuli in using a D in the coda. He prefers a D-sharp instead of a natural. I wish the second ballade were played oftener in public. It is quite neglected for the third in A-flat, which, as Ehlert says, has the voice of the people. This ballade, the Undine of Miskiewicz, published November 1841 and dedicated to Mademoiselle P. de Noailles, is too well known to analyze. It is the schoolgirl's delight who familiarly toy with its demon, seeing only favor and prettiness in its elegant measures. In it, the refined, gifted Pole, who is accustomed to move in the most distinguished circles of the French capital, is preeminently to be recognized. Thus Schumann, forsooth, it is aristocratic, gay, graceful, piquant, and also something more. Even in its playful moments there is a delicate irony, a spiritual sporting with graver and more passionate emotions. Those broken octaves which usher in each time the second theme, with its fascinating, infectious, rhythmical lilt, what an ironically joyous Philip they give the imagination. A coquettish grace. If we accept by this expression that half-unconscious toying with the power that charms and fires, that follows up confession with reluctance, seems the very essence of Chopin's being, it becomes a difficult task to transcribe the easy transitions, full of an irresistible charm, with which he portrays love's game. Who will not recall the memorable passage in the A-flat ballade, where the right hand alone takes up the dotted eighths after the sustained chord of the sixth of A-flat? Could a lover's confusion be more deliciously enhanced by silence and hesitation? Ehlert above evidently sees a ballroom picture of brilliancy, with the regulation tender avowal. The episodes of this ballade are so attenuated of any grosser elements that none but psychical meanings should be read into them. The disputed passage is on the fifth page of the Kulik edition, after the trills. A measure is missing in Kulik, who, like Kleindworth, gives it a footnote. To my mind, this repetition adds emphasis, although it is a formal blur. And what an irresistible moment it is, this delightful territory, before the darker mood of the C-sharp minor part is reached. Neeks becomes enthusiastic over the insinuation and persuasion of this composition, the composer showing himself in a fundamentally caressing mood. The ease with which the entire work is floated proves that Chopin in mental health was not daunted by larger forms. There is moonlight in this music, and some sunlight too. The prevailing moods are coquetry and sweet contentment. Contrapuntal skill is shown in the working out section. Chopin always wears his learning lightly. It does not oppress us. The inverted dominant pedal in the C-sharp minor episode reveals, with the massive coda, a great master. Kulik suggests some variants. He uses the transient shake in the third bar instead of the appoggiatura which Kleindworth prefers. Kleindworth attacks the trill on the second page with the upper tone, A-flat. Kulik and Mertke, in the Steingraber edition, play the passage in this manner. Musical score excerpt from the original version of the Opus 47 Ballade. Here is Kleindworth. Musical score excerpt of the same passage in Kleindworth's edition. Of the fourth and glorious ballade in F minor dedicated to Baron C. de Rothschild, I could write a volume. It is Chopin in his most reflective yet lyric mood. Lyrism is the keynote of the work, a passionate lyrism, 
with a note of self-absorption, suppressed feeling. Truly Slavic, this shyness, and a concentration that is remarkable even for Chopin. The narrative tone is missing after the first page, a rather moody and melancholic pondering usurping its place. It is the mood of a man who examines with morbid, curious insistence the malady that is devouring his soul. This ballade is the companion of the Fantaise Polonaise, but as a ballade fully worthy of its sisters, to quote Niecks. It was published December 1843. The theme in F minor has the elusive charm of a slow, mournful valse that returns twice, bejeweled, yet never overladen. Here is the very apotheosis of the ornament. The figuration sets off the idea in dazzling relief. There are episodes, transitional passage work, distinguished by novelty and the finest art. At no place is there display for display's sake. The cadenza in A is a pause for breath, rather a sigh, before the rigorously logical imitations which presage the re-entrance of the theme. How wonderfully the introduction comes in for its share of thoughtful treatment. What a harmonist! And consider the D-flat score runs in the left hand. How suave, how satisfying is this page. I select for a special admiration this modulatory passage. Musical score excerpt. And what could be more evocative of dramatic suspense than the 16 bars before the mad, terrifying coda? How the solemn splendors of the half notes weave an atmosphere of mystic tragedy. This soul suspension recalls Miterlink. Here is the episode. Musical score excerpt. A story of Delenz that lends itself to quotation is about this piece. Tausig impressed me deeply in his interpretation of Chopin's ballade in F minor. It has three requirements. The comprehension of the program as a whole, for Chopin writes according to a program, to the situations in life best known to and understood by himself, and in an adequate manner. The conquest of the stupendous difficulties in complicated figures winding harmonies and formidable passages. Tausig fulfilled these requirements, presenting an embodiment of the signification and the feeling of the work. The ballade, Andante con moto, sixth eighths, begins in the major key of the dominant. The seventh measure comes to a stand before a fermata on C major. The easy handling of these seven measures Tausig interpreted thus. The piece has not yet begun, in his firmer, nobly expressive exposition of the principal theme free from sentimentality, to which one might easily yield. The grand style found due scope. An essential requirement in an instrumental virtuoso is that he should understand how to breathe and how to allow his hearers to take breath, giving them an opportunity to arrive at a better understanding. By this I mean a well-chosen incision, the sesura, and a lingering, letting in air, Tausig cleverly called it, which in no way impairs rhythm and time but rather brings them into stronger relief, a lingering which our signs of notation cannot adequately express, because it is made up of atomic time values. Rub the bloom from a peach or from a butterfly. What remains will belong to the kitchen, to natural history. It is not otherwise with Chopin. The bloom consisted in Tausig's treatment of the ballade. He came to the first passage, the motive among blossoms and leaves. A figurated recurrence to the principal theme is in the inner parts, its polyphonic variant. A little thread connects this with the chorale-like introduction of the second theme. The theme is strongly and abruptly modulated, perhaps a little too much so. Tausig tied the little thread to a doppio movimento in 2-4 time, but thereby resulted sextolets, which threw the chorale into much bolder relief. Then followed a passage, a tempo, in which the principal theme played hide-and-seek. How clear it all became as Tausig played it. Of technical difficulties he knew literally nothing. The intricate and evasive parts were as easy as the easiest, I might say easier. I admired the short trills in the left hand, which were trilled out quite independently, as if by a second player. The gliding ease of the cadence marked dulcissimo. It swung itself into the higher register, where it came to a stop before A major just as the introduction stopped before C major. Then, after the theme has once more presented itself in a modified form, variant, it comes under the pestle of an extremely figurate coda, which demands the study of an artist, the strength of a robust man, the most vigorous pianistic health, 
in a word. Taussig overcame this threatening group of terrific difficulties, whose appearance in the piece is well explained by the program without the slightest effect. The coda in modulated harp tones came to a stop before a fermata which corresponded to those before mentioned, in order to cast anchor in the haven of the dominant, finishing with a witch's dance of triplets, doubled in thirds. This piece winds up with extreme bravura. The lingering mentioned by Delens is tempo rubato, so fatally misunderstood by most Chopin players. Delens in a note quotes Meyerbeer as saying, Meyerbeer, who quarreled with Chopin about the rhythm of a mazurka, can one reduce women to notation? They would breed mischief were they emancipated from the measure. There is passion refined and swelling in the curves of this most eloquent composition. It is Chopin at the supreme summit of his art, an art alembicated, personal and intoxicating. I know of nothing in music like the F minor ballade. Bach in the chromatic fantasia, be not deceived by its classical contours, it is music hot from the soul. Beethoven in the first movement of the C-sharp minor sonata, the arioso of the sonata opus 110, and possibly Schumann in the opening of his C major fantasia, are as intimate, as personal as the F minor ballade, which is as subtly distinctive as the hands and smile of Lisa Gioconda. Its inaccessible position preserves it from rude and irreverent treatment. Its witchery is irresistible. End of chapter 10 Recording by Joy S. Grape www.coffeewithleonardcohen.com Chapter 11 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Fraser. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hunnaker. Chapter 11 Classical Currents. Guy de Maupassant put before us a widely diverse number of novels in a famous essay attached to the definitive edition of his masterpiece, Pierre et Jean, and puzzlingly demanded the real form of the novel. If Don Quixote is one, how can Madame Bovary be another? If Les Miserables is included in the list, what are we to say to Huisman's Le Bas? Just such a question I should like to propound substituting sonata for novel. If Scarlatti wrote sonatas, what is the appassionata? If the A-flat Weber is one, can the F minor Brahms be called a sonata? Is the Haydn form orthodox and the Schumann heterodox? These be enigmas to make worthy the formalists. Come, let us confess, and in the open air, there is a great amount of hypocrisy and cant in this matter. We can, as can any conservatory student, give the recipe for turning out a smug specimen of the form. But when we study the great examples, it is just the subtle eluding of hard and fast rules that distinguishes the efforts of the masters from the machine work of apprentices and academic monsters. Because it is no servile copy of the Mozart sonata, the F-sharp minor of Brahms is a piece of original art. Beethoven, at first, trod in the well-blazed path of Haydn, but study his second period, and it sounds the big Beethoven note. There is no final court of appeal in the matter of musical form, and there is none in the matter of literary style. The history of the sonata is the history of musical evolution. Every great composer, Schubert included, added to the form, filed here, chipped away there, introduced lawlessness where reigned prim order, witness the Schumann F-sharp minor sonata, and then came Chopin. The Chopin sonata has caused almost as much warfare as the Wagner music drama. It is all the more ludicrous, for Chopin never wrote but one piano sonata that has a classical complexion, in C minor, opus 4, and it was composed as early as 1828. Not published until July 1851, it demonstrates without a possibility of doubt that the composer had no sympathy with the form. He tried so hard and failed so dismally 
that it is a relief when the second and third sonatas are reached, for in them there are only traces of formal beauty and organic unity. But then there is much Chopin, while little of his precious essence is to be tasted in the first sonata. Chopin wrote of the C minor sonata, As a pupil, I dedicated it to Elsner, and, oh, the irony of criticism, it was praised by the critics because it was not so revolutionary as the variations Opus 2. This, too, despite the larghetto in 5-4 time. The first movement is wheezing and all but lifeless. One asks in astonishment what Chopin is doing in this gallery. And it is technically difficult. The menuetto is excellent, its trio being a faint approach to Beethoven in colour. The unaccustomed rhythm of the slow movement is irritating. Our young Chopin does not move about as freely as Benjamin Goddard in the scherzo of his violin and piano sonata in the same bizarre rhythm. Niecks sees naught but barren waste in the finale. I disagree with him. There is the breath of a stirring spirit, an imitative attempt that is more diverting than the other movements. Above all, there is movement, and the close is vigorous, though banal. The sonata is the dullest music penned by Chopin, but as a whole it hangs together as a sonata better than its two successors. So much for an attempt at strict devotion to scholastic form. From this schoolroom we are transported in Opus 35 to the theatre of larger life and passion. The B-flat minor sonata was published May 1840. Two movements are masterpieces. The funeral march that forms the third movement is one of the Pole's most popular compositions, while the finale has no parallel in piano music. Schumann says that Chopin here bound together four of his maddest children, and he is not astray. He thinks the march does not belong to the work. It certainly was written before its companion movements. As much as Hadoff admires the first two movements, he groans at the last pair though they are admirable when considered separately. These four movements have no common life. Chopin says he intended the strange finale as a gossiping commentary on the march. The left hand, unisono, with the right hand, are gossiping after the march. Perhaps the last two movements do hold together, but what have they in common with the first two? Tonality proves nothing. Notwithstanding the grandeur and beauty of the grave, the power and passion of the scherzo. This sonata in B-flat minor is not more a sonata than it is a sequence of ballades and scherzi, and again we are at the de Maupassant crux. The work never could be spared. It is Chopin mounted for action and in the thick of the fight. The doppio movimento is pulse-stirring, a strong, curt and characteristic theme for treatment. Here is power, and in the expanding prologue, flashes more than a hint of the tragic. The D-flat melody is soothing, charged with magnetism, and urged to a splendid fever of climax. The working out section is too short and dissonantal, but there is development, perhaps more technical than logical. I mean by this, more pianistic than intellectually musical. And we mount with the composer until the B-flat version of the second subject is reached for the first subject, strange to say, does not return. From that on, to the firm chords of the close, there is no misstep, no faltering or obscurity. Noble pages have been read, and the scherzo is approached with eagerness. Again, there is no disappointment. On numerous occasions, I have testified my regard for this movement in warm and uncritical terms. It is simply unapproachable, and has no equal for lucidity, brevity, and polish among the works of Chopin, except the scherzo in C-sharp minor, but there is less irony, more muscularity, and more native sweetness in this E-flat minor scherzo. I like the way Kulak marks the first B-flat octave. It is a pregnant beginning. The second bar I have never heard from any pianist save Rubenstein given with the proper crescendo. No one else seems to get it explosive enough within the walls of one bar. It is a true Rossinian crescendo. And in what a wild country we are landed 
when the F-sharp minor is crashed out. Stormy chromatic double notes, chords of the sixth, rush on with incredible fury, and the scherzo ends on the very apex of passion. A trio in G-flat is the song of songs, its swaying rhythms and phrase echoings investing a melody at once sensuous and chaste. The second part, and the return to the scherzo, are proofs of the composer's sense of balance and knowledge of the mysteries of anticipation. The closest parallelisms are noticeable, the technique so admirable that the scherzo floats in mid-air, Flaubert's ideal of a miraculous style, and then follows that deadly marche funèbre. Ernest Newman, in his remarkable study of Wagner, speaks of the fundamental difference between the two orders of imagination, as exemplified by Beethoven and Chopin on the one side, Wagner on the other. This, regarding the funeral marches of the three, Newman finds Wagner's the more concrete imagination, the inward picture of Beethoven and Chopin much vaguer and more diffused. Yet Chopin is seldom so realistic. Here are the bell-like bases, the morbid colouring. Schumann found it contained much that is repulsive, and Liszt raves rhapsodically over it. For Karasowski, it was the pain and grief of an entire nation. While Ehlert thinks it owes its renown to the wonderful effect of two triads, which in their combination possess a highly tragical element. The middle movement is not at all characteristic. Why could it not, at least, have worn second mourning? After so much black crepe drapery, one should not, at least, at once display white lingerie. This is cruel. The D-flat trio is a logical relief after the booming and glooming of the opening. That it is a rapturous gaze into the beatific regions of a beyond, as Niecks writes, I am not prepared to say. We do know, however, that the march, when isolated, has a much more profound effect than in its normal sequence. The presto is too wonderful for words. Rubenstein, or was it originally Torsig, who named it Night Wind Sweeping Over the Churchyard Graves? Its agitated, whirring, unharmonized triplets are strangely disquieting and can never be mistaken for mere etude passage work. The movement is too sombre, its curves too full of half-suppressed meanings, its rush and subhuman growling too expressive of something that defies definition. Schumann compares it to a sphinx with a mocking smile. To Henri Babadet, c'est l'azard gratin des saisons la pierre de son tombeau. Or, like Mendelssohn, one may abhor it, yet it cannot be ignored. It has Asiatic colouring, and to me seems like the wavering outlines of light-tipped hills seen sharply in silhouette, behind which rises and falls a faint infernal glow. This art paints as many differing pictures as there are imaginations for its sonorous background. Not alone the universal solvent, as Henry James thinks, it bridges the vast silent gulfs between human souls with its humming eloquence. This sonata is not dedicated. The third sonata in B minor, opus 58, has more of that undefinable organic unity. Yet, withal, it is not so powerful, so pathos-breeding, or so compact of thematic interest as its forerunner. The first page to the chromatic chords of the sixth promises much. There is a clear statement, a sound theme for developing purposes, the crisp march of chord progressions, and then the edifice goes up in smoke. After wreathings and curlings of passage work, and on the rim of despair, we witness the exquisite budding of the melody in D. It is an orbard, a nocturne of the morn, if the contradictory phrase be allowed. There is morning freshness in its hue and scent, and when it bursts, a parterre of roses. The close of the section is inimitable. All the more sorrow at what follows, wild disorder and the luxuriance called tropical. When B major is compassed, we sigh, for it augurs us a return of delight. The ending is not that of a sonata, but a love lyric. For Chopin is not the cool breadth 
and marmoreal majesty of blank verse. He sonnets to perfection, but the epical air does not fill his nostrils. Vivacious, charming, light as a harebell in the soft breeze, is the scherzo in E-flat. It has a clear ring of the scherzo, and harks back to Weber in its impersonal, amiable hurry. The Largo is tranquilly beautiful, rich in its reverie, lovely in its tune. The trio is reserved and hypnotic. The last movement, with its brilliancy and force, is a favourite, but it lacks weight, and the entire sonata is, as Nyack's writes, affiliated but not cognate. It was published in June 1845 and is dedicated to Comtesse E. de Pethuy. So these sonatas of Chopin are not sonatas at all, but, throwing titles to the dogs, would we forego the sensations that two of them evoke? There is still another, the Sonata in G minor, Opus 65, for piano and cello. It is dedicated to Chopin's friend, Auguste Francom, the violoncellist. Now, while I by no means share Finks's exalted impression of this work, yet I fancy the critics have dealt too harshly with it. Robbed of its title of Sonata, though sedulously aping this form, it contains much pretty music and it is grateful for the cello. There is not an abundant literature for this kingly instrument, in conjunction with the piano, so why flaunt Chopin's contribution? I will admit that he walks stiffly, encased in his borrowed garb, but there is the andante, short as it is, an effective scherzo, and the carefully made allegro and finale. Tonal monotony is the worst charge to be brought against this work. The trio also in G minor, Opus 8, is more alluring. It was published March 1833 and dedicated to Prince Anton Radzivill. Chopin, later, in speaking of it to a pupil, admitted that he saw things he would like to change. He regretted not making it for viola instead of violin, cello and piano. It was worked over a long time, the first movement being ready in 1833. When it appeared, it won Philistine praise, for its form more nearly approximates the sonata than any of his efforts in the cyclical order, excepting Opus 4. In it, the piano receives better treatment than the other instruments. There are many virtuoso passages, but again key changes are not frequent or disparate enough to avoid a monotone. Chopin's imagination refuses to become excited when working in the open spaces of the sonata form. Like creatures that remain drab of hue in unsympathetic or dangerous environment, his music is transformed to a bewildering bouquet of colour when he breathes native air. Compare the wildly modulating Chopin of the Ballards to the tame pacing Chopin of the sonatas, trio and concertos. The trio opens with fire, the scherzo is fanciful, and the adagio charming, while the finale is cheerful to loveliness. It might figure occasionally on the programmes of our chamber music concerts, despite its youthful puerility. There remain the two concertos, which I do not intend discussing fully. Not Chopin at his very best, the E minor and F minor concertos are frequently heard because of the chances afforded the solo player. I have written elsewhere at length of the Klindworth, Tausig, and the Burmeister versions of the two concertos. As time passes, I see no reason for amending my views on this troublous subject. Edgar S. Kelly holds a potent brief for the original orchestration, contending that it suits the character of the piano part. Rosenthal puts the belief into practice by playing the older version of the E minor with the first long tutti curtailed. But he is not consistent, for he uses the torsig octaves at the close of the rondo. While I admire the Torsig orchestration, these particular octaves are hideously cacophonic. The original triplet unisons are so much more graceful and musical. The chronology of the concertos has given rise to controversy. The trouble arose from the F minor concerto, it being numbered Opus 21, although composed before the one in E minor. The former was published April 1836, the latter, September 1833. 
The slow movement of the F minor concerto was composed by Chopin during his passion for Constantia Gladowska. She was the ideal he mentions in his letters, the adagio of this concerto. This larghetto in A-flat is a trifle too ornamental for my taste, mellifluous and serene as it is. The recitative is finely outlined. I think I like best the romanza of the E minor concerto. It is less flowery. The C-sharp minor part is imperious in its beauty, while the murmuring mystery of the close mounts to the imagination. The rondo is frolicsome, tricky, genial, and genuine piano music. It is true the first movement is too long, too much in one set of keys, and the working out section too much in the nature of a technical study. The first movement of the F minor far transcends it in breadth, passion, and musical feeling, but it is short and there is no coda. Ricard Burmeister has supplied the latter deficiency in a capitally made cadenza, which Paderewski plays. It is a complete summing up of the movement. The mazurka-like finale is very graceful and full of pure, sweet melody. This concerto is altogether more human than the E minor. Both derive from Hummel and Field. The passage work is superior in design to that of the earlier masters. The general character episodical, but episodes of rare worth and originality. As Ellert says, noblesse oblige, and thus Chopin felt himself compelled to satisfy all demands exacted of a pianist, and wrote the unavoidable piano concerto. It was not consistent with his nature to express himself in broad terms. His lungs were too weak for the pace in seven-league boots, so often required in a score. The trio and cello sonata were also tasks for whose accomplishment nature did not design him. He must touch the keys by himself without being called upon to heed the players sitting next him. He is at his best when without formal restraint he can create out of his inmost soul. He must touch the keys by himself. There you have summed up in a phrase the reason Chopin never succeeded in impressing his individuality upon the sonata form and his playing upon the masses. His was the lonely soul. George Sand knew this when she wrote, He made an instrument speak the language of the infinite. Often in ten lines that a child might play, he has introduced poems of unequalled elevation, dramas unrivalled in force and energy. He did not need the great material methods to find expression for his genius. Neither saxophone nor ophicleide was necessary for him to fill the soul with awe. Without church organ or human voice, he inspired faith and enthusiasm. It might be remarked here that Beethoven too aroused the wondering and worshipping world without the aid of saxophone or ophicleide. But it is needless cruelty to pick at Madame Sand's criticisms. She had no technical education, and so little appreciation of Chopin's peculiar genius for the piano that she could write, The day will come when his music will be arranged for orchestra without change of the piano score, which is disaster-breeding nonsense. We have sounded Chopin's weakness when writing for any instrument but his own, when writing in any form but his own. The E minor concerto is dedicated to Frederick Kalkbrenner, the F minor to the Comtesse Delphine Pototska. The latter dedication demonstrates that he could forget his only ideal in the presence of the charming Pototska. Ah, these vibratile and versatile poles. Robert Schumann, it is related, shook his head wearily when his early work was mentioned. Dreary stuff, said the composer, whose critical sense did not fail him even in so personal a question. What Chopin thought of his youthful music may be discovered in his scanty correspondence. To suppose that the young Chopin sprang into the arena a fully equipped warrior is one of those nonsensical notions which gains currency among persons unfamiliar with the law of musical evolution. Chopin's musical ancestry is easily traced. As Poe had his holly chivers, Chopin had his field. The germs of his second period are all there. From Opus 1 to Opus 22, 
virtuosity, for virtuosity's sake, is very evident. Liszt has said that in every young artist there is the virtuoso fever, and Chopin, being a pianist, did not escape the fever of the footlights. He was composing, too, at a time when piano music was well-nigh strangled by excess of ornament, when acrobats were kings, when the Bach fugue and Beethoven sonata lurked neglected and dusty in the memories of the few. Little wonder, then, we find this individual youthful Pole, not timidly treading in the path of popular composition, but bravely carrying his banner, spangled, glittering, and fanciful, and outstripping at their own game all the virtuosi of Europe. His originality in this bejeweled work caused Hummel to admire and Kalkbrenner to wonder. The supple fingers of the young man from Warsaw made quick work of existing technical difficulties. He needs must invent some of his own, and when Schumann saw the pages of Opus Two, he uttered his historical cry. Today we wonder somewhat at his enthusiasm. It is the old story. A generation seeks to know, a generation comprehends and enjoys, and a generation discards. Opus One, a rondo in C minor, dedicated to Madame de Linde, saw the light in 1825, but it was preceded by two polonaises, a set of variations, and two mazurkas in G and B flat minor. Schumann declared that Chopin's first published work was his tenth, and that between Opus One and Two, there lay two years and twenty works. Be this as it may, one cannot help liking the C minor rondo. In the A-flat section, we detect traces of his F minor concerto. There is lightness, joy in creation, which contrast with the heavy, dour quality of the C minor sonata opus 4. Loosely constructed in a formal sense, and too exuberant for his strict confines, this opus 1 is remarkable much more remarkable than Schumann's Abegg variations. The Rondo à la Mazur in F is a further advance. It is dedicated to Comtesse Mériolet and was published in 1827. Schumann reviewed it in 1836. It is sprightly, Polish in feeling and rhythmic life, and a glance at any of its pages gives us the familiar Chopin impression. Florid passage work, chords in extensions and chromatic progressions. The concert rondo, opus 14 in F, called Krakowiak, is built on a national dance in 2-4 time, which originated in Cracovia. It is, to quote Nayek's, a modified Polonaise, danced by the peasants with lusty abandon. Its accentual life is usually manifested on an unaccented part of the bar especially at the end of a section or phrase. Chopin's very Slavic version is spirited, but the virtuoso predominates. There is lushness in ornamentation, and a bold merry spirit informs every page. The orchestral accompaniment is thin. Dedicated to the Princess Tsartoriska, it was published June 1834. The Rondo, Opus 16, with an introduction, is in great favour at the conservatories, and is neat rather than poetical, although the introduction has dramatic touches. It is to this brilliant piece, with its Weberish affinities, that Ricard Burmeister has supplied an orchestral accompaniment. The remaining rondo, posthumously published as Opus 73, and composed in 1828, was originally intended, so Chopin writes in 1828, for one piano. It is full of fire, but the ornamentation runs mad and no traces of the poetical Chopin are present. He is preoccupied with the brilliant surfaces of the life about him. His youthful expansiveness finds a fair field in these variations, rondos and fantasias. Schumann's enthusiasm over the variations on La Cidadem la Mano seems to us a little overdone. Chopin had not much gift for variation in the sense that we now understand variation. Beethoven, Schumann and Brahms one must include Mendelssohn's serious variations, are masters of a form that is by no means structurally simple, or a reversion to mere spielerei, as Fink fancies. Chopin plays with his themes prettily, but it is all surface display, all heat lightning. 
he never smites, as does Brahms with his Thor hammer, the subject full in the middle, cleaving it to its core. Chopin is slightly effeminate in his variations, and they are true specimens of spielerei. Despite the cleverness of design in the arabesques, their brilliancy and euphony. Opus 2 has its dazzling moments, but its musical worth is inferior. It is written to split the ears of the groundlings, or rather to astonish and confuse them, for the Chopin dynamics in the early music are never very rude. The indisputable superiority to Hertz and the rest of the shallow-pated variationists caused Schumann's passionate admiration. It has, however, given us an interesting page of music criticism. Relstab, grumpy old fellow, was near right when he wrote of these variations that the composer runs down the theme with roulades and throttles and hangs it with chains of shakes. The skip makes its appearance in the fourth variation, and there is no gainsaying the brilliancy and piquant spirit of the Alla Polaccia. Opus 2 is orchestrally accompanied, an accompaniment that may be gladly dispensed with and dedicated by Chopin to the friend of his youth, Titus Wojciechowski. Jevon de Scapulaire is a tune in Harold and Halloway's Ludovic. Chopin varied it in his Opus 12. This rondo in B-flat is the weakest of Chopin's muse. It is Chopin and water, and Gallic au supri at that. The piece is written tastefully, is not difficult, but woefully artificial. Published in 1833, it was dedicated to Miss Emma Horsford. In May 1851 appeared the variations in E, without an opus number. They are not worth the trouble. Evidently composed before Chopin's Opus 1 and before 1830, they are musically light-waisted, although written by one who already knew the keyboard. The last, a valse, is the brightest of the set. The theme is German. The Fantaisie, Opus 13 in A, on Polish airs, preceded by an introduction in F-sharp minor, is dedicated to the pianist J.P. Pixis. It was published in April 1834. It is Chopin brilliant. Its orchestral background does not count for much, but the energy, the colour, and Polish character of the piece endeared it to the composer. He played it often, and as Klesinski asks, are these brilliant passages, these cascades of pearly notes, these bold leaps, the sadness and the despair of which we hear? Is it not rather youth exuberant with intensity in life? Is it not happiness, gaiety, love for the world and men? The melancholy notes are there to bring out, to enforce the principal ideas. For instance, in the Fantasy Opus 13, the theme of Kropinski moves and saddens us. But the composer does not give time for this impression to become durable. He suspends it by means of a long trill, and then suddenly, by a few chords and with a brilliant prelude, leads us to a popular dance with the peasant couples of Mazovia. Does the finale indicate, by its minor key, the gaiety of a man devoid of hope, as the Germans say? Klesinski then tells us that a Polish proverb, a fig for misery, is the keynote of a nation that dances furiously to music in the minor key. Elevated beauty, not sepulchral gaiety, is the character of Polish, of Chopin's music. This is a valuable hint. There are variations in the fantasy which end with a merry and vivacious kujaviak. The F minor fantasy will be considered later. Neither by its magnificent content, construction, nor opus number, 49, does it fall into this chapter. The Allegro de Concert in A, opus 46, was published in November 1841 and dedicated to Mademoiselle Frédéric Muller, a pupil of Chopin. It has all the characteristics of a concerto and is indeed a truncated one, much more so than Schumann's F minor sonata, called Concert sans orchestre. There are two T in the Chopin work, the solo part not really beginning until the 87th bar, but it must not be supposed that these long introductory passages are ineffective for the player. 
The Allegro is one of Chopin's most difficult works. It abounds in risky skips, ambuscades of dangerous double notes, and the principal themes are bold and expressive. The colour note is strikingly adapted for public performance, and perhaps Schumann was correct in believing that Chopin had originally sketched this for piano and orchestra. Nyex asks if this is not the fragment of a concerto for two pianos, which Chopin, in a letter written at Vienna, December the 21st, 1830, said he would play in public with his friend Nideski if he succeeded in writing it to his satisfaction. And is there any significance in the fact that Chopin, when sending this manuscript to Fontana, probably in the summer of 1841, calls it a concerto. While it adds little to Chopin's reputation, it has the potentialities of a powerful and more manly composition than either of the two concertos. Jean-Louis Nicode has given it an orchestral garb, besides arranging it for two pianos. He has added a developing section of 70 bars, this version was first played in New York a decade ago by Marie Geselschap, a Dutch pianist, under the direction of the late Anton Seidel. The original, it must be acknowledged, is preferable. The Bolero, Opus 19, has a Polonaise flavour. There is but little Spanish in its ingredients. It is merely a memorandum of Chopin's early essays in dance forms. It was published in 1834 four years before Chopin's visit to Spain. Nyex thinks it an early work. That it can be made effective was proven by Emil Sauer. It is for fleet-fingered pianists, and the principal theme has the rhythmical ring of the Polonaise, although the most Iberian in character. It is dedicated to Comtesse E. de Flau. In the key of A minor, its coda ends in A major. Willoughby says it is in C major. The Tarantella is in A-flat and is numbered Opus 43. It was published in 1841 and bears no dedication. Composed at Noant, it is as little Italian as the Bolero is Spanish. Chopin's visit to Italy was of too short a duration to affect him, at least in the style of dance. It is without the necessary Ophidian tang and far inferior to Heller and Liszt's efforts in the constricted form one finds little of the frenzy ascribed to it by Schumann in his review. It breathes of the north, not the south, and ranks far below the A-flat impromptu in geniality and grace. The C minor funeral march, composed according to Fontana in 1829, sounds like Mendelssohn. The trio has the processional quality of a Parisian funeral cortege. It is modest and in no ways remarkable. The three Ecossaises, published as Opus 73, number 3, are little dances, Scottishes, nothing more. Number 2 in G is highly popular in girls' boarding schools. The Grand Duo Concertant for cello and piano is jointly composed by Chopin and Francom on themes from Robert Le Diable. It begins in E and ends in A major, and is without opus number. Schumann thinks Chopin sketched the whole of it and that Francom said yes to everything. It is for the Salon of 1833 when it was published. It is empty, tiresome and only slightly superior to compositions of the same sort by de Berio and Osborne. Full of rapid elegances and shallow passage work, this duo is certainly a pièce d'occasion, the occasion probably being the need of ready money. The 17 Polish songs were composed between 1824 and 1844. In the psychology of the laid, Chopin was not happy. Karasowski writes that many of the songs were lost and some of them are still sung in Poland, their origin being hazy. The 3rd of May is cited as one of these. Chopin had a habit of playing songs for his friends but neglected putting some of them on paper. The collected songs are under the opus head 74. The words are by his friends, Stephen Witwicki, Adam Mikiewicz, Bogdan Zaleski, and Sigismond Krasinski. The first in the key of A, 
The Familiar Maiden's Wish, has been brilliantly paraphrased by Liszt. This pretty mazurka is charmingly sung and played by Marcella Sembrick in the singing lesson of the Barber of Seville. There are several mazurkas in the list. Most of these songs are mediocre. Poland's dirge is an exception, and so is Horseman Before the Battle. Was ein junges Madchen liebt has a short introduction in which the reminiscence hunter may find a true bit of Meistersinger colour. Simple in structure and sentiment, the Chopin Leder seem almost rudimentary compared to essays in this form by Schubert, Schumann, Franz, Brahms and Tchaikovsky. A word of recommendation may not be amiss here regarding the technical study of Chopin. Klesinski, in his two books, gives many valuable hints, and Isidore Philipp has published a set of Exercises Quotidiennes made up of specimens in double notes, octaves, and passages taken from the works. Here, skeletonized, are the special technical problems. In these daily studies, and his edition of the Etudes, are numerous examples dealt with practically. For a study of Chopin's ornaments, Mertke has discussed at length the various editorial procedure in the matter of attacking the trill in single and double notes. Also, the easiest method of executing the flying scud and vapours of the fioriture. This may be found in number 179 of the edition Steingraber. Philip's collection is published in Paris by J. Hamel and is prefixed by some interesting remarks of George Matthias. Chopin's portrait in 1833, after Vigneron, is included. One composition more is to be considered. In 1837, Chopin contributed the sixth variation of the march from I Puritani. These variations were published under the title Exameron, Morceau de Concert, Grande Variation du Bravoure sur le Marche de Puritan de Bellini, Composés pour le Concert de Madame la Princesse Belgiojoso, au bénéfice de pauvres, par Liszt, Talberg, Pixis, H. R. Cherny, a Chopin. Liszt wrote an orchestral accompaniment, never published. His pupil, Maurice Rosenthal, is the only modern virtuoso who plays the examiral in his concerts, and play it he does with overwhelming splendour. Chopin's contribution in E major is in his sentimental salon mood. Musically, it is the most impressive of this extraordinary mastodonic survival of the pianistic past. The newly published fugue, or fugato, in A minor, in two voices, is from a manuscript in the possession of Natalie Janotha, who probably got it from the late Princess Zartoriska, a pupil of the composer. The composition is ineffective, and in spots ugly, particularly in the stretta, and is no doubt an exercise during the working years with Elsner. The fact that in the coda the very suspicious octave pedal point and trills may be omitted, so the editorial note runs, leads one to suspect that out of a fragment, Yanotha has evolved, Cuvier-like, an entire composition. Chopin as fugue maker does not appear in a brilliant light. Is the Polish composer to become a musical Hugh Conway? Why all these dischecked a member of a sketchbook? In these youthful works may be found the beginnings of the greater Chopin, but not his vast subjugation of the purely technical to the poetic and spiritual. That came later. To the devout Chopinist, the first compositions are so many proofs of the joyful, victorious spirit of the man whose spleen and pessimism have been wrongly compared to Leopardi's and Baudelaire's. Chopin was gay, fairly healthy, and bubbling over with a pretty malice. His first period shows this. It also shows how thorough and painful the processes by which he evolved his final style. End of chapter 11. Recording by Daniel Fraser. Chapter 12 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Clip. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Hunnaker. Chapter 12. The Polonaises, Heroic Hymns of Battle. How is one to reconcile the want of manliness moral and intellectual, which Haddo asserts is the one great limitation of Chopin's province, with the power, splendor, and courage of the Polonaises? Here are the cannon buried in flowers of Robert Schumann. Here overwhelming evidences of versatility, virility, and passion. Chopin blinded his critics and admirers alike. A delicate, puny fellow, he could play the piano on occasion like a devil incarnate. He, too, had his demon, as well as Liszt, and only, as Ellert puts it, theatrical fear of this spirit driving him over the cliffs of reason made him curve its antics. After all the Collour de Rosé portraits and lollipop miniatures made of him by pensive, poetical persons, it is not possible to conceive Chopin as being irascible and almost brutal. Yet he was at times even this. Beethoven was scarce more vehement and irritable, writes Ellert. And we remember the stories of friends and pupils who have seen this slender, refined Pole wrestling with his wrath as one under the obsession of a fiend. It is no desire to exaggerate this side of his nature that impels this plain writing. Chopin left compositions that bear witness to his masculine side. Diminutive in person, bad temper became him ill. Besides, his whole education and tastes were opposed to scenes of violence. So this energy, spleen, and raging at fortune found escape in some of his music, became psychial in its manifestations. But, you may say, this is feminine hysteria, the impotent cries of an unmanly, weak nature. Read the E-flat minor, the C minor, the A major, the F-sharp minor, and the two A-flat major polonaises. Ballads, scherzi, studies, preludes, and the great F minor fantasy are purposely omitted from this awing scheme. Chopin was weak in physique, but he had the soul of a lion. Allied to the most exquisite poetic sensibilities, one is reminded here of Balzac's Ce beau genie est mon un musicien quand d'une qui se rend sensible. There was another nature, fiery, implacable. He loved Poland. He hated her oppressors. There is no doubt he idealized his country and her wrongs until the theme grew out of all proportion. Politically, the Poles and Celts rub shoulders. Nix points out that if Chopin was a flattering idealist as a national poet, as a personal poet, he was an uncompromising realist. So in the Polonaises we find two distinct groups. In one, the objective, martial side predominates. In the other is Chopin, the moody, mournful, and morose. But in all, the Polish element pervades. Barring the mazurkas, these dances are the most Polish of his works. Appreciation of Chopin's wide diversity of temperament would have spared the world the false, silly, distorted portraits of him. He had the warrior in him, even if his mailed fist was seldom used. There are moments when he discards the gloves and soft phrases and deals blows that reverberate with formidable clangor. By all means, read Liszt's gorgeous description of the Polonaise. Originating during the last half of the 16th century, it was at first a measured procession of nobles and their womankind to the sound of music. In the court of Henry of Anjou in 1574, after his election to the Polish throne, the Polonaise was born and throve in the hardy warlike atmosphere. It became a dance political and had words set to it. Thus came the Kosciusko, the Oginski, the Moniuszko, the Kurpinski, and a long list written by composers with names ending in ski. It is really a march, a processional dance, grave, moderate, flowing, and by no means stereotyped. Liszt tells of the capricious life infused into its courtly measures by the Polish aristocracy. It is at once the symbol of war and love, a vivid pageant of martial splendor, a weaving, cadence, voluptuous dance, the pursuit of shy, coquettish women by the fierce warrior. The Polonaise is in 3-4 time, with the accent on the second beat of the bar. In simple binary form, ternary if a trio is added, this dance has feminine endings to all the principal cadences. The rhythmical cast of the bass is seldom changed. Despite its essentially masculine mold, it is given a feminine title, 
Formerly, it was called Polonaise. Liszt wrote of it. In this form, the noblest traditional feelings of ancient Poland are represented. The Polonaise is the true and purest type of Polish national character, as in the course of centuries it was developed partly through the political position of the kingdom toward east and west, partly through an undefinable, peculiar inborn disposition of the entire race. In the development of the Polonaise, everything cooperated which specifically distinguished the nation from others. In the poles of departed times, manly resolution was united with glowing devotion to the object of their love. Their knightly heroism was sanctioned by high-soaring dignity, and even the laws of gallantry and the national costume exerted an influence over the terms of this dance. The Polonaises are the keystone in the development of this form. They belong to the most beautiful of Chopin inspirations. With their energetic rhythm, they electrify, to the point of excited demonstration, even the sleepiest indifferentism. Chopin was born too late, and left his native hearth too early, to be initiated into the original character of the Polonaise as danced through his own observation. But what others imparted to him in regard to it was supplemented by his fancy and his nationality. Chopin wrote fifteen Polonaises, the authenticity of one in G-flat major being doubted by Nietzsche. This list includes the Polonaise for viola and cello and piano, opus 3, and the Polonaise, opus 22, for piano and orchestra. This latter Polonaise is preceded by an andante spianato in G in 6-8 time and unaccompanied. It is a charming, liquid-toned, nocturne-like composition. Chopin, in his most suave, his most placid mood. A barcarol, scarcely a ripple of emotion, disturbs the mirrored calm of this lake. After sixteen bars of a crudely harmonized tutti comes the Polonaise in the widely remote key of E-flat. It is brilliant, every note telling, the figuration rich and novel, the movement spirited and flowing. Perhaps it is too long and lacks relief. The theme on each re-entrance is varied ornamentally. The second theme, in C minor, has a Polish and poetic ring, while the coda is effective. This opus is vivacious, but not characterized by great depth. Crystalline, gracious, and refined, the piece is stamped Paris, the elegant Paris of 1830. Composed in that year and published in July 1836, it is dedicated to the Baron d'Est. Chopin introduced it at the Conservatoire concert for the benefit of Habenick, April 26, 1835. This, according to Nix, was the only time he played the Polonaise with orchestral accompaniment. It was practically a novelty to New York when Raphael Giuseppe played it here superlatively well in 1879. The orchestral part seems wholly superfluous, for the scoring is not particularly effective, and there is a rumor that Chopin cannot be held responsible for it. Xaver Sharvenka made a new instrumentation that is discreet and extremely well-sounding. With excellent tact, he has managed to add accompaniment to the introduction, giving some thematic work of the slightest texture to the strings, and in the pretty coda to the woodwind. A delicately managed allusion is made by the horns to the second theme of the nocturne in G. There are even five faint taps of the triangle, and the idyllic atmosphere is never disturbed. Sharvenka first played this arrangement at the Sedi Memorial Concert in Chinkering Hall, New York, April 1898, yet I cannot truthfully say the Polonaise sounds so characteristic as when played solo. The C-sharp minor Polonaise, opus 26, has had the misfortune of being sentimentalized to death. What can be more appassionata than the opening with its grand rhythmical swing? It is usually played by timid persons in a sugar-sweet fashion, although FFF stares them in the face. The first three lines are hugely heroic, but the indignation soon melts away, leaving an apathetic humor. After the theme returns and is repeated, we get a genuine love motif tender enough in all faith wherewith to woo a princess. On this, the Polonaise closes, an odd ending for such a fiery opening. In no such mood does number two begin. In E-flat minor, it is variously known as the Siberian, the Revolt Polonaise. It breathes defiance and rancor from the start. What suppressed and threatening rumblings are there? Volcanic mutterings, these. 
musical score excerpt. It is a sinister page, and all the more so because of the injunction to open with pianissimo. One wishes that the shrill high G-flat had been written in full chords as the theme suffers from a want of massiveness. Then follows a subsidiary, but the principal subject returns relentlessly. The episode in B major gives pause for breathing. It has a hint of Meyerbeer, but again, with smothered explosions, the polonaise proper appears, and all ends in gloom and the impotent clanking of chains. It is an awe-provoking work, this terrible polonaise in E-flat minor opus 26. It was published July 1836 and is dedicated to M. J. Dessur. Not so the celebrated A major polonaise, opus 40, Le Militaire. To Rubinstein, this seemed a picture of Poland's greatness, as its companion, in C minor, is of Poland's downfall. Although Karasowski and Kleczynski give to the A flat major polonaise the honor of suggesting a well known story, it is really the A major that provoked it, so the Polish portrait painter Kwiatowski informs Niecks. The story runs that after composing it, Chopin, in the dreary watches of the night, was surprised, terrified is a better word, by the opening of his door and the entrance of a long train of Polish nobles and ladies, richly robed, who moved slowly by him. Troubled by the ghosts of the past he had raised, the composer, hollow-eyed, fled the apartment. All this must have been at Majorca, for Opus 40 was composed and finished there. Ailing, weak, and unhappy as he was, Chopin had grit enough to file and polish this brilliant and striking composition into its present shape. It is the best known, and, though the most muscular of his compositions, it is the most played. It is dedicated to J. Fontana, and was published November 1840. This polonaise has the festive glitter of Weber. The C minor polonaise of the same set is a noble, troubling composition, large in accents and deeply felt. Can anything be more impressive than this opening? Musical score excerpts. It is indeed Poland's downfall. The trio in A-flat, with its kaleidoscopic modulations, produces an impression of vague unrest and suppressed sorrow. There is a loftiness of spirit and daring in it. What can one say new of the tremendous F-sharp minor polonaise? Willoughby calls it noisy. And Stanislav Przybyszewski, whom Vance Thompson christened a prestigious noctambulist, has literally stormed over it. It is barbaric. It is perhaps pathologic, and of it Liszt has said the most eloquent things. It is for him a dream poem, the lurid hour that precedes a hurricane, with a convulsive shudder at its close. The opening is very impressive, the nerve pulp being harassed by the gradually swelling prelude. There is defiant power in the first theme, and the constant reference to it betrays the composer's exasperated mental condition. This tendency to return upon himself, a tormenting introspection, certainly signifies a grave state. But consider the musical weight of the work, the recklessly bold outpourings of a mind almost distraught. There is no greater test for the poet-pianist than the F-sharp minor polonaise. It is profoundly ironical. What else means the introduction of that lovely mazurka, a flower between two abysses? This strange dance is ushered in by two of the most enigmatic pages of Chopin. The A major intermezzo, with its booming cannons and reverberating of overtones, is not easily defensible on the score of form, yet it unmistakably fits in the picture. The mazurka is full of interrogation and emotional nuancern. The return of the tempest is not long delayed. It bursts, wanes, and with the coda comes sad yearning. Then the savage drama passes tremblingly into the night after fluid and wavering affirmations, a roar in F-sharp, and finally a silence that marks the cessation of an agitating nightmare. No saber dance this, but a confession from the dark depths of a self-tortured soul. Opus 44 was published November 1841, and is dedicated to Princesse de Beauvau. There are few editorial differences. In the 18th bar from the beginning, Kulak, in the second beat, fills out an octave. 
not so in Clindworth, nor in the original. At the twentieth bar, Clindworth differs from the original as follows. The Chopin text is the upper one. Musical score excerpts. The A-flat Polonaise, Opus 53, was published December 1843, and is said by Karasowski to have been composed in 1840, after Chopin's return to Majorca. It is dedicated to A. Leo. This is the one Karasowski calls the story of Chopin's vision of the antique dead in an isolated tower of Madame Sand's chateau in Nohant. We have seen this legend disproved by one who knows. This Polonaise is not as feverish and as exalted as a previous one. It is, as Kleszynski writes, the type of a war song. Named the Heroic, one hears it in Elhert's Ring of Damascene Blade and Silver Spur. There is imaginative splendor in this thrilling work, with its thunder of horses' hooves and fierce challenges. What fire, what sword thrust and smoke and clash of mortal conflict! Here is no psychical presentation, but an objective picture of battle, of concrete contours, and with a cleaving brilliancy that excites the blood to boiling pitch. That Chopin ever played it as intended is incredible. None but the heroes of the keyboard may grasp its dense chordal masses, its fiery projectiles of tone. But there is something disturbing, even ghostly, in the strange intermezzo that separates the trio from the Polonaise. Both mist and starlight are in it. Yet the work is played too fast, and has been nicknamed the Drum Polonaise, losing in majesty and force because of the vanity of virtuosi. The octaves in E major are spun out as if speed were the sole idea of this episode. Follow Kleczynski's advice and do not sacrifice the Polonaise to the octaves. Karl Tossig, so Giuseppe and de Lenz assert, played this Polonaise in an unapproachable manner. Powerful battle tableau as it is, it may still be presented so as not to shock one's sense of the euphonious, of the limitations of the instrument. This work becomes vapid and unheroic when transferred to the orchestra. The Polonaise Fantasie in A-flat, Op. 61, given to the world September 1846, is dedicated to Madame A. Verret. One of three great Polonaises, it is just beginning to be understood, having been derided as amorphous, febrile, of little musical moment, even Liszt declaring that such pictures possesses but little real value to art, deplorable visions which the artist should admit with extreme circumspection within the graceful circle of his charmed realm. This was written in the old-fashioned days when art was aristocratic and excluded the baser and more painful emotions. For a generation accustomed to the realism of Richard Strauss, the fantasy polonaise seems vaporous and idealistic, with all new. It recalls one of those enchanted flasks of the Magi, from which an opening smoke exhales that gradually shapes itself into fantastic and fearsome figures. This polonaise at no time exhibits the solidity of its two predecessors. Its plasticity defies the imprint of the conventional polonaise, though we ever feel its rhythms. It may be full of monologues, interspersed cadenzas, improvised preludes and short phrases, as Kulik suggests, yet there is unity in the composition, the units of structure and style. It was music of the future when Chopin composed, it is now music of the present, as much as Richard Wagner's. But the realism is a trifle clouded. Here is a duality of Chopin the suffering man and Chopin the prophet of Poland. Undimmed is his poetic vision, Poland will be free, undaunted his soul, though oppressed by a suffering body. There are in the work throes of agony, blended with the trumpet notes of triumph. And what puzzled our fathers, the shifting lights and shadows, the restless tonalities, are welcome. For at the beginning of this new century, the chromatic is king. The ending of this polonaise is triumphant, recalling in key and climaxing the A-flat ballad. Chopin is still the captain of his soul, and Poland will be free. Are Celt and Slav doomed to follow ever the phosphorescent lights of patriotism? Liszt acknowledges the beauty and grandeur of this last Polonaise, which unites the characteristics of superb and original manipulation in the form, the martial, and the melancholic. Opus 71, 
three posthumous pol polonaises given to the world by Julius Fontana are in D minor, published in 1827, B flat minor, 1828, and F minor, 1829. They are interesting to Chopinists. The influence of Weber, the past master of this form, is felt. Of the three, the last in F minor is the strongest, although if Chopin's age is taken into consideration, the first, in D minor, is a feat for a lad of eighteen. I agree with Nix that the posthumous polonaise, without opus number, in G-sharp minor, was composed later than 1822, the date given in the Breitkopf and Hartel edition. It is an artistic conception, an enlight-winged figuration far more mature than the Chopin of Opus 71, really a graceful and effective little composition of the florid order, but like his early music, without poetic depth. The Warsaw Echo Musicale, to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Chopin's death, published a special number in October 1899 with a picture of a farmer named Krzysztof, born in 1810, the year after the composer. Thereat Fink remarked that it is not the, a case of survival of the fittest. A facsimile reproduction of a hitherto unpublished Polonaise in A-flat, written at the age of eleven, is also included in this unique number. This tiny dance shows, it is said, the characteristic physiognomy of the composer. In reality, this Polak is thin, a tentative groping after a form that later was mastered so magnificently by the composer. Here is the way it begins. The autograph is Chopin's. Musical score excerpt. The Alla Polacca for piano and cello, opus 3, was composed in 1829, while Chopin was on a visit to Prince Radzivil. It is preceded by an introduction, and is dedicated to Josef Merck, the cellist. Chopin himself pronounced it a brilliant salon piece. It is now not even that, for it sounds antiquated and threadbare. The passage work at times smacks of Chopin and Weber, a hint of the mouvement perpetuel, and the cello has the better of the bargain, evidently written for my lady's chamber. Two polonaises remain. One in B-flat minor was composed in 1826, on the occasion of the composer's departure for Reigns. A footnote to the edition of this rather elegic piece tells this. Adieu to Guillaume Kohlberg is the title, and the trio in D-flat is accredited to an air of Gaza Ladra, with a sentimental au revoir inscribed. Kleczynski has revived the Gepfener and Wolf edition. The little cadenza in chromatic double notes on the last page is of a certainty Chopin, but the Polonaise in G-flat major published by Schott is doubtful. It has a shallow ring, a brilliant superficiality that warrants Nix in stamping it to a possible compilation. There are traces of the master throughout, particularly in the E-flat minor trio, but there are some vile progressions and an air of vulgarity surely not Chopin's. This dance form, since the death of the great composer, has been chiefly developed on the virtuoso side. Beethoven, Schubert, Weber, and even Bach, in his B minor suite for strings and flute, also indulged in this form. Wagner, as a student, wrote a polonaise for four hands, in D, and in Schumann's Papillons there is a charming specimen. Rubinstein composed a most brilliant and dramatic example in E-flat in Le Bal. The Liszt polonaises, all said and done, are the most remarkable in design and execution since Chopin, but they are more Hungarian than Polish. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Chopin, The Man and His Music. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by M.J. Frank. Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Huneker. Chapter 13. Mazurkas, Dances of the Soul, Part One. Quote, Coquetries, vanities, fantasies, inclinations, elegies, vague emotions, passions, conquests, 
struggles upon which the safety or favors of others depend, all, all, meet in this dance. Unquote. Thus, Liszt. De Lenz further quotes him, Of the mazurkas, one must harness a new pianist of the first rank to each of them. Yet Liszt told Niecks he did not care much for Chopin's mazurkas. One often meets in them with bars which might just as well be in another place, but as Chopin puts them, perhaps nobody could put them. Liszt, despite the rhapsodical praise of his friend, is not always to be relied upon. Capricious as Chopin, he had days when he disliked not only the mazurkas, but all his music. He confessed to Niex that when he played a half-hour for amusement, it was Chopin he took up. There is no more brilliant chapter than this Hungarian's on the dancing of the mazurka by the Poles. It is a companion to his equally sensational description of the Polonaise. He gives a wild, whirling, highly colored narrative of the mazurka, with a coda of extravagant praise of the beauty and fascination of Polish women. Angel through love, demon through fantasy, as Balzac called her. In none of the piano rhapsodies are there such striking passages to be met as in Liszt's overwrought, cadenced prose, prose modeled after Chateaubriand. Niema ia poki. Nothing equals the Polish women and their divine coquetries. The mazurka is their dance. It is the feminine complement to the heroic and masculine Polonaise. An English writer describes the dancing of the mazurka in contemporary Russia. In the salons of St. Petersburg, for instance, the guests actually dance. They do not merely shamble to and fro in a crowd, crumpling their clothes and ruffling their tempers, and call it a set of quadrilles. They have ample space for the sweeping movements and complicated figures of all the orthodox ball dances, and are generally gifted with sufficient plastic grace to carry them out in style. They carefully cultivate dances calling for a kind of grace which is almost beyond the reach of art. The mazurka is one of the finest of these, and it is quite a favorite at balls on the banks of the Neva. It needs a good deal of room, one or more spurred officers, and grace, grace, and grace. The dash with which the partners rush forward, the clinking and clattering of spurs as heel clashes with heel in mid-air, punctuating the staccato of the music, the loud thud of boots striking the ground, followed by their sibilant slide along the polished floor, then the swift springs and sudden bounds, the whirling gyrations and dizzy evolutions the graceful genuflections and quick embraces, and all the other intricate and maddening movements to the accompaniment of one of Glinka's or Tchaikovsky's masterpieces, awaken and mobilize all the antique heroism, medieval chivalry, and wild romance that lie dormant in the depths of men's being. There is more genuine pleasure in being the spectator of a soul-thrilling dance like that than in taking an active part in the lifeless make-believes performed at society balls in many of the more western countries of Europe. Absolutely Slavonic, though a local dance of the province of Masofia, the Masorek, or Mazurka, is written in three-four time, with the usual displaced accent in music of eastern origin. Brodzinski is quoted as saying that in its primitive form, the Masorek is only a kind of Krakowiak, less lively, less sautillant. At its best, it is a dancing anecdote, a story told in a charming variety of steps and gestures. It is intoxicating, rude, humorous, poetic, above all melancholy. When he is happiest, he sings his saddest, does the Pole. Hence his predilection for minor modes, 
The mazurka is in 3-4 or 3-8 time. Sometimes the accent is dotted, but this is by no means absolute. Here is the rhythm most frequently encountered, although Chopin employs variants and modifications. The first part of the bar has usually the quicker notes. The scale is a mixture of major and minor. Melodies are encountered that grew out of a scale shorn of a degree. Occasionally the augmented second, the Hungarian, is encountered, and skips of a third are frequent occurrence. This, with progressions of augmented fourths and major sevenths, gives to the mazurkas of Chopin an exotic character apart from their novel and original content. As was the case with the Polonaise, Chopin took the framework of the national dance, developed it, enlarged it, and hung upon it his choicest melodies, his most piquant harmonies. He breaks and varies the conventionalized rhythm in a half hundred ways, lifting to the plane of a poem the heavy hoofed peasant dance. But in this idealization, he never robs it altogether of the flavor of the soil. It is, in all its wayward disguises, the Polish mazurka, and is with the Polonaise, according to Rubinstein, the only Polish reflective music he has made, although in all of his compositions we hear him relate rejoicingly of Poland's vanished greatness, singing, mourning, weeping over Poland's downfall and all that, in the most beautiful, the most musical way. Besides the hard, inartistic modulations, the startling progressions and abrupt changes of mood that jarred on the old-fashioned Moscules and dipped in vitriol the pen of Relstab, there is in the mazurkas the greatest stumbling block of all, the much-exploited rubato. Berlioz swore that Chopin could not play in time, which was not true, and later we shall see that Meyerbeer thought the same. What to the sensitive critic is a charming wavering and swaying in the measure, Chopin leans about freely within his bars, wrote an English critic, for the classicists was a rank departure from the time beat. According to Liszt's description of the rubato, a wind plays in the leaves, life unfolds and develops beneath them, but the tree remains the same. That is the Chopin rubato. Elsewhere, a tempo agitated, broken, interrupted, a movement flexible, yet at the same time abrupt and languishing, and vacillating as the fluctuating breath by which it is agitated. Chopin was more commonplace in his definition. Supposing, he explained, that a piece lasts a given number of minutes. It may take just so long to perform the whole, but in detail deviations may differ. The tempo rubato is probably as old as music itself. It is in Bach. It was practiced by the old Italian singers. Mikuli says that no matter how free Chopin was in his treatment of the right hand in melody or arabesque, the left kept strict time. Mozart, and not Chopin, it was, who first said, let your left hand be your conductor and always keep time. Hal, the pianist, once asserted that he proved Chopin to be playing 4-4 four, four instead of 3-4 measure in a mazurka. Chopin laughingly admitted that it was a national trait. Hal was bewildered when he first heard Chopin play, for he did not believe such music could be represented by musical signs. Still, he holds that this style has been woefully exaggerated by pupils and imitators. If a Beethoven symphony or a Bach fugue be played with metronomical rigidity, it loses its quintessential flavor. Is it not time the ridiculous falsehoods about the Chopin rubato be exposed? Naturally abhorring anything that would do violence to the structural part of his compositions, Chopin was a very martinet with his pupils if too much license of tempo was taken. His music needs the greatest lucidity in presentation, and naturally a certain elasticity of phrasing. 
rhythms need not be distorted nor need there be absurd and vulgar haltings silly and explosive dynamics chopin sentimentalized is chopin butchered he loathed false sentiment and a man whose taste was formed by bach and mozart who was nurtured by the music of these two giants could never have indulged in exaggerated jerky tempi in meaningless expression come let us be done with this fetish of stolen time of the wonderful and so seldom comprehended rubato if you wish to play chopin play him in curves let there be no angularities of surface of measure but in the name of the beautiful do not deliver his exquisitely balanced phrases with the jolting balky eloquence of a cafe chantant singer the very balance and symmetry of the chopin phraseology are internal it must be delivered in a flowing waving manner never square or hard yet with every accent showing like the supple muscles of an athlete beneath his skin without the skeleton a musical composition is flaccid shapeless weak and without character chopin's music needs a rhythmic sense that to us fed upon the few simple forms of the west seems almost abnormal the chopin rubato is rhythm liberated from its scholastic bonds but it does not mean anarchy disorder what makes this popular misconception all the more singular is the freedom with which the classics are now being interpreted a beethoven and even a mozart symphony no longer means a rigorous execution in which the measure is ruthlessly hammered out by the conductor but the melodic and emotional curve is followed and the tempo fluctuates why then is chopin singled out as the evil and solitary representative of a vicious time beat play him as you play mendelssohn and your chopin has evaporated again play him lawlessly with his accentual life topsy-turvied and he is no longer chopin his caricature only pianists of slavic descent alone understand the secret of the tempo rubato i have read in a recently started german periodical that to make the performance of chopin's works pleasing it is sufficient to play them with less precision of rhythm than the music of other composers i on the contrary do not know a single phrase of chopin's works including even the freest among them in which the balloon of inspiration as it moves through the air is not checked by an anchor of rhythm and symmetry such passages as occur in the f minor ballade the b flat minor scherzo the middle part the f minor prelude and even the a flat impromptu are not devoid of rhythm the most crooked recitative of the f minor concerto as can be easily proved has a fundamental rhythm not at all fantastic and which cannot be dispensed with when playing with orchestra chopin never overdoes fantasy and is always restrained by a pronounced aesthetical instinct everywhere the simplicity of his poetical inspiration and his sobriety saves us from extravagance and false pathos kleszinski has this in his second volume for he enjoyed the invaluable prompting of chopin's pupil the late princess marceline chateriska Niax quotes madame frederic stretcher nee muller a pupil who wrote of her master he required adherence to the strictest rhythm hated all lingering and lagging misplaced rubatos as well as exaggerated retardandos je vous prie de vous asseoir he said on such an occasion with gentle mockery and it is just in this respect that people make such terrible mistakes in the execution of his works and now to the mazurkas which de Lenz said were heinrich heine's songs on the piano chopin was a phoenix of intimacy with the piano in his nocturnes and mazurkas he is unrivalled downright fabulous 
no compositions are so Chopin-ish as the mazurkas. Ironical, sad, sweet, joyous, morbid, sour, sane, and dreamy, they illustrate what was said of their composer. His heart is sad, his mind is gay. That subtle quality for an Occidental, enigmatic, which the Poles call Zal, is in some of them. In others the fun is almost rough and roaring. Zal, a poisonous word, is a baleful compound of pain, sadness, secret rancor, revolt. It is a Polish quality, and is in the Celtic peoples. Oppressed nations with a tendency to mad lyricism develop this mental secretion of the spleen. Liszt writes that the sal colors with a reflection now argent, now ardent, the whole of Chopin's works. This sorrow is the very soil of Chopin's nature. He so confessed when questioned by Comtesse d'Agou. Liszt further explains that the strange word includes in its meanings, for it seems packed with them, all the tenderness, all the humility of a regret born with resignation and without a murmur. It also signifies excitement, agitation, rancor, revolt full of reproach, premeditated vengeance, menace never ceasing to threaten if retaliation should ever become possible, feeding itself meanwhile with a bitter, if sterile, hatred. Sterile indeed must be such a consuming passion. Even where his patriotism became a lyric cry, this Saul tainted the source of Chopin's joy. It made him irascible, and with his powers of repression, this smoldering, smothered rage must have well-nigh suffocated him, and in the end proved harmful alike to his person and to his art. As in certain phases of disease it heightened the beauty of his later work, unhealthy, feverish, yet beauty without doubt. The pearl is said to be a morbid secretion, so the spiritual ferment called Saul gave to Chopin's music its morbid beauty. It is in the B minor scherzo, but not in the A-flat ballade. The F minor ballade overflows with it, and so does the F-sharp minor polonaise, but not the first impromptu. Its dark introspection colors many of the preludes and mazurkas, and in the C-sharp minor scherzo it is an acrid flowering, truly fleur du mal. Heine and Baudelaire, two poets far removed from the Slavic, show traces of the terrible drowsy Tsal in their poetry. It is the collective sorrow and tribal wrath of a downtrodden nation, and the mazurkas for that reason have ethnic value. As concise, even as curt as the preludes, they are for the most part highly polished. They are dancing preludes, and often tiny single poems of great poetic intensity and passionate plaint. Chopin published during his lifetime 41 mazurkas in 11 cahiers of 3, 4, and 5 numbers, opus 6, 4 mazurkas, and opus 7, 5 mazurkas, were published December 1832. Opus 6 is dedicated to Comtesse Pauline Plater. Opus 7 to Mr. Johns. Opus 17, Four Mazurkas, May 4th, dedicated to Madame Lina Freppa. Opus 24, Four Mazurkas, November 1835, dedicated to Comte de Pertuis. Opus 30, Four Mazurkas, December 1837, dedicated to Princess Czartoryska. Opus 33, Four Mazurkas, October 1838, dedicated to Comtesse Mostavska. Opus 41, Four Mazurkas, December 1840, dedicated to E. Witwicky. Opus 50, Three Mazurkas, November 1841, dedicated to Leon Smitsovsky. 
Opus 56, Three Mazurkas, August, 1844, dedicated to Mademoiselle C. Maberly. Opus 59, Three Mazurkas, April, 1846, no dedication. And Opus 63, Three Mazurkas, September, 1847, dedicated to Comtesse Chosnovska. Besides, there are Opus 67 and 68, published by Fontana after Chopin's death, consisting of eight mazurkas, and there are a miscellaneous number, two in A minor, both in the Kulak, Klindworth, and Mukuli editions, one in F-sharp major, said to be written by Charles Mayer, in Klindworth's, and four others, in G, B-flat, D, and C major. This makes in all fifty-six to be grouped and analyzed. Niecks thinks there is a well-defined difference between the mazurkas as far as opus 41 and those that follow. In the latter he misses savage beauties and spontaneity. As Chopin gripped the form as he felt more, suffered more, and knew more, his mazurkas grew broader, revealed more Weltschmerz, became elaborate and at times impersonal, but seldom lost the racial snap and hue. They are sonnets in their well-rounded mechanism, and, as Schumann says, something new is to be found in each. Toward the last, a few are blithe and jocund, but they are the exceptions. In the larger ones the universal quality is felt, but to the detriment of the intimate Polish characteristics. These mazurkas are just what they are called, only some dance with the heart, others with the heels. Comprising a large and original portion of Chopin's compositions, they are the least known. Perhaps when they wander from the map of Poland, they lose some of their native fragrance. Like hardy, simple wildflowers, they are mostly for the open air, the only out-of-doors music Chopin ever made. But even in the open, under the moon, the note of self-torture, of sophisticated sadness, is not absent. Do not accuse Chopin, for this is the sign manual of his race. The Pole suffers in song the joy of his sorrow. Part two. The F-sharp minor mazurka of Opus 6 begins with a characteristic triplet that plays such a role in the dance. Here we find a Chopin fuller-fledged than in the nocturnes and variations, and probably because of the form. This mazurka, first in publication, is melodious, slightly mournful, but of a delightful freshness. The third section, with the appoggiaturas, realizes a vivid vision of country couples dancing determinedly. Who plays number two of this set? It, too, has the native wood note wild, with its dominant pedal bass, its slight twang, and its sweet, sad melody in C-sharp minor. There is hearty delight in the major, and how natural it seems. Number three in E is still on the village green, and the boys and girls are romping in the dance. We hear a drone bass, a favorite device of Chopin, and the chatter of the gossips, the bustle of a rural festival. The harmonization is rich, the rhythmic life vital. But in the following one in E-flat minor, a different note is sounded. Its harmonies are closer, and there is sorrow abroad. The incessant circling around one idea, as if obsessed by fixed grief, is used here for the first, but not for the last time, by the composer. Opus 7 drew attention to Chopin. It was the set that brought down the thunders of Relstab, who wrote, If Mr. Chopin had shown this composition to a master, the latter would, it is to be hoped, have torn it and thrown it at his feet, which we hereby do, symbolically. Criticism had its amenities in 1833. In a later number of The Iris, 
in which a caustic notice appeared of the studies, Opus 10, Relstab printed a letter signed Chopin, the authenticity of which is extremely doubtful. In it, Chopin is made to call the critic really a very bad man. Niecks demonstrates that the Polish pianist was not the writer. It reads like the effusion of some indignant, well-meaning female friend. The B-flat major mazurka, which opens Opus 7, is the best known of these dances. There is an expansive swing, a laissez-aller to this piece, with its air of elegance, that are very alluring. The rubato flourishes, and at the close we hear the footing of the peasant. A jolly, reckless composition that makes one happy to be alive and dancing. The next, which begins in A minor, is as if one danced upon one's grave. A change to major does not deceive, it is too heavy-hearted. Number three, in F minor, with its rhythmic pronouncement at the start, brings us back to earth. The triplet that sets off the phrase has great significance. Guitar-like is the bass in its snapping resolution. The section that begins on the dominant of D-flat is full of vigor and imagination. The left hand is given a solo. This mazurka has the true ring. The following one in A-flat is a sequence of moods. Its assertiveness soon melts into tenderer hues, and in an episode in A we find much to ponder. Number five in C consists of three lines. It is a sort of coda to the opus, and full of the echoes of lusty happiness, a silhouette with a marked profile. Opus 17, number 1, in B-flat, is bold, chivalric, and I fancy I hear the swish of the warrior's saber. The peasant has vanished, or else gapes through the open window, while his master goes through the paces of a courtlier dance. We encounter sequential chords of the seventh, and their use, rhythmically framed as they are, gives a line of sternness to the dance. Niecks thinks that the second mazurka might be called the request. So pathetic, playful, and persuasive is it. It is an E minor and has a plaintive, appealing quality. The G major part is very pretty. In the last lines the passion mounts, but is never shrill. Kulak notes that in the fifth and sixth bars there is no slur in certain editions. Clindworth employs it, but marks the B sforzando. A slur on two notes of the same pitch with Chopin does not always mean a tie. The A-flat mazurka number three is pessimistic, threatening, and irritable. Though in the key of E major, the trio displays a relentless sort of humor. The return does not mend matters. A dark page. In A minor, the fourth is called by Skulk, the little Jew. Skulk, who wrote anecdotes of Chopin and collected them with the title of Friedrich Chopin, told the story to Kleczynski. It is this. Chopin did not care for program music, though more than one of his compositions, full of expression and character, may be included under that name. Who does not know the A minor mazurka of Opus 17, dedicated to Lina Freppa? It was already known in our country as the Little Jew, before the departure of our artist abroad. It is one of the works of Chopin which are characterized by distinct humor, a Jew in slippers and a long robe comes out of his inn, and seeing an unfortunate peasant, his customer, intoxicated, tumbling about the road and uttering complaints, exclaims from his threshold, What is this? Then, as if by way of contrast to this scene, the gay wedding party of a rich burgess comes along on its way from church with shouts of various kinds, accompanied in a lively manner by violins and bagpipes. The train passes by, the tipsy peasant renews his complaints, the complaints of a man who had tried to drown his misery in the glass. 
the jew returns indoors shaking his head and again asking what was this the story strikes one as being both childish and commonplace the mazurka is rather doleful and there is a little triplet of interrogation standing sentinel at the fourth bar it is also the last phrase but what of that i too can build you a programme as lofty or lowly as you please but it will not be chopin's niecks for example finds this very dance bleak and joyless of intimate emotional experience and with jarring tones that strike in and pitilessly wake the dreamer so there is no predicating the content of music except in a general way the mood key may be struck but in chopin's case this is by no means infallible if i write with confidence it is that begot of desperation for i know full well that my version of the story will not be yours the a minor mazurka for me is full of hectic despair whatever that may mean and its serpentining chromatics and apparently suspended close on the chord of the sixth gives an impression of morbid irresolution modulating into a sort of desperate gaiety its tonality accounts for the moods evoked being indeterminate and restless opus twenty four begins with a g minor mazurka a favorite because of its comparative freedom from technical difficulties although in the minor mode there is mental strength in the piece with its exotic scale of the augmented second and its trio is hearty in the next in c we find besides the curious content a mixture of tonalities lydian and medieval church modes here the trio is occidental the entire piece leaves a vague impression of discontent and the refrain recalls the russian bargemen's songs utilized at various times by tchaikovsky Klindworth uses variants. There is also some editorial differences in the metronomic markings, Mikuli being, according to Kulak, too slow. Mention has not been made, as in the studies and preludes, of the tempi of the mazurkas. These compositions are so capricious, so varied, that Chopin, I am sure, did not play any one of them twice alike. They are creatures of moods, melodic air plants swinging to the rhythms of any vagrant breeze the metronome is for the student but metronome and rubato are as de lenz would have said mutually exclusive the third mazurka of opus twenty four is in a flat it is pleasing not deep a real dance with an ornamental coda but the next ah here is a gem a beautiful and exquisitely colored poem in b flat minor it sends out prehensile filaments that entwine and draw us into the center of a wondrous melody laden with rich odors odors that almost intoxicate the figuration is tropical and when the major is reached and those glancing thirty seconds so coyly as sail us we realize the seductive charm of chopin the reprise is still more festooned and it is almost a relief when the little tender unison begins with its positive chord assertions closing the period then follows a fascinating cadenced step with lights and shades sweet melancholy driving before it joy and being routed itself until the enunciation of the first theme and the dying away of the dance dancers and the solid globe itself as if earth had committed suicide for loss of the sun the last two bars could have been written only by chopin they are ineffable sighs and now the chorus of praise begins to mount in burning octaves the c minor mazurka opus thirty is another of those wonderful heartfelt melodies of the master what can i say of the deepening feeling at the cononima it stabs with its pathos here is the poet chopin the poet who with burns interprets the simple strains of the folk 
who blinds us with color and rich romanticism like keats and lifts us shelley wise to transcendental azure and his only apparatus a keyboard as schumann wrote chopin did not make his appearance by an orchestral army as a great genius is accustomed to do he only possesses a small cohort but every soul belongs to him to the last hero eight lines is this dance yet its meanings are almost endless number two in b minor is called the cuckoo by kleczynski it is sprightly and with the lilt notwithstanding its subtle progressions of mazovia number three in d flat is all animation brightness and a determination to stay out the dance the alternate major minor of the theme is truly polish the graceful trio and canorous brilliancy of this dance make it a favored number the ending is epigrammatic it comes so suddenly upon us our cortical cells peeling with the minor that its very abruptness is witty one can see chopin making a mocking mue as he wrote it tchaikovsky borrowed the effect for the conclusion of the chinoise in a miniature orchestral suite the fourth of this opus is in c-sharp minor again i feel like letting loose the dogs of enthusiasm the sharp rhythms and solid build of this ample work give it a massive character it is one of the big mazurkas and the ending raw as it is consecutive bare-faced fifths and sevenths compasses its intended meaning opus thirty three is a popular set it begins with one in g sharp minor which is curt and rather depressing the relief in b major is less real than it seems on paper moody withal a tender-hearted mazurka number two in d is bustling graceful and full of unrestrained vitality bright and not particularly profound it was successfully arranged for voice by viardo garcia the third of the opus in c is the one described by de lenz as almost precipitating a violent row between chopin and meyerbeer he had christened it the epitaph of the idea two four said meyerbeer after de lenz played it three four answered chopin flushing angrily let me have it for a ballet in my new opera and i'll show you retorted meyerbeer it's three four scolded chopin and played it himself de lenz says they parted coolly each holding to his opinion later in st petersburg meyerbeer met this gossip and told him that he loved chopin I know no pianist, no composer for the piano like him. Meyerbeer was wrong in his idea of the tempo. Though Chopin slurs the last beat, it is there nevertheless. This mazurka is only four lines long and is charming, as charming as the brief specimen in the preludes. The next mazurka is another famous warhorse. In B minor it is full of veiled coquetries, hazardous mood transitions growling recitatives and smothered plaints the continual return to the theme gives rise to all manner of fanciful programs one of the most characteristic is by the polish poet zelinski who so kleczynski relates wrote a humorous poem on this mazurka for him it is a domestic comedy in which a drunken peasant and his much abused wife enact a little scene returning home the worse for wear he sings oi tadana oh dear me and rumbles in the bass in a figure that answers the treble his wife reproaching him he strikes her here we are in b flat she laments her fate in b major then her husband shouts be quiet old vixen this is given in the octaves a genuine dialogue the wife tartly answering shan't be quiet 
the gruff grumbling in the bass is heard an imitation of the above when suddenly the man cries out the last eight bars of the composition kitty kitty come do come here i forgive you which is decidedly masculine in its magnanimity if one does not care for the rather coarse realism of this reading Kleczynski offers the poem of Ujajeski, called The Dragoon. The soldier flatters a girl at the inn. She flies from him, and her lover, believing she has deceived him, despairingly drowns himself. The ending, with its ring, ring, ring the bell there, horses carry me to the depths, has more poetic contour than the other. Without grafting any libretto on it, this mazurka is a beautiful tone piece in itself. Its theme is delicately mournful, and the subject in B major simply entrancing in its broad, flowing melody. In C sharp minor, opus 41, is a mazurka that is beloved of me. Its scale is exotic, its rhythm convincing its tune a little saddened by life but courage never fails this theme sounds persistently in the middle voices in the bass and at the close in full harmonies unisons giving it a startling effect octaves take it up in profile until it vanishes here is the very apotheosis of rhythm number two in e minor is not very resolute of heart it was composed, so Niex avers, at Palma, when Chopin's health fully accounts for the depressed character of the piece, for it is sad to the point of tears. Of Opus 41, he wrote to Fontana from Nohant in 1839. You know I have four new mazurkas, one from Palma in E minor, three from here in B major, A flat major, and C sharp minor. They seem to me pretty, as the youngest children usually do when the parents grow old. Number three is a vigorous sonorous dance. Number four, over which the editors deviate on the serious matter of text, in A flat, is for the concert room, and is allied to several of his gracious valses. Playful and decorative, but not profound in feeling. Opus 50, the first in G major, is healthy and vivacious. Good humor predominates. Kulak notes that in some editions it closes pianissimo, which seems a little out of drawing. Number two is charming. In A flat, it is a perfect specimen of the aristocratic mazurka. The D flat trio, the answering episode in B flat minor, and the grace of the return make this one to be studied and treasured. De Lenz finds Bachian influences in the following, in C-sharp minor. It begins as though written for the organ, and ends in an exclusive salon. It does him credit, and is worked out more fully than the others. Chopin was much pleased when I told him that in the construction of this mazurka, the passage from E major to F major was the same as that in the Agatha aria in Freischutz. De Lenz refers to the opening Bach-like mutations. The texture of this dance is closer and finer spun than any we have encountered. Perhaps spontaneity is impaired. Mais que voulez-vous? Chopin was bound to develop, and his mazurkas, fragile and constricted as is the form, were sure to show a like record of spiritual and intellectual growth. Opus 56 in B major is elaborate, even in its beginning. There is decoration in the ritornelle in E-flat, and one feels the absence of a compensating emotion, despite the display of contrapuntal skill. Very virtuoso-like, but not so intimate as some of the others. Karasowski selects number two in C as an illustration. It is as though the composer had sought for the moment to divert himself with narcotic intoxication, only to fall back the more deeply into his original gloom. There is the peasant in the first bars in C, 
but the A minor and what follows soon disturb the air of bonhomie. Theoretical ease is in the imitative passages. Chopin is now master of his tools. The third mazurka of opus 56 is in C minor. It is quite long and does not give the impression of a whole. With the exception of a short break in B major, it is composed with the head, not the heart, nor yet the heels. Not unlike in its sturdy affirmation, the one in C-sharp minor, opus 41, is the next mazurka in A minor, opus 59. That Chopin did not repeat himself is an artistic miracle. A subtle turn takes us off the familiar road to some strange glade wherein the flowers are rare in scent and odor. This mazurka, like the one that follows, has a dim resemblance to others, yet there is always a novel point of departure, a fresh harmony, a sudden melody, or an unexpected ending. Haddow, for example, thinks the A-flat of this opus the most beautiful of them all. In it he finds legitimately used the repetition in various shapes of a single phrase. To me, this mazurka seems but an amplification, an elaboration of the lovely one in the same key, opus 50, number 2. The double sixths and more complicated phraseology do not render the later superior to the early mazurka, yet there is no gainsaying the fact that this is a noble composition. But the next, in F-sharp minor, despite its rather saturnine gaze, is stronger in interest, if not in workmanship. While it lacks Niecks' bolt sauvage, is it not far loftier in conception and execution than Opus Six in F-sharp minor? The inevitable triplet appears in the third bar and is a hero throughout. Oh, here is charm for you. Read the close of the section in F-sharp major. In the major it ends, the triplet fading away at last, a mere shadow, a turn on D-sharp, but victor to the last. Chopin is at the summit of his invention. Time and tune that wait for no man are now his bond slaves. Pathos, delicacy, boldness, a measured melancholy, and the art of euphonious presentiment of all these, and many factors more, stamp this mazurka a masterpiece. Niecks believes there is a return of the early freshness and poetry in the last three mazurkas, opus 63. They are indeed teeming with interesting matter, he writes. Looked at from the musician's point of view, how much do we not see novel and strange, beautiful and fascinating withal? Sharp dissonances, chromatic passing notes, suspensions and anticipations, displacement of accent, progressions of perfect fifths, the horror of schoolman, sudden turns and unexpected digressions that are so unaccountable, so out of the line of logical sequence, that one's following the composer is beset with difficulties. But all this is a means to an end, the expression of an individuality with its intimate experiences. The emotional content of many of these trifles, trifles if considered only by their size, is really stupendous. Spoken like a brave man, and not a pedant. Full of vitality is the first number of Opus 63. In B major it is sufficiently various in figuration and rhythmical life to single it from its fellows. The next, in F minor, has a more elegiac ring. Brief and not difficult of matter or manner is this dance. The third, of winning beauty, is in C-sharp minor, surely a pendant to the C-sharp minor valse. I defy anyone to withstand the pleading, eloquent voice of this mazurka, slender in technical configuration, yet it impressed Louis Ehlert so much that he was impelled to write. A more perfect canon in the octave could not have been written by one who had grown gray in the learned arts. 
the four mazurkas published posthumously in eighteen fifty five that comprise opus sixty seven were composed by chopin at various dates to the first in g klindworth affixes eighteen forty nine as the year of composition niecks gives a much earlier date eighteen thirty five I fancy the latter is correct, as the piece sounds like one of Chopin's more youthful efforts. It is jolly and rather superficial. The next in G minor is familiar. It is very pretty, and its date is set down by Niecks as 1849, while Klindworth gives 1835. Here again Niecks is correct, although I suspect that Klindworth transposed his figures accidentally. Number three, in C, was composed in 1835. On this, both biographer and editor agree. It is certainly an early effusion of no great value, although a good dancing tune. Number four, A minor, of this opus, composed in 1846, is more mature, but in no wise remarkable. Opus 68, the second of the Fontana set, was composed in 1830. The first, in C, is commonplace. The one in A minor, composed in 1827, is much better, being lighter and well-made. The third, in F major, 1830, weak and trivial, and the fourth, in F minor, 1849, interesting because it is said by Julius Fontana to be Chopin's last composition. He put it on paper a short time before his death, but was too ill to try it at the piano. It is certainly morbid in its sick insistence in phrase repetition, close harmonies, and wild departure in A from the first figure. But it completes the gloomy and sardonic loop, and we wish, after playing this veritable song of the tomb, that we had parted from Chopin in health, not disease. This page is full of the premonitions of decay. Too weak and faltering to be febrile, Chopin is here a debile, prematurely exhausted young man. There are a few accents of a forced gaiety, but they are swallowed up in the mists of dissolution, the dissolution of one of the most sensitive brains ever wrought by nature. Here we may echo, without any savor of Liszt's condescension, or de Lenz's irony. Pauvre Frederic. Klindworth and Kulak have different ideas concerning the end of this mazurka. Both are correct. Kulak, Klindworth, and Mikuli include in their editions two mazurkas in A minor. Neither is impressive. One, the date of composition unknown, is dedicated à son ami Émile Gaillard. The other first appeared in a musical publication of Schatz, about 1842 or 1843, according to Niecks. Of this set, I prefer the former. It abounds in octaves and ends with a long trill. There is in the Klindworth edition a mazurka, the last in the set, in the key of F-sharp. It is so unchopanish and artificial that the doubts of the pianist Ernst Power were aroused as to its authenticity. On inquiry, Niecks quotes from the London Monthly Musical Record, July 1, 1882, Power discovered that the piece was identical with a mazurka by Charles Mayer. Gothard, being the publisher of the alleged Chopin mazurka, declared he bought the manuscript from a Polish countess, possibly one of the fifty in whose arms Chopin died, and that the lady parted with Chopin's autograph because of her dire poverty. It is, of course, a clear case of forgery. Of the four early mazurkas in G major and B flat major, dating from 1825, D major, composed in 1829 and 30, but remodeled in 1832, and C major of 1833, the latter is the most characteristic. The G major is of slight worth. As Niecks remarks, it contains a harmonic error. 
the one in b flat starts out with a phrase that recalls the a minor mazurka numbered forty five in the bright kopf and hartel edition this b flat mazurka early as it was composed is nevertheless pretty there are breadth and decision in the c major mazurka the recasting improves the d major mazurka its trio is lifted an octave and the doubling of notes throughout gives more weight and richness in the minor key, laughs and cries, dances and mourns the slog, says Dr. J. Schucht in his monograph on Chopin. Chopin here reveals not only his nationality, but his own fascinating and enigmatic individuality. Within the tremulous spaces of this immature dance is enacted the play of a human soul, a soul that voices the sorrow and revolt of a dying race, of a dying poet. They are epigrammatic, fluctuating, crazy, and tender, these mazurkas, and some of them have a soft, melancholy light, as if shining through alabaster, true corpse light leading to a morass of doubt and terror. But a fantastic, disheveled, debonair spirit is the guide, and to him, we abandon ourselves in these precise and vertiginous dances. End of chapter 13 Recording by M. J. Frank, Portland, Oregon Chapter 14 of Chopin, The Man and His Music This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Hoffman Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Huneker Chapter 14 Chopin, The Conqueror The scherzi of Chopin are of his own creation. The type, as illustrated by Beethoven and Mendelssohn, had no meaning for him. Whether in earnest or serious jest, Chopin pitched on a title that is widely misleading when the content is considered. The Beethoven scherzo is full of a robust sort of humor. In it, he is seldom poetical, frequently given to gossip, and at times he hints at the mystery of life. The demoniacal element, the fierce jollity that mocks itself, the almost titanic anger of Chopin would not have been regarded by the composer of the Eroica symphony as adapted to the form. The Pole practically built up a new musical structure, boldly called it a scherzo, and, and, as in the case of the ballades, poured into its elastic mold most disturbing and incomparable music. Chopin seldom compasses sublimity, his arrows are tipped with fire, yet they do not fly far, but in some of his music he skirts the regions where abide the gods. In at least one scherzo, in one ballade, in the F minor fantasia, in the first two movements of the B flat minor sonata, in several of the etudes, and in one of the preludes, he compasses grandeur, individuality of utterance, beauty of utterance and the eloquence we call divine are his. Criticism then bows its questioning brows before this anointed one. In the scherzi, Chopin is often prophet as well as poet. He fumes and frets, but upon his countenance is the precious fury of the sibyls. We see the soul that suffers from secret convulsions, but forgive the writhing for the music made. These four scherzi are physical records, confessions committed to paper of outpourings that never could have passed the lips. From these alone we may almost reconstruct the real Chopin, the inner Chopin, whose conventional exterior so ill prepared the world for the tragic issues of his music. The first scherzo is a fair model. There are a few bars of introduction, the porch, as Naik's would call it, a principal subject, a trio, a short working out section, a skillful return to the opening theme, and an elaborate coda. 
this edifice not architecturally flawless is better adapted to the florid beauties of the byzantine treatment than to the severe hellenic line yet chopin gave it dignity largeness and a classic massiveness the interior is romantic is modern personal but the facade shows gleaming minarets the strangely builded shapes of the orient this b minor scherzo has the acid note of sorrow and revolt yet the complex figuration never wavers the walls stand firm despite the hurricane blowing through and around them elert finds this scherzo tornadic it is gusty and the hurry and overemphasis do not endear it to the pianist the first pages are filled with wrathful sounds there is much tossing of hands and cries to heaven calling down its fire and brimstone a climax mounts to a fine frenzy until the lyric intermezzo in b is reached here love chants with honeyed tongues the widely dispersed figure of the melody has an entrancing tenderness but peace does not long prevail against the powers of iblis and infernal is the wild jagged of the finale after shrillest of dissonances a chromatic uproar pilots the doomed one across the desperate sticks what chopin's program was we can but guess he may have outlined the composition in a moment of great ebullition a time of soul laceration arising from a cat scratch or a quarrel with maurice Sahn in the garden over the possession of the goat cart the cleaned verth edition is preferable kulak follows his example in using the double note stems in the b major part he gives the a sharp in the bass six bars before the return of the first motif cleaned verth and other editions prescribe a natural which is not so effective this scherzo might profit by being played without the repeats the chromatic interlocked octaves at the close are very striking i find at times as my mood changes something almost repellent in the b minor scherzo it does not present the frank physiognomy of the second scherzo opus thirty one in b flat minor Alert cries that it was composed in a blessed hour although du lens quotes chopin as saying of the opening quote, it must be a charnel house unquote. the defiant challenge of the beginning has no savor of the scorn and drastic mockery of its forerunner we are conscious that tragedy impends that after the prologue may follow fast catastrophe yet it is not feared with all the portentous thunder of its index nor are we deceived a melody of winning distinction unrolls before us it has a noble tone is of a noble type without relaxing pace it passes and drops like a thunderbolt into the bowels of the earth again the story is told and tarrying not at all we are led to a most delectable spot in the key of a major this trio is marked by genius can anything be more bewitching than the episode in c-sharp minor merging into e major with the overflow at the close the fantasy is notable for variety of tonality free them in rhythmical incidents and genuine power the coda is dizzy and overwhelming for schumann this scherzo is byronic in tenderness and boldness Karasowski speaks of its Shakespearean humor, and indeed it is a very human and lovable piece of art. It holds richer, warmer, redder blood than the other three, and like the A-flat ballade, is beloved of the public, but then it is easier to understand. Opus 39, the third scherzo in C-sharp minor, was composed or finished at Majorca and is the most dramatic of the set i confess to see no littleness in the polished phrases though irony lurks in its bars and there is fever in its glance a glance full of enigmatic and luring scorn i heartily agree with hadot who finds the work clear-cut and of exact balance and noting that chopin founded whole paragraphs quote, either on a single phrase repeated in similar shapes or on two phrases in alternation unquote, 
a primitive practice in Polish folk songs, he asserts that, quote, Beethoven does not attain the lucidity of his style by such parallelism or phraseology, unquote, but admits that Chopin's methods made for, quote, clearness and precision may be regarded as characteristic of the national manner, unquote, a thoroughly personal characteristic, too. There is virile clangor in the firmly struck octaves of the opening pages. No hesitating, morbid view of life, but rank, harsh assertiveness, not untinged with splatenic anger. The chorale of the trio is admirably devised and carried out. Its piety is a bit of liturgical make-believe. The contrasts here are most artistic, sonorous harmonies set off by broken chords that deliciously tinkle. There is a coda of frenetic movement, and the end is in major, a surprising conclusion when considering all that has gone before. Never to become the property of the profane, the C-sharp minor scherzo, notwithstanding its marked disparities and agitated moments, is a great work of art. Without the inner freedom of its predecessor, it is more sober and self-contained than the B minor scherzo. The fourth scherzo, opus 54, is in the key of E, built up by a series of cunning touches and climaxes, and without the mood depth or variety of its brethren, it is more truly a scherzo than any of them. It has tripping lightness, and there is sunshine imprisoned behind its open bars. Of it, Schumann could not ask, quote, How is gravity to clothe itself if jest goes about in dark veils? Unquote. Here, then, is intellectual refinement and jesting of a superior sort. Nyx thinks it fragmentary. I find the fairy-like measures delightful after the doleful mutterings of some of the other scherzi. There is the same spirit of opposition, but of arrogance none. The C-sharp minor theme is of lyric beauty, the coda with its scales brilliant. It seems to be banned by classicists and Chopin worshippers alike. The agnostic attitude is not yet dead in the piano-playing world. Rubinstein most admired the first two scherzi. The B minor has been criticized for being too much in the etude vein. But with all their shortcomings, these compositions are without peer in the literature of the piano. They were published and dedicated as follows. Opus 20, February 1835, to M.T. Albrecht. Opus 31, December 1837, Comtesse de Fersenstein. Opus 39, October 1840, Adolf Gutmann. And Opus 54, December 1843, Maille de Caraman. De Lenz relates that Chopin dedicated the C-sharp minor scherzo to his pupil Gutmann because this giant, with a prize fighter's fists, could, quote, knock a hole in the table, unquote, with a certain chord for the left hand, sixth measure from the beginning, and adds quite naively, quote, Nothing more was ever heard of this Gutmann. He was a discovery of Chopin's, unquote. Chopin died in this same Gutmann's arms, and, despite de Lenz, Gutmann was in evidence until his death as a, quote, favorite pupil, unquote. And now we have reached the grandest, oh, banal and abused word, of Chopin's compositions, the Fantasia in F minor, opus 49. Robert Schumann, after remarking the cosmopolitan must, quote, sacrifice the small interests of the soil on which he was born, unquote, notices that Chopin's later works, quote, begin to lose something of their especial Sarmatian physiognomy, to approach partly more nearly the universal ideal cultivated by the divine Greeks which we find again in Mozart, unquote. The F minor fantasia has hardly the Mozartian serenity, but parades a formal beauty not disfigured by an excess of violence, either personal or patriotic, and its melodies, if restless by melancholy, are of surprising nobility and dramatic grandeur. Without including the Beethoven sonatas, not strictly born of the instrument, I do not fear to maintain that this fantasia is one of the greatest of piano pieces, 
never properly appreciated by pianists critics or public it is after more than half a century of neglect being understood at last it was published november eighteen forty three and probably composed at nohant as a letter of the composer indicates the dedication is to princess c de suzo these interminable countesses and princesses of chopin for Nikes, who could not at first discern its worth, it suggests a titan in commotion. It is titanic, the torso of some Faust-like dream. It is Chopin's Faust, a macabre march, containing some dangerous dissonances, gravely ushers us to ascending staircases of triplets, only to precipitate us to the very abysses of the piano. That first subject, is it not almost as ethically puissant and passionate as Beethoven in his F minor sonata? Chopin's lack of tenaciousness is visible here. Beethoven would have built a cathedral on such a foundational scheme, but Chopin, ever prodigal in his melody-making, dashes impetuously to the A-flat episode, that heroic love chant erroneously marked Dolce, and played with the effeminacies of a salon. Three times does it resound in this strange hall of glancing mirrors, yet not once should it be caressed. The bronze fingers of Tosig are needed. Now are arching the triplets to the great, thrilling song beginning in C minor, and then the octaves, in contrary motion, split wide asunder the very earth. After terrific chordal reverberations there is the rapid retreat of vague armies, and once again is begun the ascent of the rolling triplets to inaccessible heights, and the first theme sounds in C minor. The modulation lifts to G-flat, only to drop to abysmal depths. What mighty, dismal cause is being espoused? When peace is presaged in the key of B, is this the prize for which strive these agonized hosts? is some forlorn princess locked behind these solemn inaccessible bars for a few moments there is contentment beyond all price then the warring tribe of triplets recommence after clamorous g-flat octaves reeling from the stars to the sea of the first theme another rush into d-flat ensues the song of c minor reappears in f minor and the miracle is repeated oracular octaves quake the cellarage of the palace. The warriors hurry by, their measured tramp is audible after they vanish, and the triplets obscure their retreat with chromatic vapors. Then, an adagio in this fantastic old world tale, the curtain prepares to descend. A faint, sweet voice sings a short, appealing cadenza, and after billowing a flat arpeggios, soft, great hummocks of tone, two giant chords are sounded, and the ballad of love and war is over. Who conquers? Is the lady with the green eyes and moon-white face rescued? Or is all this a de Quincey's dream fugue translated into tone, a sonorous, awesome vision? Like de Quincey, it suggests the apparition of the empire of fear, the fear that is secretly felt with dreams, wherein the spirit expands to the drummings of infinite space. Alas, for the validity of subjective criticism, Franz Liszt told Vladimir de Pachmann the program of the Fantasia, as related to him by Chopin. At the close of one desperate, immemorial day, the pianist was crooning at the piano, his spirits vastly depressed. Suddenly came a knocking at his door, a Poe-like, sinister tapping, which he at once rhythmically echoed upon the keyboard, his phonomotor center being unusually sensitive. The first two bars of the Fantasia describe these rappings, just as the third and fourth stand for Chopin's musical invitation, Entrez, Entresla. This is all repeated until the doors, wide open, swinging, admit Liszt, Georges Assange, Madame Camilla Playa de Mac, and others. To the solemn measures of March they enter, and range themselves about Chopin, who after the agitated triplets begins his complaint in the mysterious song in F minor. But San, with whom he has quarreled, 
falls before him on her knees and pleads for pardon. Straightway the chant merges into the appealing A-flat section. This sends skyward my theory of its interpretation, and from C minor the current becomes more tempestuous until the climax is reached, and to the second march the intruders rapidly vanish. The remainder of the work, with the exception of the lento sostenuto in B, where it is to be hoped Chopin's perturbed soul finds momentary peace, is largely repetition and development. This far from ideal reading is an authoritative one, coming as it does from Chopin by way of Liszt. I console myself for its rather commonplace character with the notion that perhaps in the retelling the story has caught some personal cadenzas of the two historians. In any case, I shall cling to my own version. The F minor Fantasia will mean many things to many people. Chopin has never before maintained so artistically, so free from delirium, such a level of strong passion, mental power, and exalted euphony. It is his largest canvas, and though there are no long-breathed periods such as in the B-flat minor scherzo, the phraseology is amply broad, without padding of paragraphs. The rapt interest is not relaxed until the final bar. This transcendental work more than nearly approaches Beethoven in its unity, its formal rectitude, and its brave economy of thematic material. While few men have dared to unlock their hearts thus, Chopin is not so intimate here as in the Mazurkas, but the pulse beats ardently in the tissues of this composition. As art for art, it is less perfect. The gain is on the human side. Nearing his end, Chopin discerned, with ever-widening, ever-brighter vision, the great heart-throb of the universe. Master of his material, if not of his mortal tenement, he passionately strove to shape his dreams into abiding sounds. He did not always succeed, but his victories are the precious prizes of mankind. One is loath to believe that the echo of Chopin's magic music can ever fall upon unheeding ears. He may become old-fashioned, but like Mozart, he will remain eternally beautiful. End of chapter 14 Recording by Robert Hoffman, Akron, Ohio End of Chopin, The Man and His Music by James Huneker